Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Senate Finance and guests. We today is Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. We have 12 bills that the committee will consider and have presented before us today, and we are going to take those bills in the following order. We'll start with Senate Bill 375, then 372, 732, 480, 628, 529, 558, 449, 441, 439, 376, and we'll end with Senate Bill 460. To our guests, we just want to make you aware that many of our senators have bills in other committees, so if you see them going in and out of the room, it is not meant as disrespect to you or the subject matter you're presenting. They are probably presenting a bill in another committee and will return as soon as they wrap up in the other committee. We have 176 witnesses signed up to testify on bills today, so we ask in, in the interest of time and out of respect for those that will come behind you, please, please watch our, our time clock and try to wrap up your comments within the two-minute limit that is provided. The sponsors will present the bill, and you have two minutes to tell us yay or nay and why um, during that time. All right, any questions? With that, we'll call up Senator Ellis, who will present Senate Bill 375, which is the State Board of Physicians, inactive and emeritus status. Good afternoon, Senator. If you have a panel, feel free to bring them up. Come on up. Good. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the uh, esteemed Senate Finance Committee. I'm Arthur Ellis, representing District 28 in the Senate of Maryland. This is the perfect bill to begin today's uh, hearings. Uh, no uh, opposition. And this bill is to honor our retired distinguished medical professionals, our MDs, with a status where they do not have to do continued education, but when they retire, we can still call them doctors and they can use the doctor designation. And this bill will allow them to have a emeritus status when they choose to uh, retire from active practice. Um, as such, I ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 375. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Matt Dudzik on behalf of the Maryland Board of Physicians. Uh, first of all, thank you to Senator Ellis for this bill. Uh, Senate Bill 375 is a simple bill that we hope will provide more options for our licensees um, and give the board a clearer picture regarding uh, Maryland's healthcare workforce. Uh, right now, um, there's, there's no way for a physician to indicate uh, that they've retired from practice on their license. Um, so when a physician retires, their only options are either to continue renewing their license indefinitely or to allow their license to lapse, uh, at which point their practitioner profile indicates that it's expired or, or inactive. Um, this latter option is something that you know, most physicians who have spent decades of, of uh, their lives serving, serving Maryland patients are somewhat loath to do. Uh, which means that we have a number of physicians in Maryland who have been retired in some cases for years that have been continuing to renew their license, continuing to pay the renewal fee, fulfill their continuing education requirements, and so on, despite being out of practice. Um, this can actually make it very difficult to get a clear idea of who is practicing in Maryland because um, you know, this is something that's come up a lot in recent uh, healthcare workforce um, studies and groups where we don't know if somebody, just because somebody has an active license, if that means that they are also actively practicing. Um, so this is a, a very simple bill. This would give physicians who have practiced in Maryland for at least 10 years the ability to request an emeritus or retired status. Uh, it was modeled after other states with similar legislation. Uh, Maine and California in particular have uh, very similar, uh, very similar um, uh, options. Um, and uh, it would allow these emeritus doctors to retain their professional title 
They would be indicated as emeritus uh, on their license, um, but they would not be able to actually practice medicine unless they reinstated their license. Um, it would be entirely voluntary. We just think it's a great way to present more options for our doctors, uh, while also giving the board uh, a more nuanced picture of Maryland's healthcare workforce. Uh, I know I'm out of time, but I, I did want to say that there was an error in drafting on the initial draft that uh, would have implied that when the uh, emeritus physician or an inactive physician reinstated, that they would still not have to meet any other requirements. Um, that was not an intention. That was not our intention. Um, and we have amendments over on the House version to correct that. Uh, if they wanted to reinstate to practice, they would have to go through the same uh, reinstatement process of any other physician. Uh, but I, I thank you for the time. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Steve Wise here today on behalf of MedCai, the Maryland State Medical Society, in support of the bill, and we're fine with the clarification that Mr. Dudzik just mentioned. Uh, the bill really helps the board in terms of administratively simplifying things, and we think it provides a nice recognition to a physician that has practiced for a long period of time without incident uh, and, and being able to hold that title. Thank you very much. And Senator Lamb. One, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. One quick question, because the Office of the Attorney General has testimony here about an amendment to require them to have continuing medical education requirements. Do you think that's needed or necessary, given that there are these these folks are in emeritus status? Uh, thank you for that question. So that uh, uh, um, they uh, submitted that with the prior language, uh, which is part of what we're amending. So right now, when you reinstate a license, you have to meet all of the renewal requirements, which includes those continuing education requirements. Um, that is still our intent. So you don't, you're don't you exempt from those requirements as long as you're on emeritus status. But if you do want to reinstate the license so that you can begin practice again, then yes, you, you do have to uh, take those continuing education. Got it. So the amendment you mentioned should address that concern. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I don't see any additional questions from the committee. Um, thank you for your testimony, and we encourage you to share the amendments that you shared with the House with the Senate Finance Committee. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Enjoy your afternoon. Colleagues, that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 375. We'll now turn to Senate Bill 372, which is Health Occupations Pharmacist Administration of Vaccines. Senator Augustine, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, gonna... please bring your panel up. Move down one down. No, right here. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Senator Malcolm Augustine here on behalf of Senate Bill 372, Health Occupations, Pharmacists, Administration of Vaccines. Uh, good colleagues, um, this is an emergency bill um, that will permanently authorize the uh, uh, licensed pharmacists to order and administer vaccinations under um, certain circumstances to individuals as young as three years old. The bill also repeals the uh, um, requirements that pharmacists administer the vaccine to um, uh, to an adult under a specified written protocol, uh, otherwise known as a, a prescription, and authorize a pharmacy to administer to an adult a vaccine approved by the US FDA. Um, colleagues, this bill is all about access to care. It's all about access to care. Um, uh, and it provides not just access to care, but also just uh, availability of care. Um, I, I carried this uh, piece of legislation in 2021 as an emergency to uh, increase the uh, availability of these vaccines in, in pharmacies, which of course reached so close to all of our uh, all of our folks. And so a couple of you who were on the EHE committee heard uh, a lot of, of, of that bill before. You also will hear to not today a lot of the um, the, the, the complaints or, or, or objections to the bill, they have not changed. Although what has occurred is literally um, just a significant number of vaccines that have occurred without incident uh, in the pharmacy. But I, I also just wanna share with you all, because it's like, it's so interesting how these things kind of work out for us. Yeah, you know? um, I got my own vac vaccine story that I wanna tell you all. It was literally like last week, um, um, you know, my, my my doctor said that I hadn't done my tuberculosis one and sometime Tdap, whatever. 
Um, and so, uh, but they but they had said so a while back, a while back. And you know, there was a couple of other ones that I needed to do as well. Um, and so they gave, they set up an appointment or, or I set up an appointment with them for last Friday. And I initially set it up last Friday um, you all would understand this at 1 30, right? Because I figured, okay, well, we're going to be off. Um, you know, I'll be able to make this appointment. It won't be a problem or anything else. Um, and then we got our schedule changed, right? Our schedule got changed and it's like, wow, what am I going to do? First of all, it's hard for me to reach the, the folks. I know you guys experienced this too, right? It was hard for me to reach them. Um, and, uh, but, but I was able to reach them. And when I did, it was still sort of the same sort of situation. Yeah, you can get an appointment, but it's got to be between 8.30 and like 3 o'clock. 8.30 and 3 o'clock. That's it. It was the only times that were available to me. And so I was like, oh, my gosh. Okay, all right. I'll take the 8.30 time. I'll, I'll do the 8.30 time. Knowing full well, like I've had some pressure because I already created meetings and stuff like that that I'm supposed to try to get to and everything else. And so I go to the doctor, y'all, and... Um, it's uh, I'm on time. I'm there. I'm, I'm there. It's 830 because I'm trying to make sure I can get out here to Annapolis to do things that we're trying to do. And I'm sitting there and I'm waiting. You all have been through this experience. I'm sitting there. I'm waiting. I'm waiting just only to just get va a vaccine, like a shot. That's what I'm sitting there. I'm waiting for. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm like watching the clock because I'm trying to get out here, you know, do everything that I can. And um, eventually I go up. I ask him like, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting late. I'm going to have to leave. No, no, no. It's fine. You don't have to. We, we, we can try to get you in. We're really short staff. Everybody's really short staff. It's very hard, you know, to kind of get these things done, everything else. But why don't you just come over here into this hallway over here, which I did, went into a hallway and whoever they did it, I, by the way, I did not see a doctor for any of this. There was no doctor. There's no doctor around, no nothing, whatever. Go into a hall. She's like, yeah, just take off your shirt, you know, and I'll stick you with the shot up here in the corner or whatever. Yeah, 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 absolutely, Senator. That's right. And I was okay with that because I'm trying to get out of there, right? And it was fine. It was safe. It was, you know, she had gloves on and I got my shot, put my shirt back on and, and went on about my way. Now, the reason that I tell you all that story is because I have the flexibility to be able to do that. I had the flexibility to be able to go to an appointment between the hours of 8.30 and 3. But who really has that flexibility? Like, I couldn't stay. I mean, I really could not stay. I was trying to leave. I was trying to rush and everything else. And, you know, this is, the, this is what this bill is absolutely about. It's because right now, for so many folks who are trying for their children, now imagine this. Now, now you got your kid with you, and you're trying to get to work or you're trying to figure out if you can do it or not, and you don't have that flexibility, and you don't have anywhere to go, what do you do? What do you do? That It's hard to get an appointment, everything else. And so what you do is you look for other potential options. And that's what this provides. This provides a safe alternate option, which has been going on um, for the last few years in a very successful way. Now, this bill uh, also, just because you will also hear from folks, and I've done, so, I've gotten some help on this, you'll hear from a number of people, another uh, one of the objections is around um, parental consent. This bill is silent, does not do anything with regard to parental consent. And I've done, I got some help, we did some homework because I couldn't find it in the law where this sort of dealt with uh, consent. And what we learned is that we, Maryland, with regard to uh, this lives under common law, which, which says that uh, unless otherwise specified, someone cannot provide informed consent until they've reached the rate, till they've reached the age of majority. And the age of majority is 18, which is why you all have heard, again, some of you have been in here where we've had those pieces of legislation where we have carved out very specific instances where uh, a person who is under the age of 18 is able to provide informed consent. This bill is not that. We don't do that. It doesn't change anything with regard to the way that the law is currently written um, as, as it relates to informed consent. Another thing I just want to point you all to in, your in the testimony, you'll see that there is support uh, for this from the Maryland Department of Health. As a part of the 2021 legislation that we had where we started this process, we try to put the, as we always do, we put those guardrails on to have someone take a look at this process because there were some questions and concerns. 
um, you will see that the Maryland Department of Health is um, has provided their testimony letter of support for this administration. I'm sorry for this uh, legislation. What I will tell you as well is that there is also um, uh, additional information that they did. They have already done the report, but it has not been finalized, which will demonstrate even further that the pharmacists put this information into Immunet, which is the, the database that captures all this information to so make sure that, that if it does, if it goes uh, when it's in the system, that the primary care physician um, or the pediatrician will be able to access information to be able to make sure that we know that uh, that they, that this has been done properly and has been documented properly. And the legislation says that they will communicate that uh, to them. And the legislation says that they will that the pharmacists, when they do this, must communicate to the individuals and their families the importance importance of well visits, because. It's not the intent of this legislation to reduce the number of well visits, which, by the way, I asked folks to provide that, you know, to me, and I've seen some, but not extensively, where this has actually reduced the well visits. This is about providing access for hardworking Maryland families and their children who otherwise are struggling to be able to get the vaccines that they need. It's safe. It's reliable. It provides access. And the idea that we would look to limit options to safe, reliable health services in this day, I just can't understand that. That's why I think it's so very critical, important that we maintain this. And I'm going to ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 372. Kaylee's going to go first. Good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. For the record, Kaylee Locklear here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Chain Drugstores in support of this legislation. I just want to rewind a little bit here. So the Federal PrEP Act that went through in 2020 allowed pharmacists to immunize children down to the age of three. Senator Augustine and this legislature then temporarily approved and gave authority to pharmacists to do so in this state. And that does sunset this year in June, on June 1st. The problem that we're experiencing now is that the federal PREP Act expires May 1st, which is why this is an emergency bill. And I'll just say that through many studies and analysis, including an article published in the official journal of, Ameri of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the current healthcare system has not adequately met the vaccination needs of children in the United States over the years. And notably, that article, before its time, encouraged physicians to consider how the overall vaccine rates could increase via complementing their efforts with other healthcare settings that adolescents tend to frequent, such as pharmacies. Pre-pandemic, 51% of children in our state did not have a medical home. And as children and families were able to return to their healthcare providers, that number has now actually decreased down to 46.2%. Um, and that's uh, going to be contrary to what you'll hear coming up behind us later. Providing immunization services and limited resource areas to the medically underserved and at-risk communities with convenient and familiar locations and hours has been and continues to be critical for disease control. And I will again point out that every pharmacist must educate every patient and their family about the importance of a child well visit and then provide referrals as necessary. So with that, we urge a favorable report. Glad to answer questions. Hi, um, to the committee, thank you for your time. I'm Jill Morgan, professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. I'm in favor of this legislation. It's important to note that when we look throughout the state of Maryland that the majority of counties have more pharmacies than they do have pediatricians, especially when we focus on areas like Western Maryland and the Eastern Shore. Also, when we look at the data during the federal PrEP Act and um, before it, we know that the number of doses of vaccines given to children by pharmacists went up. It was doubled for some of them. Well, for non-pharmacy providers, it did go down a little bit. 
I have to say that also data shows that um, an increase in vaccine rates for the Tdap, the vaccine you were talking about, Senator, by up to 10% when we look at states that allow pharmacists to vaccinate compared to states that don't allow vaccinations without requirements of a prescription. And it's important to note that pharmacists are trained to do this. We often have more training than some other professions. We require, we require hours of training, more than 20 hours of training in school. And then we have to continue our training every year in order to maintain this knowledge. We learn about each individual vaccine, how to check for contraindications and how to manage side effects that might come up, although they are rare. It is important that we do this and it is a smart thing for us to push this forward for the children in the state of Maryland. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. My name is Dr. John Hodgson. I'm a pharmacist with Wise Markets in Baltimore. Um, I've been with Wise since 2019 when I graduated from University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Uh, I'm here today in support of Senate Bill 372 and like to give a personal statement of my time during the pandemic with this increased access. As pharmacists, we are some of the most accessible qualified healthcare providers available to the public. Some research suggests the public visits their local pharmacy more than double their doctor. This was never more evident than during the pandemic. My team and I became crucial players in the pursuit of public health during more heavily relied upon for patient consultation, care, most importantly, vaccinations. With the introduction of the PrEP Act during the pandemic, access to these critical vaccines was made more available to the public, including my community where we saw an influx in children under 18 relying upon us for their COVID vaccines, flu vaccines, and other routine vaccinations. Personally, I was surprised to see the number of patients, including children, that took advantage of this new access. I would have imagined that the preference would have been their doctors. But speaking in regards to children, so many parents were effusive with gratitude to have a convenient option compared to waiting for doctor's offices and appointments with such high volume. We made it a point to accommodate walk-ins for everyone, but especially children, in order to support this new access that was granted. Vaccinating this population of my community has been extremely uh, rewarding and something I take great pride in. As we all know, children are our future and access to healthcare is one of the most basic ways we can support our children. Expanding this access permanently eases the burden on many busy parents and allows community pharmacists to continue to do what we do best, bettering the, bettering the health of our communities. I wanna reiterate that Senate Bill 372 is not adding more to our plates. It's something we've been doing for the past two and a half years during the pandemic, taking in stride and helping our communities. I hope you find five for in passing this bill. Good afternoon, committee. Thank you for having me today. I'm Lauren Lincoln Auger. I'm a Walgreens healthcare supervisor. I'm a licensed pharmacist in Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and Illinois. I've spent the past 13 years um, in this position serving urban, suburban, and rural communities across the Mid-Atlantic and have been in Maryland for the last eight years. During the COVID vaccine rollout, Walgreens has worked closely with the governor of Maryland, Department of Health, and others to ensure that vaccine access with convenience to the people of Maryland. I wish to share a few examples of family and community seeking vaccinations access from pharmacists. As COVID vaccine was anticipated for children, parents reached out to their local trusted pharmacists. We had a wait list of parents wishing to schedule appointments um, once the vaccine was approved. Our local schools were also reaching out for solutions. Walgreens has hosted on-site flu, then flu plus COVID vaccine clinics at several private schools throughout Maryland in collaboration with the school nurse. The clinics were timed for the convenience of parents at drop-off and pickup um, so they can be present for their child's vaccine. In October, uh, a collaborative community group reached out to Walgreens to discuss how pharmacists at Walgreens can support closing the immunization gaps in families um, and students in the Baltimore City Schools. It was shared that many children attending Baltimore City Schools started school without the required vaccines because families based, faced barriers of getting those vaccines, such as access. The solution for immediate impact on closing those immunization gaps for school recommended required vaccines um, was for having a pharmacist on site to provide those, be an educational resource for patients, and most importantly, preventing illness. Um, as a community health care provider, we were at the table and ready to support this initiative, but the current uh, written requirement for a prescription from a medical provider was a roadblock. 
and we were unable to administer the vaccines that would have met CDC recommendations. The emergency bill um, presented today permanently authorizes our licensed pharmacists to order and administer vaccines to individuals as young as three years of old age, and we're favorable for this to provide access to our communities and families across Maryland. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Daniela Leone, and I'm a graduate student at John Hopkins School, um, the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I'm here to stand and give a favorable testimony for SB 30. 372. So analyzing healthcare models and finding areas in need of improvement is a substantial part of my coursework at Hopkins. Pharmacists have been linked to reducing healthcare costs and retail pharmacy immunizations relieve the burden on primary care providers as given in testimony before. Uh, it does so in a way that does not replace primary care providers. SB 372 has an additional safeguard that requires pharmacists to inform their patients of the importance of a well visit. The, with their primary care for provider. There is also an additional educational component that is required in order to um, immunize, ensuring that qualified and well-trained pharmacists are at the point of care for patients. During the pandemic, ph pharmacists were able to impact vaccination rates through the PrEP Act as they were Im authorized immunizers. Pharmacists are influential providers as they can respond to patient concerns, apply their healthcare knowledge, and address any vaccine hesitancy. As mentioned before, SB 372 affects both adults and youth. Youth in Maryland have been consistent with their immunizations during 2021, while pharmacists were given the authority to immunize. SB 372 is very important to keep vaccinations among youth in Maryland consistent, as pharmacy retailers are among one of the most accessible locations for immunizations. Retailers often use tools such as online schedulers, vaccine availability searches, and real-time store locators that create convenient access for youth and adults alike. Working parents and adults benefit from the convenience, the safety, the reliability of pharmacists in their everyday scope of practice. And their pharmacists already include um, routine immunizations in their everyday scope of practice um, for the past two years during the PrEP Act. So SB 372 ensures pharmacists continue this scope of work in Maryland, whether public health emergency is declared or not. Okay, hey, thank you all for your testimony. We're going to go to Senator Guile, then Reedy, then Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, panel. Um, so uh, as a parent of three kids, I can certainly relate to the need for convenience. Um, I mean, I can barely keep up with all the appointments that they need to do, whether it be for the dentist or doctor. But um, the, the one thing that I am wondering is, I mean, you touched upon the, um, the annual well visits and the impact or the concern that there may be as to whether parents are going to bring their kids in for it. And I think part of the reason for that is because you're required to have the vaccines, right, to go to school or to be at the daycare. Um, but it's my understanding, and so parents need need to get into the pediatrician to get those done. But um, it's my understanding is that you, there is no similar requirement for an annual checkup. I, or I, I think you have to have a physical before you start kindergarten. Um, but I don't think thereafter. I mean, I know that just from the experience of my kids being in public school, I have to periodically at certain grade levels provide proof of their updated vaccines. Um, but I don't think there's any requirement to, if for the schools and probably not for daycares either to provide proof that they're having their having regular annual physicals. Are you aware of that? Is, is, is there a requirement for that? <clears throat> no, I think that you're right. I do not think that there is um, a, a requirement for that. I mean, obviously, the requirement to get vaccinations um, does drive a, a lot of folks uh, or it does drive people into the um, into the pediatricians. And I will just share with you that the numbers um, are, it's like an order of magnitude, just so that you understand. So there are so many of the kids who are getting their vaccinations through the pediatricians and their well visits. The, the actual volume of the number of children who are getting it through the pharmacy um, is a relatively small number. And it's a smaller number um, for the kids who don't have a situation mm -hmm. like what you're talking about, where they don't have that home, um, and they are then trying to get into school. I receive emails from parents who are saying they couldn't enroll their kids in school because there were no pediatricians that would take them. There were no places that they could access uh, uh, something for, um, you know, to be able to get those vaccinations. And so that's what I hear more than I hear about the other party. 
or rather that just deals with this part. One yep, do you want to use the microphone? I was just going to say, that's why I brought up the medical home statistics. And I think that that's what's so fascinating here is back in 2017, you had almost 51% of children in the state who didn't have a primary care physician who did not have a medical home, which is a horrible statistic. Even despite providing this level of access, it's only dropped to 46%. Now it's gone down. And it's an important point that you make, but access is what matters here. And different families are not going to be able to get their children to a physician. So mm -hmm. um, access is what this is about. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Senator Reedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of questions about this. Um, I'm glad you talked about common law and 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 I, I think an amendment in here might be helpful to make make it very clear that it does still require parental approval. But I understand your point. No, I'm glad you made the I'm glad you made the point. But my larger question about this issue, I think, is a couple of things. One is I've been I've been given some statistics and some information that basically CRISP does not get updated as well from pharmacies. At, at all is that's I've heard that that's true. about from there when they since they've it's been administering immunet, immunet yeah. is what the pharmacists have to upload into mm -hmm. and there is there's clear data that the pharmacists um, are uploading that data in fact the the numbers that I have as far as data entered into immunet 21 22 shows that pharmacists were entering within the 24-hour period at an 88% rate, where non-pharmacists were at 82%. So the pharmacists actually are. When does that it? time extend from? Do you, do, is, is that recent? Is that like the last couple of years exactly, since we've been doing because, that? Because exactly, as Immunet has become, uh, you know, uh, it's been, re it's required, but it also is, it has to do with these vaccinations as a part of the requirement of what we passed in 2021 and making sure that they were complying with what we did, and they have to a great extent. Good. Well, that's good to know. I, I know that, um, you know, because they're on Immunet, well, that, that would give a pharmacist access. It will well, give the They'll physician. go in and look. Yes. But the pharmacist will be able to go both in and ways. look. Exactly right. That's the whole point of it, yeah. is to make sure that you've got it going both ways, so that the, the pharmacy is able to understand that we don't want, obviously we don't want double dosing or anything else like right. that. So you're able to look, you make sure you check. And it's the same thing for the, um, the pediatrician or physician that that's where they're able to access that information. Uh, okay. That's good. I mean, as Senator Gow mentioned about the, all the things we have to keep straight with our kids and, and it's a parent would maybe get confused. We all can get confused about what's there. So that's an important protection. I, I am concerned about, and this is just a, maybe a larger comment, I'm a little concerned about driving everything to the pharmacy, not because I don't think our pharmacists are great or trust our pharmacists, pharmacists do a great job, but by pushing, what gives me the most heartburn, and maybe somebody with the pharmacist can comment on this or anybody can, biggest, greatest heartburn is pediatricians are a really important part of Doctors are an important part of a children's lives. Now, we know there's some places, and, and the sponsors spoken very eloquently about some of the issues where there's not enough access to pediatric care. But even going to an urgent care or something would be good for a child to be checked. I really have a lot of concern about vaccinations being given to children without a doctor's prescription. A flu vaccine was maybe one thing, but even that at a young age, I think, is a little concerning. But I really, that's that's a concern. I don't know if anybody can Sir, speak to that. I want to speak to that. I just want to give you some uh, level of context on that. So again, there's this there's data around. For example, you know the, the, the highest one really is flu. But I just want to give you a, a context of scale. Okay, so in from 20, uh, 2021 through twenty twenty two, for flu, seventy three thousand were administered by pharmacy. And by you know, by the way, that could have also included uh, by pharmacy that were that were given a prescription from a, a physician. Sure. So that sure. is also the case. Three hundred and sixty-one thousand were done by non-pharmacy. Okay, so it's like I said, it's like a order of magnitude. This is providing a access for um, for a certain number set of people within the other spaces. Um, like the Tdap that I just talked about and everything else, you know, go back to the Tdap of the Tdap, which you think you would really consider pretty seriously. Um, only eight hundred and twenty-two in the pharmacy and one hundred and sixty-seven thousand in non-pharmacy environments. In other words, in the places where it's you know a, a physician or a nurse practitioner and these other things, it's providing access, which is what we want to do, right? 
but it is, you know, it's an important ad versus where it, it currently stands, okay? So it's for those most difficult cases, I would say, this is an important um, access point for them. Okay, Madam Chair, I'll conclude with saying, I, I, I appreciate the context and we can work on the bill some more, I'm sure, sure. as we talk in the committee. I, if it's not your, your numbers, I know you're trying to assure me, but your numbers are kind of working against the argument. We need to do this, I guess. And that's from my perspective, but we can, we can talk more often. Well, if I could address that. Yeah. So this, the, the, again, you could say that, but what about the families, as I've mentioned to you, who reach out to us because they can't take off of work? Like, you, you know, the, those who have the primary care physician and everything else, I mean, should we not be thinking about those who are finding themselves in the most difficult of circumstances to make sure we keep our kids safe? They can't get an appointment, Senator. They're not able to get one. They're not able to find someone who is able to, you know, to do that. I, I get and it. the pharmacies overall within the, the space of it have done 3.6 million um, uh, doses in this time frame, so it's not like they haven't done a significant amount and everything else. But I'm just trying to get, uh, drill no, I, down a little I bit for it. you. I get it, and I, I think though urgent care sometimes can meet that need, but also pharmacists are reporting they're overworked as well. So I, I just I, we, we don't want to debate the bill. No, I understand. I appreciate the answers. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thank you, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. And you know, as a, as a strong proponent of vaccines, you know, I, I, I do care about making it available to folks and and. Uh, you know, want to see that happen more. I think what what has kind of pushed this as a toss up to me is, you know, and I understand the panel has all leaned very heavily on the access piece. I get it. You know, I think it's important to kind of bear in mind that there is a counterbalance to this argument that it's not just all about access, that there is risk from not the vaccines themselves. I don't have a concern about the the actual vaccines. I think vaccines are safe. They're great. But my concern is folks not necessarily going to their well child visits. Yep. There's a risk from things being left off, things sure. not being diagnosed, doctors or nurse practitioners or others not being able to put an eye on a kid to be able to maybe find another condition um, that otherwise wouldn't have picked up until later in their life, that there is that risk there. And you're, we're trying to balance the the risk of that loss of, um, you know, contact with the provider versus the access issues. And I'm sympathetic to the access issues too. I'd like to hear about that, that risk piece there. And I think Senator Guile kind of touched on that as well, but it's, you've really leaned away from that piece. And, and Well, I did, but I did also mention the fact that we tried to put the protection in for that where we said that the pharmacist must indicate and talk about the well visit. They have to do that. That's in the law. That's what we did. We've maintained it in this one too, to try to address exactly what you're saying, to encourage and to make sure that we get as many children as possible to well visits. I'm very supportive of well visit, obviously. And I totally agree with you on that. But that's so, so th that's where we are attempting to try to provide um, some of that um, protection that you're asking for. So one one question then to to follow up on that is yeah. is would you be open to considering and I'm just throwing this out there um, potentially changing the age at which this could apply from three years to five years um, because this would give I guess pharmacists a more um, pharmacies a, a time for reasonable it would give uh, children a time for them to be able to catch up on their vaccines for school age kids. Um, but also open this up for pharmacists to, to kind of thread that needle there where a lot of well child visits occur earlier in life and maybe drawing the line at age five as opposed to age three. So I, I'm going to let Kaylee respond to this too, but you, I know that you know that we are seeking with this just to continue with the current access, which is three. I'm not saying we wouldn't have a conversation about it, but that's where it is right now. Um, so, but I'm not saying otherwise. Do you have a comment on I, that? I was going to say I defer to the sponsor and the committee, um, but it is an interesting overlap of time. And I think I know what point you're bringing up here. Um, and you're absolutely correct. Those very early on well vi visits are critical. Um, and there aren't a ton of immunizations that are given in that small window. So it's definitely something we'd be willing to talk about. Okay. Um, last question. Um, the, you're probably all aware that there's a federal vaccines for children program, the VFC program, which oftentimes allows underserved families to be able to um, have access to affordable vaccines. 
Um, have you explored uh, requiring pharmacies to also be VFC sites uh, who are immunizing kids? I have been researching that once I heard about it, Senator. I've looked at that. There were some certain um, uh, requirements that, that are there. Uh, it primarily is driven by those who are recipients of Medicaid. There is actually, and it is, it's, a, it's that federal program, as you well know. Um, and there are also some reimbursements, as I read it, that are like on a per patient basis that the providers would, uh, I'm sorry, that, for the, uh, that pediatricians would be able to receive that pharmacists likely would not be able to receive. So it's a little bit of a complex mm. issue, but I have been digging into it for certain. Okay. I'd be curious if you can follow up on if there are benefits that the providers are able to receive, the pharmacists are not, if, if, if that were to occur. Be yeah. interested to know yeah, I'm happy to do that, but that's a, that's one of the complications I've just mentioned mm -hmm. to it, but I have definitely been researching it. and We'll definitely follow up with you on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Hershey. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, just a couple things that are specifically in the bill. Right now, um, pharmacists are able to administer vaccinations that are listed under the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Yes, correct. This adds um, approved or authorized by U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Can someone tell me what that is? Yeah. Thank you for the question. So um, there's a couple different ways that our immunizations are looked at from a state level. Um, and in Maryland, FDA regulations trump that. So FDA recommended vaccines would be what we can provide in the pharmacy by pharmacists. Okay, so this allows you to administer them or is this now when we got into the order and administer? Order and administer any FDA recommended vaccines for the ages three and up. And I gather that order means prescribe, right? Yes, Whereas administer means somebody has already prescribed it and then you're doing it. Is yes, that accurate? Correct. Yes. Okay. And just again, some of this subject matter is new to us. Can pharmacists prescribe medications? Uh, pharmacists that have collaborative agreements um, can prescribe medications under that collaborative agreement with the physician. Um, in many other states that I practice and support our pharmacies, we have prescriptive authority, uh, which allows the pharmacist to write the prescription for the immunization and then provide that immunization to the patient. Collaborative um, agreement, what is, what's that? With something with a specific. So a collaborative agreement would be, um, so an example for one of an independent pharmacy that I know in another state does tests for UTIs, urinary tract infections, mm -hmm. but they have a collaborative agreement with an urgent care that says, if you test for UTI and it becomes positive and the patient meets this criteria, you can go ahead and prescribe, let's say, Bactrim. Yes, for one twice a day for seven days. I give you that authority to prescribe based off of the test that you did. Okay. But mm -hmm. so that's what would be an example of a collaborative. Agreement. And we you do, add, yeah, we do have collaborative agreements here in Maryland that we can file with the Board of Pharmacy. Okay. And and what is there a, a list of drugs or is it any type of drugs or what um, is it become specialized? Uh, if it's a collaborative agreement, it's not like a generalized term. It's the, the 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 agreement is very well laid out and a, 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 like a a document that has strict guidelines and protocols. It's not um, up for interpretation. That's where it's a collaborative agreement between a physician and a pharmacist. It's not one working independently from another. Okay. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Senator. I don't see any additional questions for the sponsor or this panel. Thank you all very much for your testimony. We have one additional in-person witness signed up in favor of the bill. Alaya Horton, if you would come forward. Good afternoon. You can get started as soon as you're seated. Good afternoon. My name is Aaliyah Horton. I am the executive director of the Maryland Pharmacists Association. We are the only statewide uh, professional society in Maryland for pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and student pharmacists. 
I listened to the testimony on my way here and sat for most of the the bill sponsors uh, talk. And so I think a lot was covered. So I'm not going to go back over that. I did submit written testimony. I did just want to add a couple of things. Um, I would support going back and doing some additional research for the vaccine for children's program. Uh, let me, I'm sorry, let me back up. We are in support of the bill. Um, and uh, we are working actually at the federal level to remove some of the barriers for vaccine for children programs so that more pharmacists can participate in that program. There are also barriers within the Department of Health for, for implementing it. And so we're working to address that. Um, there was also a question about pharmacists prescribing. Um, pharmacists actually do have independent authority to prescribe contraceptives here in Maryland. And I believe that was 2018 um, that that bill was passed. And so we do have that ability. I also just want to mention that um, not only the Maryland Pharmacists Association, but also the Maryland Pharmacy Coalition is in support of that bill, of this bill. And that includes the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, Maryland chapter, the Maryland Society of Health Systems Pharmacists. Those are the pharmacists working in hospital systems, um, as well as the Maryland Pharmaceutical Society, which is the Society for Pharmacists of Color, as well as the university, um, the schools of pharmacy, in the state, which are based in Baltimore, as well as on the Eastern Shore, and of the Maryland Association of Chain Drug Stores that was here. Um, I'm happy to follow up with some questions that I heard here and work with the other partners on supporting this bill. So I ask your favorable approval. Thank you very much. Are there questions? No questions for this witness. Thank you very much for your testimony. We're now going to call forward uh, Daniela. Dia Rosio, Steve Bress, Sarah Kuzak, Francis Ichio, Ayo Kimati. And I think I have one more chair, so Mark Diamond, you can come up as well. Good afternoon. You all can get started as soon as you're ready. And please identify yourselves before you speak. Hello, Senate of uh, Finance Committee. My name is Daniela Dorazio. I'm here opposing SB 372. Retail pharmacists are overworked and already have the burden of excess work, long shifts, no breaks, and constant interruption. There is clearly a safety issue every time a pharmacist has to change focus from prescription checking to patient consultation, insurance claim support, staffing issues, health and beauty aid inquiries, and vaccinations requests. For example, providers were asked to monitor COVID-19 vaccine recipients for 15, 30 minutes for signs of anaphylaxis. However, when my husband received the vaccine at Safeway, his interaction with the pharmacist lasted 30 seconds. The shot was administered and she was off checking prescriptions, answering phones and ringing up customers. Any anaphylaxis will have gone unnoticed as he was left alone and went about shopping immediately after the vaccination. With children, immediate resuscitation Tative care is crucial during anaphylaxis or other severe adverse reaction to medication. Pharmacists do not have the training or supplies to provide care during this situation. As a parent, I am dismayed that the bill will allow a child to receive vaccination with a caregiver present and not a parent or legal guardian. The parent must manage the health and wellness of their ch child, and in no way should the state undermine that relationship. This bill is simply a backdoor effort to allow childhood consent to vaccination as was allowed in SB 378, to which I also I was vehemently opposed and ecstatic it was retracted. In closing, please oppose Senate Bill 372 immediately to promote parents' rights and the safety of our patients receiving pharmaceutical care. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. My name is Sarah Cusack. Um, I was able to meet with some of you and with some of your staff to discuss the problems with this bill. And I just want to remind everyone that young children are not vaccinated like adults. So four-year-old children who would be impacted by this bill 
They get a DTaP, a polio, an MMR, a chicken pox, a flu shot, and a COVID shot at a single visit. So unlike an adult who goes into the pharmacy, wants to have this shot, <laughs> and sits in a chair, um, these children need to be laid down. They often need two people to help hold arms and legs. We're talking two naked shoulders, two naked thighs. It's a very different experience. As a pediatric physical therapist, I'm absolutely concerned about children this young missing pediatric screenings. That's where pediatricians are finding neurodevelopmental delays as well as growth issues. For adolescents, 11-year-olds uh, also have a, a pretty complex CDC recommended schedule. They receive the HPV vaccine, a Tdap, a meningococcal shot, a flu shot, and a COVID shot. The CDC recommends that um, for the HPV vaccine, they need to be inclined. They need to be laid down uh, for at least 15 to 30 minutes. So I'm just not seeing the infrastructure at the pharmacy. Someone's aide told me that she had a very nice private experience getting her COVID vaccine with a sheet around her and she was in a metal chair. But <laughs> That's just, that's not gonna work for kids. Um, lastly, the other safety issue is for the people picking up their prescriptions at pharmacies. It is dangerous. Every time a pharmacist has to stop what they're doing, they're filling a script and a child is screaming, maybe over here getting their shots while another child is, is coming to be assessed. So I'm opposed and ask for an unfavorable. Can you hear me? Okay. It's my first time to do this. I admire you all. You're obviously working very hard. You're eating your lunch while you're here. So I admire you and thank you for all your work. I'm just gonna read my testimony. My name is Francis Ichijo. It's a hard name to say. My husband is Japanese. So um, I'll read as best as I can. Dear Senator Augustine, who I think has gone out and finance committee, as a Maryland constituent, I'm writing to you and other members of the Maryland Finance Committee to firmly oppose Bill SB 372. Pharmacies are not doctor's offices and pharmacists and their assistants are not doctors. They should not have the authority to order and vaccinate our children. I guess that would be the prescription discussion that was before, even more so without parental or guardian informed consent, which I guess will be amended. I'm opposed to expanding vaccination privileges for pharmacists to administer all vaccines to three-year-olds and up. Pharmacists are already too busy to comply with mandatory counseling regulations, much less keep up with the constant interruption of vaccination. Interruption is a primary cause of dispensing errors. However, we all know retail chains will jump on this financial windfall and ask even more of their pharmacists and technicians who are quitting now in record numbers. I don't know about the numbers in Maryland, but uh, I think that's across the United States. Please do not aggravate an already dangerous situation by adding this burden to our pharmacists. Please oppose Senate Bill 372. Thank you. Fran each Joe. Thank Hi, my name is Steve Bress. I've been a Maryland resident for much more than 50 years and a Democratic voter since I could vote. I urge you to vote no on SB 372. Now, one of the problems is that I understand that uh, the pharmacists want to add vaccination to, the, to their organization. It is incredibly profitable. One of the pharmacist uh, trade publications uh, uh, pointed out that pharmacies should push to make vaccinations common in stores. Uh, every single one adds to the bottom line in that there is no such thing as a non-profitable vaccination to the pharmacists. Um, and they basically on to say there are no, well, exactly what I said, there are no vaccinations that are not profitable. Reading from really quickly, uh, just from one of these uh, documents, they say, well, maybe you should offer coupons and get more people to just take their vaccines, whether they actually were planning on or not. Well, okay, it says take a page from national chain pharmacies and big box stores, give patients a small voucher or coupon to your front end when they get an immunization from you. The profit you earn from them will outweigh the gift. Moving on, they also say incentivize your pharmacists. And this is where we get into a major problem with the discussions that you all have had. Uh, said the high margins on immunizations allow you to pay a bonus to your pharmacist for each immunization they administer. 
for an immunization that earns $20, let your pharmacist take two to five bucks of that to give them extra motivation. Well, it's one thing if the doctor has given a prescription and a parent or guardian uh, has come along with the child to get that prescription filled. It's quite another if now they're incentivizing a pharmacist who is probably underpaid and definitely overworked um, to write the prescription. That's just a conflict that shouldn't be allowed to happen. Uh, on the issue of uh, parents and guardians, I only have 12 seconds. The language in this bill says adult caregiver. It does not say parent or guardian, which means anybody who has custody of the child uh, is considered caregiver at that moment. And that's unacceptable. Please vote against. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Ayoki Mathi. I represent the Brothers of the DMV. Uh, I'm opposing Bill 372. The primary issue we have with the bill is that one issue that's facing every one of these bills, they're calling this new technology, which is not the technology that we had when we were growing up. It was not technology. It was called a vaccine. This new technology is gene altering, gene editing technology. It's called messenger RNA, mRNA. This messenger RNA has proven definitively to be harmful. So we have the VAERS system, which is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. In one year, more deaths have been reported to that official system than since 1990, 31 years, every single vaccine added up together over 31 years. There's nothing this dangerous that has ever been given in America presented as healthcare in the history of this country. Secondly, I submitted the Pfizer report to the panel so you could see it. This is from Pfizer, not from me. In April, 2021, they submitted a report to say, what have we found are the adverse effects? If you look at the last eight pages of that report, they listed 1,291 adverse effects, including all kinds of heart disease, all kinds of uh, death, various different things that they were able to say, this is what taking these injections will do. And the last thing I will say, it has now become evident and clear with each one of these mRNA technology injections, they deplete and harm the natural immune system. So they're doing harm, not doing help. Thank you. My name is Mark Diamond, and I've been a practicing pediatrician for over 40 years, and I'm representing the Maryland State Academy of Pediatrics. Charlie was an eight-year-old patient who I hadn't seen since he came in for five years of age for his shots. His mother said he was healthy, and he was only there because he needed a form signed, and I hadn't seen him for a long time, so I told him to come in so I could properly fill out his physical. She had no questions. He was healthy, she said, except for the fact that on the exam, I found a mass in his abdomen the size of a football. He had cancer of the kidney, suffered through radiation and chemo for a number of years and died at about 11 and a half. Could I have prevented it if I had seen him in that interval? Don't know. I'll never know. But maybe we could have helped him. A child's health Vaccinations are extremely important, but the system has problems right now with access, among other things. However, a child's health is not just vaccination. There are physical, mental, social issues that come up that all of us doctors have seen and diagnosed that the parents aren't aware of. That is the purpose of a well-child visit. And we know definitively that when shots are given elsewhere, the well child visits go down, as you said. You said only 51 to 46%. That's a lot. And if we can't examine the child and get the history and help the parents see if there are any problems, then 
that is a major issue you have to decide. We at the Maryland Academy oppose this bill just for that reason. We need more. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Ellis. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And anyone on this panel, uh, thank you for your testimony. Our pharmacist? My husband was. Okay, but you know, okay. My, so my husband got his uh, vaccine at the pharmacy. Okay. And the, the, the pharmacist left as soon as she finished giving him the shot. Right, okay. Well, uh, yeah, thank you for that. But I, I have a different question. Um, so, uh, so you were a... Uh, MD, uh, yes, uh, pediatrician doctor. Yes, say your name again. My name is Mark Diamond. I practiced Diamond. over forty years. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's an interesting uh, testament you have. Um, so when a child goes to, or anyone goes to a pharmacist, pharmacy, I wanted to ask this: uh, Do you know if they uh, have access to their vaccination records, and is that in the system? Uh, I've country? been told by others that. The information is not consistent. Sometimes it's there, but a lot of times it's not. And despite what was said before about how everybody is supposed to, yes, everybody is supposed to put the information in. Do they? No. Yeah. Who, are the, who are the main culprits for that? The, the, far, the, well, of the, the communication is, from what I understand, there's a gap that we get, and I say we, meaning globally, get don't get full information from the pharmacists. Now, whether they put it in and there's a problem with the system, uh, I can't answer that. But there is a problem with the system, yeah, with the that's, information that's, being wholesome and that's what the, comprehensive. That's what the other doctors, I don't just speak for myself here, but the other pediatricians uh, in the academy, say there are problems with that. So patients uh, that you have, uh, they have gotten shots at a pharmacist. Sometimes you don't have access to that. Correct. Record. And uh, that's a problem too. Well, uh, it, it becomes a practical problem in the sense that you don't have exact information. Okay, yeah. and they're going to school and you need to fill out the form that says they've received shot X, Y, Z, and you don't know that. So you have to either put, if you do it right, you have to put parents said they got the shot, but you have no proof. Or you say to the parent, well, I should I give them the vaccine, even though they say they've had it, and you have no proof. And that's a problem. So there's a lot of, not a lot, but there's a certain amount. How about, let me rephrase the question. There's a level of guessing you're saying with yeah. the complete record? Well, it, it's a matter of, of how do you comply with the law, if you will, versus do you trust what the parent says? And most parents are honest, obviously, but yeah. some aren't. But, you know, if a, a kid have uh, two parents, a mom and dad, and uh, or two guardians, and one take them at the pharmacy, one take them okay. to the... Uh, um, Pediatrician, that could be. Yes, very, yes, I've had that. I've had that happen. Yeah. Okay. Where parents are, uh, parents or caretakers are separated. Yeah, okay. is what you're yeah. describing. Yeah. And the one parent does it one way, and one parent does it yeah. another All way. Right. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Senator Kramer. Thank you, Madam Chair, Dr. Diamond. Thank you for your testimony, and certainly for all your many years of helping the community stay healthy. Um, I guess what we're trying to look at is this balance between how do we increase and ensure that children are, in fact, getting necessary vaccinations and providing greater opportunity for that to occur if they are not, in fact, going to a uh, pediatrician. Uh, I note that as sad as that story is that you just told us about one of your patients, the patient did not present by virtue of the need for um, a vaccine. It, the, the patient was there because mom was looking to get some kind of a physical health record. And, uh, and sadly, then you made the discovery. Um, so, you know, we're left with trying to 
look for that appropriate balance of we get it. The well visit is very important, but what about those children who are not receiving important vaccines by virtue of either lack of access um, or conflicts between the busy work schedules? Um, I believe the bill sponsored uh, noted Immunet as a resource for uploading documentation. Are you at all familiar with? Yes. With that. And so for the most part, if it is being accurately maintained, is that not a reliable resource for having a, a handle on whether a patient has in fact received certain it vaccinations? Should, it should be. But my colleagues say that there are many gaps. And now, again, I can't, I can only speak for me. I can't, right. you know, but uh, the general consensus of opinion that I hear is that that system is far from adequate at this time. My previous experience with these kind of networks, had they been terrible. Uh, this is the immediate here in Maryland is one of the better ones that, that I've been experienced with, but it still has a long way to go from what I can see. Now, just the suggestion uh, uh, in trying to find the balance, the idea of of a prescription from the doctor before the vaccine is given may carry some weight in the sense that they at least have to contact the doctor to get the prescription. And the doctor then has the option of saying, well, you know what, I need to see you, or you need to schedule an appointment to try to make it fairly easy to do. Well, I note that in current law, there is a requirement that at least a single effort be made, uh, a single documented effort be made uh, between I guess in this context, the pharmacist and the physician, and maybe that is something that we need to look at maybe to uh, beef up the requirement there between pharmacist and pediatrician, assuming that there is one. And, uh, and that's a valid point. So uh, thank you again. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions for this panel. Thank you very much for your testimony. We're going to call forward the next panel of witnesses who are also Thank signed you. up in opposition to the bill. Thank you. First timer, you did fine. All right. Um, those next witnesses are Krishna Manora, Diana First, Jenna Butler, Jill Capper, Pam Casemeyer, and John Kelly. Good afternoon. You can get started as soon as you're settled. We need another chair. One more chair. Okay. Hello, committee. Uh, my name is Krishna Manohar. I'm a resident of District 17, and I strongly oppose SB 372. This bill takes away the, from what I understand, takes away the parental rights over children's health. Uh, the pandemic emergency is over as declared by jo President Biden, and yet this bill is being rushed in as if there is still a crisis going on. Uh, despite their training, pharmacists are not as knowledgeable and capable to handle any adverse effects that the patient might experience as a skilled licensed pediatrician would. Um, Pharmacists will not be held responsible for any injuries brought on by the vaccination of the child, and the parent will not be able to get the answers as to what happened to their child. This bill seems motivated by, I guess, money with no regard for the consequences that will befall the uninformed and compliant public. As an uncle of two young boys, I am urging you to, to vote against this bill. Thank you. Good day. Um, good afternoon, committee, and thank you so much for your time today. My name is Jenna DeSasser Spotler. I'm a Maryland parent and a small business owner. I'm here today to urge you to give um, 
SB 372, an unfavorable report. Um, I wanted to briefly walk you through the history of this legislation in the General Assembly, um, trying to hurry and not be redundant, as I'm sure it is repeated information. Um, a version of this bill has come up for years. In 2020, we had this bill. Um, it was obvious from the supporting testimony that the financial gain was most attractive to pharmacies, and Senator Augustine frankly stated that that was part of the purpose of the bill in the hearing. Um, we already heard about the 2021 legislation that was modeled after the Trump administration's PREP Act amendment um, intended as a temporary emergency measure. Um, again, the support was not there for it, and instead of passing out right, um, this body decided to change it into a study so that the state could collect data while the federal emergency was allowing this anyway and see if it was working or not working. Um, that study legislation required two reports to be submitted by the Maryland Department of Health on this issue, uh, you know, the, the study part. Um, the first report was due by December 2021. Um, the report was submitted and is dated March 2022. It is not as detailed as it should be and ironically does not include any data from 2021 at all. There are a couple of clearly concerning figures. One is that the percentage of providers reporting to Immunet went from almost 70% to less than half in the period from 2018 to 2020. Um, another concerning is the drop in well visits we see with Medicaid covered minors, their vaccinations received in pharmacies doubled and during the same period, their well visits for the same population dropped by 50,000. Obviously this could be impacted by COVID closures. Um, in conclusion, I know uh, Senator Augustine had mentioned that there was there was a second report. There's an additional report. Um, I would ask this body and the sponsor to make it their responsibility to make sure that that report is received, done properly, and reviewed before this legislation moves forward. Thank you. Hey there. My name is Jill Capper. I'm a lifelong resident of Maryland, an outspoken health freedom advocate, and more importantly, a mother. I'm testifying today to oppose SB 372 because it's offensive, unethical, and a number of other things. It's offensive because we're trying to remove parents from the equation when they're usually the ones responsible for uh, helping their kids to be capable of making these types of decisions in the first place. And I'm wondering who's supposed to fill in that gap and why. And it's unethical because if we're lucky, Parents are advised to report to VAERS during an adverse reaction or when they believe their children may have been injured by vaccines. Well, they couldn't possibly be aware of something that has purposely or intentionally been hidden from them. And what do you know? Another win for big pharma, all on the backs of our children. So we'd all agree that it's our responsibility to protect our children. This should be obvious. Please take a step back to consider how damaging bills like this could be and work with us rather than against us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diana Furch. I'm a pediatrician uh, representing the Maryland chapter of the Academy of uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, which is a professional society for over 1,200 Maryland pediatricians and uh, a handful of nurse practitioners who have joined our organization as well. I'm also uh, have been a practicing pediatrician in the Dundalk area for 30 years. Uh, didn't leave far from home after I finished my residency at Hopkins in '94, and I am passionate about maintaining comprehensive health care. And what I've seen in my 30 years, especially in the last five to 10 years, is fragmentation of health care. Look at your own experiences. You go to the doctor, you leave with five referrals. Did you get your questions answered? Pediatricians are at the heart, uh, we're the glue for many of our families, especially in an underserved community like Dundalk. Yes, we've all been affected by COVID. I celebrate the participation of pharmacists in the delivery of vaccines, especially emergency vaccines, COVID and flu, but I do not uh, at all. I, I think there are in, unintended consequences when you really carve out the pediatrician at these critical visits, uh, the three, the four, the five, the six. I have this healthy kids uh, kind of matrix that shows you all of the other, there's one line for vaccines, all of the other things that we do, vision, hearing, developmental testing, testing for anemia, testing for sleep, talking about, you know, kind of gun safety and, and safe storage for guns, all these things that are also life savings. I'm very pro-vaccine, but I think a very, an informed decision and conversation needs to be had with families. Two very brief patients. I saw a four-year-old about a month ago 
who came in looking pale to me. The mother had no concerns. I did a CBC on this child after seeing the paleness and this child was profoundly anemic because the child was drinking 90 ounces of milk a day. That kid went to the pharmacist for their visit. I don't think that the holistic child would have been seen. And yes, is it triumphant for that child to get vaccines? It is, but that family sees that visit to the pharmacy as checking a box, got what I needed, don't need to see the pediatrician. And as Dr. Diamond shared, that, wrapping it up, we need to be at the center and we need to keep this simple. We need to build the medical home. Thank you. Hi, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Pam Casemeyer. I'm here not only on, the, uh, on behalf of the Academy of Pediatrics, but on behalf of the Mid-Atlantic Association of Community Health Centers, and also on behalf of the State Medical Society. I'm just going to, you've heard a lot of testimony, pro and con. I'm just going to talk about a few points that seem to wind their way through all of this, and also put it a little back in context. The current structure was changed in, because of the COVID um, epidemic. We understand that. And we're not here. We're actually here saying maybe COVID, flu, any other public health emergency vaccine may make sense under this framework. But if you go back before that time, and now, not that we don't still have management issues, Maryland's had one of the highest vaccination rates in the country historically. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's so much of an access issue. And if there is, we should focus on those points, but we shouldn't undo the well child medical home structure after a very short period when historically our vaccination rates were not lagging. But secondly, um, so maybe there's certain vaccines that could fall in that category. Um, the other thing is the previous structure two years ago had the prescription requirement in it. That can be done even if you don't see your pediatrician. A prescription can be sent electronically. So if you're connecting up with a primary care provider, your pediatrician, your, your local community health center or other area, and for some reason the timing isn't right, they could have sent a prescription to have it administered. It was only down to age 11. Maybe we need to talk about that, but a prescription, and it kept still that sort of comprehensive view. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is John Kelly, um, resident of Maryland. Uh, one thing I want to note that there's a presumption through all of this that, uh, uh, that all vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, this is not, uh, this is, that this is not true is evidence uh, by the uh, contentious debates among leading scientists and doctors, and more importantly, by tens of thousands of children with uh, recognized injuries and deaths from vaccines. Uh, so therefore, uh, we have to take a closer look at this. And uh, the most important thing in getting vaccines is uh, informed consent. Uh, just having a wellness visit is not sufficient. Uh, the uh, to uh, or the wellness visits in the bill is not sufficient. Uh, and uh, the pharmacist, are they going to be able to give con informed consent? Are they going to be able to describe the risk and benefits uh, of a particular vaccine in general, for example? Uh, will they be able to notify the patient or the person getting the vaccine that none of the vaccines on the childhood schedule had ever been tested against a true, a real placebo? Uh, in regard to uh, the COVID vaccines, uh, will they be able to uh, tell them uh, that the uh, CDC uh, has released information uh, about the uh, inflammation of the heart and heart muscles caused by the vaccine? Uh, will they tell the patient that this vaccine or the person receiving it, that this vaccine is not going to just stay in your arm, it's going to go all through your body and it can affect various organs in your body. Uh, are they going to tell them that? Uh, are they going to tell them about the uh, VAERS adverse effects where there are over 32,000 deaths reported from the vaccine and over 260,000 uh, injuries? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Senator Lamb. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a, a question for Ms. Casemeyer and, and I guess Medkai and, and Dr. Tapper. Um, the, you know, and, and this stems from the question I asked the, the earlier panel too, um, because I'm not entirely sold that, that vaccines are a driver of well child visits that, um, uh, because and it's for the reason that I think not many parents are aware of the vaccine schedule. Um, so to my earlier question to the prior panel, um, would it help alleviate your concern if we were op if we were to set the age at say like five years where it would allow pharmacists to be able to still help families um, who have gaps in their vaccine records when they enroll in schools. But um, also schools require oftentimes a physical for um, the students before enrollment. And there are also no childhood vaccines or a few that occur between five and 11. So it shouldn't impact the well child visit. So I'm wanting to hear what your thoughts are on that resetting the age at like five. I, you know, again, I really think that parents' perception, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So in my practice, I really find that people are rather well-informed. We have some of the highest vaccine rates, and that's because a lot of people are working hard at getting the message out. So I'm, but I, I fear that even saying five is okay. I mean, we have a public health epidemic of mental, uh, of some of occult mental illness in our teenagers right now. And I have seen probably a dozen teenagers since the new year who through preventive visits with me, they had to come in also for vaccines, either they needed their 16 year old shots or their 11 year old shots. But they came in through preventive visits with me and on pre-visit questionnaires about their mental health. And on a number of occasions, one gal comes to mind, her mother had no idea that she was cutting and had suicidal ideation for six months prior. She was coming home from school, going to her room, parents were stressed after work. They did, you know, often didn't have meals together. So this is that fragmentation that I talk about and the lack of, you know, the lack of face-to-face -face con contact with a pediatrician who, you know, if you look at the EPSTD screens, we do these, I do them in my sleep. It's more important for me to make sure a child's mental health is intact or as important than to make sure that they've got a tetanus booster. Mm -hmm. Or, And I think that, that that's the message we give to families. You know, I just think about myself, you know, we check that box and we're like, I'm good. I got, you know, ah, I got my sports physical. And, you know, a lot of families come to us if they if they they do perceive their child has a vaccine reaction to, you know, a lot of kids do get local reactions to COVID. Very few have any systemic reactions, but some of them do. And we're the ones who get called. The pharmacist doesn't get called in two or three days. The pediatrician does. So really, I think it's not just an age issue. It really is a concept of preventive holistic health care. And you, I think it's tremendously undermining to take vaccines out of the equation because I think families, uh, families do see it sometimes as I got. You know, I'm not saying all the families, but the ones probably that need that well visit the most will probably go to the pharmacy, and that child may be suffering with a silent mental health issue or worse, as bad. Uh, you know, a medical condition that would be picked up in a, in a basic 30, 40 minute interview and physical. And I, and I appreciate that. I mean, I think we're just trying to strike the right balance here. And, and we have heard from um, patients as well who said they've gone to large pediatric practices or even just their pediatrician, who if they decide to decline a specific vaccine, the, the provider will say, we no longer want to see you as a patient. That drives an access issue as well. To you know, and, and that's a little bit dissonant to to you know what a lot of the providers are saying, and just wanted to to highlight that the, the the Department of Health has weighed in in support of this bill. I guess they've kind of weighed the risks and say that this that the gains from this outweigh the risks. So, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I don't see any additional questions for this panel. Thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon. We're going to turn to virtual witnesses. First signed up in support of the bill is Belawo Awakoku. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Yes, um, good afternoon uh, to the committee, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Balawa Akwakoku, a State Government Affairs Manager at the National Community Pharmacists Association. Um, our association represents just about under 20,000 pharmacies across the country, independent pharmacies, uh, which includes about 300, uh, just over 300 in the state of Maryland, uh, which um, these uh, pharmacies uh, filled over 20 million prescriptions last year, having a huge um, impact on patients. Um, just not to belabor too many points that which were made by uh, the in-person uh, affirmative panel. Um, but uh, this bill uh, it just seeks to uh, really just grant and make permanent the authorities, the vaccination authorities that uh, pharmacists have had uh, since uh, 2020 uh, through the Federal PrEP Act. Um, that was, uh, the PrEP Act was later amended to allow pharmacy technicians uh, to uh, vaccinate for flu specifically. Um, so this, uh, this bill um, really just looks to make those uh, those authorities permanent. We, our organization, has seen uh, these type of bills in terms of expanding uh, vaccination all uh, throughout the country, um, successes and, and uh, failures uh, in a whole bunch of combination. Um, but we do want to stress um, that uh, pharmacists do have the training to do this. The bill does include um, requiring pharmacists to go through training to be able to respond to adverse reactions. So I just want to make sure I made that a particular point. And also um, with immunizations, pharmacists serve as a very a good and uniquely placed gateway into other services, whether that be testing and uh, evaluations for other medications. So just want to really um, emphasize that specific point. And I hope um, that the committee um, approves this bill, uh, Senate Bill 372. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no questions from the committee. So we're going to move to our next witness. And the remaining witnesses on this bill are signed up in opposition. We're going to start with Megan Montgomery. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Griffith and members of the committee. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify today. My name is Megan Montgomery, and I am testifying on behalf of the Love Maryland PAC. This bill, while well-intentioned, is unfortunately going to have a negative impact on the health and wellness of our most vulnerable children in the state of Maryland. While maintaining a highly vaccinated population is of vital importance to the state, cutting both the pediatrician and, as the bill is written, their the child's parents out of the process is the wrong way to go about serving our most vulnerable children. Children need a three-legged stool of parent, child, and pediatrician, and this bill cuts two of those three legs out. Um, I know that Senator Augustine has some access issues, and I want to note that urgent care uh, currently is uh, eligible to provide childhood vaccinations. They have much more expanded hours than pediatricians, and they get, these children get at least a cursory well-child visit while they are at the urgent care. They have places to lay down for vaccines, that that is a requirement for administration. And um, Senator Lamb asked, no, there is not a specific physical other than sports physical requirement for children. So these children, our most vulnerable children, are now going to fall off a face of a healthcare cliff. Their parents are going to take them to the period to the pharmacist, get their vaccinations, the school is not going to know that they don't have well child visits, and all of the screening that we have heard for, you know, the past few minutes is going to be ignored. Um, this bill is also very different than the various renditions that Senator Augustine has uh, put forth uh, unsuccessfully before this committee in the past. The child's A's is, is lower significantly, and there's parents cut out of this um, as well with the caregiver language. Um, the current law, which allows children 11 and up to be vaccinated by a, PD, by a pharmacist with a prescription, was intended, and the only reason that it passed was for very rare vaccinations, for example, when traveling. And for this and many reasons, we ask for you to vote unfavorably for this bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for your testimony. We're going to turn now to Jessica Helms. Good afternoon. There it goes. I think, now can you hear me? We can hear you now. There it goes, sorry. Hi, um, my name is Jessica Helms and I just wanna quickly point out that I'm a former Prince George's County teacher. When we have students come in, they are required to have a select list of vaccinations and our nurses actually will go through and make sure each of these kids have them. If they don't by October, I believe it is, I'm no longer in PG, um, those kids are sent out until they come in with those vaccines. I never once had a child kicked out because they were lacking vaccines. The parents were able to get them for them. They were going to their well visit and getting these things. I also want to point out that when I spoke with Senator Augustine's office, 
I was told expressly that the point of the, the bill was to make sure that anyone could get a child a vaccine, including a babysitter. That was language used with me by an aide, by the um, auditor, actually, Al, analyst Al. And it concerned me. I don't want to leave my children with a babysitter or a daycare provider and have them override something our pediatrician said wasn't safe, one of my allergy kids, and take them, get this vaccine at a pharmacy, and not have to tell me. I should be in charge of that, nobody else. I also have a concern because my grandmother got a vaccine at a pharmacy here about eight years ago. Uh, they're in New York State, and she still has problems lifting her shoulder beyond here because it was improperly given. Um, I included an article from Pharmacy Times in what I submitted to you, and I just want to read a quote from it. It says, Dr. Boder noted that patients who receive vaccines at a pharmacy may be pulling their shirt down just a little, which could lead the pharmacist to administer the vaccine higher up on the shoulder. In contrast, patients receiving vaccinations in a physician's office may be dressed in a gown, which would allow for more space to administer the vaccine properly. We already have overworked pharmacists. With my allergy child, I have more than once been given the wrong size EpiPen and had to go back to the counter and say, this is the incorrect prescription, please fix this. I would hate to see someone get the wrong medication, the wrong size dosage that my child would have, or to get something done improperly because the pharmacist is too rushed. Um, with all that, please return an unpaid report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no questions for you this afternoon. So we're going to move on to our next witness, who is Emily Tarsell. Can you unmute for us? No problem. Good afternoon. I'm Emily Tarsell. I am a mother, a licensed therapist, and founder of Health Choice Maryland, grassroots nonprofit who advocates for health choice. We oppose this bill because it's a threat to parental rights and to inform medical consent. Uh, the bill seems, seeks to extend emergency authorizations for a pandemic that no longer exists. And childhood vaccination rates in Maryland are among the highest in the nation, so doctors are meeting the need. The youth and adolescents, uh, youth and adolescents seem to be the target of the bill because they might be in a pharmacy without a parent and could be enticed by sugar-coated ads, bribes, or fear into getting vaccinated. But children and adolescents are not adequately uh, informed and able to evaluate risk and benefits. I know from personal experience because 12 years ago, my daughter Christina and I were deceptively told that Gardasil was safe and effective and would prevent cervical cancer. Chris got the shots and she died 18 days after her last injection. We were not told about the risk. It took my experts and attorney eight years to overcome denial by the government, but they finally conceded that she died from her Gardasil shot. And by law, pharma, doctors, and pharmacists cannot be held accountable. So uh, there have been many deaths and injuries uh, following Gardasil. So weighing the risk and benefits clearly should be done on an individual basis in conjunction with the parent, the guardian, the child, and the doctor. And Gardasil is a very expensive vaccine, over $500 for a series. So it could be very lucrative to a pharmacy. Um, if they just could get rid of that pesky need for informed consent. So while this might be uh, excellent for provider liability-free profits, it's bad for children's health, and we urge you on unfavorable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There are no questions from the committee. So we'll now turn to Joe St. Jo George. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, committee um, and Madam Chair. My name is Joe St. George. I'm the um, Chief Legal Officer for the Women of Color, Color for Equal Justice Law Center. Um, without belaboring, I'm a former um, uh, a former trial lawyer for medical malpractice defense. I defended doctors and hospital institutions. Um, I wanna speak specifically to the language within the bill with regards to giving caregivers the ability to give vaccines. And what I want to point out is that language specifically conflicts with federal statute 42 U.S. Code 300 AA 26. And it's in my written uh, statement um, that needs to be evaluated because common law does not trump federal statutory law. And the statute states specifically that um, care providers are shall give 
legal representatives written information um, in advance of giving a vaccine. And that written information must include a concise written description of the risks associated with a vaccine and with the availability of the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. And so um, it is our opinion that the statute as written will be preempted by federal law. Um, so that means that it will be uh, basically statutory illegal. And for the following reasons, because the other reason, the reason is that we don't want parents who are not involved in the process, specifically when parents are going through divorces and one parent may want the child vaccinated and another one doesn't. The federal mm -hmm. statute says that representatives S, both parents are supposed to really give informed consent. And so we, we don't want the legal system to be bogged down um, without when you, particularly when you have uh, parents going through a divorce and our legal law center has helped parents in that situation where one parent wanted a vaccine and the other one didn't. And then secondarily, uh, we really want uh, the organization, the committee, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. There are no questions from the committee. So our final witness on the bill is Julie Sharp. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. Hello, Chairman Augustine and members of the Finance Committee. I am a mom of four school-aged children and a wife of a person suffering with lifelong epilepsy. My husband had brain surgery one year ago and um, it was to control his seizures and he still requires anti-seizure medicine. Nevertheless, I count on the pharmacist to be alert and present when they fill my husband's prescriptions. Um, filling the prescription accurately means my husband can function in his daily life. Seizures knock him out for at least half a day. Seizures mean he can't drive for months. Maintaining proper levels of the meds in his blood means he leads a better life. Mistakes in filling his prescriptions can be serious. Over the past 20 years, many times the neurologist has changed my husband's meds. Every time insurance and pharmacies and doctors have had to coordinate communication. There have been countless times I've been alerted a prescription is ready and I've gone to pick it up only to find that actually the pre-approval is still in the works or it's the wrong dosage, or they accidentally refilled instead of changed the medicine, or they substituted with a generic when in his case, the name brand drug was essential because of prescription, uh, the, the precision standards of name brand drugs, or there's some other problem a lot of times. Pharmacists are busy. These issues are just a little of what's keeping them busy. The prescriptions they fill are a tiny part of their days and they're fallible human beings. They're making mistakes without any added responsibilities. It's dangerous to ask a pharmacist to be uh, doing their regular tasks and then add on something as important as childhood vaccine. In my experience, they have demonstrated the challenge of successfully multitasking their existing responsibilities. Oh, okay, uh, I thought it was done. Uh, Close response. it up. Cons uh, consulting with patients, communicating with stakeholders, and filling prescriptions and other things. Vaccinating children is a completely different kind of work. The extra burden will lead to more mistakes and will endanger patients. I oppose SB0372, which would allow pharmacists to vaccinate children. Thank you for voting. No. Thank you for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee for this witness. So that will conclude our hearing on Senate Bill 732. Colleagues, we're now going to turn to Senate Bill 480, which is Mental Health Law Assisted Outpatient Treatment Program. Senator Lewis Young, and if you have a panel, please bring them forward. I and do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Morgan Mills, Cynthia Lewis, Michael Gray, Deborah Bennett, and Mary Ann Eichenberger. And I will get started. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Finance Committee. Good to be back with you again. This bill dovetails on an issue I presented to you last week, dealing with the overcrowdedness of our emergency rooms. SB 480 is a critical approach to a spiraling mental health crisis. 
assisted outpatient treatment, which I will now refer to as AOT, is a practice of using a civil court order to encourage outpatient mental health treatment engagement in a small, high-risk subset of individuals with severe mental illness who often have cycled through the revolving door of hospitalization, jail, homelessness, and other needless suffering. Their suffering could be minimized because AOT, which is authorized in 47 states, and actively used in 31 states can engage them in effective outpatient treatment when because of their illness, they are unable to adhere to voluntary services. To understand the importance of AOT, one must understand the severely disabling nature of untreated schizophrenia severe bipolar disorder, and schizoaffective disorder. These conditions include the symptom of psychosis when the brain cannot recognize reality. It is often characterized by delusions and hallucinations and the loss of the ability to make rational decisions, making the exercise of freedom of choice impossible. It can result in the inability to take care of one's own health needs. An additional symptom of these illnesses can be lack of insight, where the brain cannot recognize the illness, even psychotic behavior, and that treatment is needed even though it's evident to almost everybody else. Therefore, the individual may reject or be unable to adhere to any voluntary treatment. Without medication and treatment, the individual truly no longer resembles the person they were or could be, and they can suffer terribly. AOT offers a compassionate intervention from the mental health care system and civil, not criminal, courts, which can restore rational thought, the ability to exercise freedom of choice, and start recovery. I want to explain how AOT works because there are a lot of misconceptions. A petition is filed with the court alleging the respondent meets the AOT criteria, along with a corroborating statement from a treating psychiatrist who has recently examined the respondent. The court reviews the petition and schedules a hearing. The respondent must be represented by an attorney. To respect the respondent's due process rights, the respondent must have the opportunity to present evidence, call witnesses, and cross-examine adverse witnesses. No later than the hearing date, a treatment plan is developed with the respondent's input, and it's presented to the respondent and the court. For each service listed in the treatment plan, a provider has been identified that has agreed to provide the service. A psychiatrist explains the clinical basis for their determination that AOT is necessary for the respondent's health and safety and meets the other criteria. If the court finds that there's a clear and convincing evidence or case that the respondent meets AOT criteria, then the court orders AOT for a period of up to a year. If the person does not follow the treatment plan, the provider and respondent would discuss the reasons and whether the treatment plan needs changing. The court may convene a hearing to discuss and determine 
ways to continue the necessary aspects of treatment. The last resort is for the treating psychiatrist to consider whether a petition for an emergency evaluation for hospitalization under existing state statute are met. AOT may be renewed for additional periods of up to one year if the respondent still meets the admission criteria under the same procedures of the original petition. Let me talk about the admission criteria because this is another area where there is a lot of misinformation. This is not an approach for everyone with mental illness. Far from that, it only applies to a small group that meet narrow and very specific criteria, such as the individual must be over 18, they have a mental disorder, an ongoing lack of compliance with treatment resulting in hospitalizations, incarceration, or any act of serious violence towards self or others, or serious threats of or attempts of harm. The respondent nevertheless is capable of surviving in the community with outpatient treatment and support. The respondent is in need of AOT in order to prevent a relapse that would make them a danger to self or others. The respondent is unlikely to adhere to outpatient treatment without AOT based on recent history or because the aspects of their illness that interfere with their ability to make rational decisions. AOT is the least restrictive alternative appropriate to maintain the person's health and state safety. A few other points I'd like to make to respond to some of the oppositional testimony. AOT does not authorize any forcible medication or other treatment. There's no contempt of court or a path to jail. There's data that proves the effectiveness of the program from numerous other states. For example, the program is shown to reduce hospitalizations by 77%, reduce incarceration rates by 87%, and homelessness among participants by 74%. There's also significant cost savings involved because the reduced hospitalization and criminal justice costs can result in a 40 to 50% public cost saving. The common respect for a judge's order, also known as the black robe effect, plus consistent communication from the judge and treatment team that they care about the participants' success in the community are usually enough to motivate participants to follow their treatment plans. AOT is not racially discriminatory. Disproportionate enrollment by race in New York is likely the result of systemic barriers to treatment prior to enrollment in AOT. In that way, AOT actually counteracts past discrimination. I also want to point out that there are federal SAMHSA grants available this year for new AOT programs, but they are only given out once every four years. Now, if you've read some of the background information, you've probably seen letters of support for a program called Outpatient Civil Commitment or OCC. Now, it's a well-intended program, but it doesn't serve the exact same population as AOT. And it's implemented somewhat differently. The administrative law judges who preside over OCC 
lack the authority to convene the parties for a conference to review the progress of the respondent, troubleshoot the treatment plan, and encourage adherence to treatment. Absent the court's authority, as is the case with AOT, OCC places a great deal of responsibility on a peer to make treatment happen. AOT can and often should include peer support specialists, but they're only one vital element of a treatment and support team. I've tried to obtain some data for you on the OCC plan. Unfortunately, it's been in operation five years. I can only find online um, information for the first three years, although it is required by the legislation that passed it. So in the first three years, three patients were served at a cost of $865,947. So that's about $288,649 per patient. You've heard a few other objections as we have, and we have worked closely with stakeholders to try to find middle ground. In fact, that's why the bill you see before you now is so dramatically different than last year's bill. So I want to just give you three major points that we heard and we've addressed. The three-day period between petitioning and the hearing is impractically short. Someone in the community could be ordered to undergo an evaluation involuntarily to determine if they meet the AOT criteria and involuntarily taken for evaluation and non-treating psychiatrists could complete AOT evaluations. So let me tell you briefly about the amendments that have been submitted to address these objections. We've increased the length of time for a hearing to 10 days after the petition is filed. We've removed the language allowing for involuntary preliminary evaluations, and we've limited the psychiatrists eligible to complete an affidavit accompanying the petition to a treating psychiatrist who has evaluated the patient within 10 days before the date of the petition. Of course, we're open to other amendments. Uh, in fact, the fiscal note, we have an idea how to reduce that. Uh, we could reduce the costs of reporting by the health department by having the participating jurisdictions report instead. So in my closing remarks, I'd like to ask you, please don't commit this to another study. We've studied it twice in our state. It's been studied by 31 states around the nation. We have all that data. It's positive. Uh, the individuals that have gone through it have high satisfaction rates. The SAMHSA grants are available now. I believe the objections have been answered. And I ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Dr. Cynthia Major Lewis, and I am a, a director of psychiatric emergency services at Johns Hopkins Hospital. I thank the finance committee and Senator Lewis Young for inviting me today. Um, I'm happy to be here because as a frontline emergency room psychiatrist, I did not understand what I could do to help my patients. And I realized that I had to get in front of people who have the power to make decisions and commit funds and to uh, change law in order for me to do something about the concern that I have for the patients that I treat. 
Um, I am here as an individual. My views do not represent um, my employer, Johns Hopkins. I am part of the legislative committee for the Maryland Psychiatric Society, who is supporting um, this bill with amendments. But I am here to represent myself as an emergency room psychiatrist, as a community psychiatrist, who is demoralized and concerned about how I feel we are failing our patients with severe mental illness. Um, my background is that I um, completed my residency program at Johns Hopkins. I um, did a service commitment on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, a rural um, underserved community mental health center. I then served a 16 years in our community mental health clinic where I was a attending psychiatrist. We had therapists, uh, social workers, nurses. These are patients who a lot had severe mental illness, but they were coming to their appointments. They were compliant with treatment. Um, I see that my time is going to be up. I did submit written testimony, which gives a little bit more specifics. I am here to answer questions. It wasn't until my, I got embedded into the emergency department four years ago that I started to realize that we are failing our patients with severe mental illness. This is like 1% of the 4% of patients with severe mental illness. 19% of patients have mental illness, but it's 4% have severe and 1% of the population that are meeting this criteria. I did a Grand Rounds presentation and thought that we were one of um, a few states that uh, did not have this, was just floored to find out that Maryland's one of three states, I'm sorry, that do not have this and many other states do, and we have to find an answer. I will be here to answer questions because I can attest to everything that was said by the Senator. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, and members of the Finance Committee. My name is Morgan Mills with Compass Advocacy here today on behalf of NAMI Maryland. We support SB 480, which would authorize an assisted outpatient treatment program in our state. We are one of three states without this program that helps individuals access health care when they need it the most. NAMI believes that all people have a right to make their own decisions about medical treatment. However, we're also aware that there are individuals with serious mental illness who, at times, due to their illness, lack the insight or good judgment about their need for medical treatment. Relying solely on voluntary engagement leaves a small percentage of people out that refuse to engage on their own volition. Uh, as was mentioned, this is a very specific subset of individuals we're talking about here. They're suffering from severe mental illness. They get caught in a cycle of recurring hospitalization, incarceration, homelessness, and people need treatment to be supplied when they cannot choose it for themselves. It's important to note that this is not coercive forced treatment like opponents may say, it's not the case. Um, the reason to involve the court system is to get the individual's attention through the seriousness of the court process. The individual cannot be held in contempt of court if they do not engage with their treatment plan. Um, consequences for non-adherence include appearing in court for a status review, modifying the treatment plan, or ordering an evaluation for a potential um, hospitalization. Simply put, some patients lack the capacity to recognize their illness and face reality, which causes them to refuse treatment, leading to a vicious cycle that the state is spending a lot of money on, like intensive care and ER care and incarceration that we see obviously has no lasting effect. We cannot continue to allow this small percentage of severely mentally ill Marylanders to deteriorate simply because they cannot recognize that they need treatment. We urge a favorable report. Thank you. My name is Michael Gray with the uh, Treatment Advocacy Center, and we are a nationwide nonprofit dedicated to removing the barriers to treatment of severe mental illness. And we are nationwide, but myself and several of my colleagues reside here in Maryland. Uh, quickly, touch on the fiscal note. The fiscal note is written for this bill as if, as if Senate Bill 480 was a statewide mandate. It is not. It's very intentionally tailored by Senator Lewis Young to only allow, enable AOT for jurisdictions within Maryland who wish to do AOT. It also does not take into account cost savings, mostly through Medicaid funds. Of course, that's some federal money, but a whole lot of Maryland's money uh, being used to treat people in hospitals uh, when they could be receiving outpatient treatment. One of the main points of AOT is to get people the outpatient treatment they need to survive in the community, in their community, with their families, living their lives, not cycling endlessly in and out of hospitals. And out of respect for the committee's time, that's all I've got. But we'll, of course, be here to answer questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee, 
My name is Deborah Bennett. I am here to give testimony in favor of Senate Bill 480. I'm a mother, a caregiver, and a love of a loved one with a severe mental illness, a NAMI member in Prince George's County, and a volunteer Maryland ambassador with Treatment Advocacy Center. My son is diagnosed with a co-occurring disorder and a severe hearing impairment. Since 2021, he has used voluntary mental health services in three Maryland counties, Frederick and Arundel, Baltimore, and Baltimore City. Yet, he continues to cycle between hospitalizations, homelessness, victimization, and incarceration. The cost of his 16 hospitalization must now be close to a million dollars. Maryland only offers voluntary services, but they do not work for everyone with a SMI. Last year, my son was in the hospital for nine months approximately and only in the community for three months in a voluntary residential program in Baltimore City. In June, he left the program due to his lack of insult about his need for consistent treatment and housing. Before going back to the hospital, he told the crisis responder, I don't have control of my life anymore. I need medicine. In addition to medicine, my son needs an AOT program to ensure that he takes the medicine, stays in treatment and housing. In August, he agreed to a voluntary residential crisis service and weeks later, he left. He went back to the ER, he left, was arrested, and then he was committed to the state psychiatric forensic hospital. January the 30th, after five months of confinement, he was released to another program, voluntary program in Baltimore. In February the 9th, the cycle started all over again. He was back in the hospital. Last week on February the 22nd, he was discharged and returned to the same voluntary program. Again, voluntary services alone are not working for my son. An AOT program will provide outpatient service that he must adhere to. An AOT program could save my son's life. My son used to call me his best friend. Now he says I'm not his mother. Please support SB 480. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for um, listening. I am in support of SB 480. My name is Mary Ann Eichenberger. Um, I am an advanced practice nurse and I've been working for over 40 years in mental health. Um, I live in Howard County in District 12 and I am testifying as an individual for AOT. The evidence shows that those who are severely mentally ill that do not receive treatment in earlier stages of their illness and that have had to have multiple restabilizations, which is what all of these hospitalizations that these individuals are talking about are, um, have a poorer response to future treatment and poorer long-term outcomes. It's critical to get these individuals whose judgment, reasoning, and or inability to control their behaviors into treatment so that they, the clients, can make informed decisions regarding their future treatment. I have worked with numerous seriously mentally ill clients, um, both on the inpatient, on the outpatient, in the emergency room. Um, and what strikes me every time is that my clients describe horrors when they are restabilized of what it's like to be homeless, to search for food in garbage cans, to beg for food, um, to not understand that the voices that they're hearing are not real, that they're ex that what the, they believe is not correct. Um, it, it literally almost brings me to tears. And I hope every one of you, when you walk down the street, will think of me when I walk by that poor homeless individual who's screaming at who knows what um, in, their, in their traumatic uh, mental health crisis. Um, these clients have been assaulted, they've been raped on the streets, um, have had numerous hospitalizations, five to 10 or 15, um, before committing a crime and becoming, um, and then actually through the forensic system, ending up being successful. Um, I want to ask you to have a favorable um, look at this bill, and I really appreciate the time that you've taken. Thank you very much. Senator Lamb. Chair, and thank you to the to the panel and sponsor. Um, so, you know, as, as a basis, you know, I, I strongly agree we need more mental health supports for uh, folks in our community, particularly those in need of additional care. Um, and um, appreciate some of the earlier outreach. I know Mr. Gray, you know, we'd had a chance to meet earlier too. Um, this is a bill that seemingly we've received more meetings than any other bill, I guess, in, in our office here. And you know, I, I, I looked at some of the testimony here and, and noted that the um, Secretary of Health, 
you know, while not supportive, had said that they are open to meeting uh, during the interim to see if something could be worked out in regards to setting up a program like this. Given that we have a new secretary now that's um, working at the department and maybe more open to this, I'm, I'm curious to hear why we can't, you know, work on this in the interim and, and um, come back if needed to um, this committee. Well, I'll start. Um, as soon as I saw the testimony, I called the department and I've had a few conversations with them already. Um, like many others, there was a lot of misunderstanding about the program. I don't think they realized the extent to which it's been studied already. Um, we are having conversations with them to now. Uh, ongoing. I would say, even though we just received the letter yesterday, it's probably fair to say that they would write the letter differently today. Um, we've studied this before. Other states have studied it. You know, the program's been in, in existence for five years. That's a significant amount of time. We have data from 31 states. I don't know what's left to study other than repeating what we know already. So you mentioned 31 states, and I think earlier when we met with Mr. Gray, we had the opportunity to, to try to understand what other what all these other states have been doing. And, and I think part of the the what what gives me some pause is that yes, there have been a lot of states that have um, push forward with these provisions, but I'm not sure that all the states have fully implemented these types of programs or have implemented them well. And when we asked if there were, if, if there could be a list of states that were provided that have actually fully implemented a robust AOT type program, we couldn't get a number back. And so while, you know, I think all the proponents have said that it's in 41 states, there's, you know, many states that have implemented or these provisions, I'm not sure how many have actually started these types of programs and actually support and funded them well. Well, there's a reason for that. Um, 47 states allow it. Of the 47 that allow it, 31 have at least one jurisdiction that has implemented it. Now, only two states mandate it statewide. Our legislation does not mandate it statewide. It's enabling. So if a jurisdiction, and that could be a city, it could be a county, wants to participate, they can. But um, the reason you're not going to get statewide uh, data is because only two states have mandated it at a statewide level. So I, th I think that brings up an important point, which is the, the my sense is that the only reason two states have fully implemented it statewide is that to do this right, it can be very, very expensive. And I understand that this bill is enabling to allow the counties to do this. And what gives me some heartburn is that the counties that decide to enable this locally may not have the means or wherewithal mm -hmm. to actually set this up properly and well. And there are no, there are no funds attached with the bill. Well, I would respectfully disagree. It's not about the finance because actually this program stay, saves money in um, the criminal justice system, in hospitalizations, plus there are SAMHSA grants. So um, by enabling a county to decide whether to implement it or not, it's less restrictive a state that mandates that everyone must participate is actually much more restrictive. So I, don't, I don't disagree that in the end it can save money. I think my concern is that it requires some upfront cost to be able to start up and do well. And I'm not sure the local counties that may move into this have that. And there's no funding attached to the bill, I guess. And that's why we're recommending we go ahead this year while there's SAMHSA funding available. That's a significant investment that we could have that if we do another study, we won't be able to implement for another four years without SAMHSA funding. Last question then, and that is, this zeroes in on the funding a little bit more. I was looking through the testimony and there's, um, I think, testimony supported from New York City's Behavioral Health Agency 
which cites that there's no rigorous studies that show the involuntary nature of AOT, you know, is what makes this whole thing actually work. And it appears that um, AOT is more related to the investment and intensity of services being offered at the local level. Obviously, there are no funds attached to this bill. How can we be sure that counties are actually going to be implementing this um, and, and actually fully funding the AOT programs beyond what may be available for SAMHSA? Because that's you know, a time-limited grant. Well, I know for sure one county that's ready to go, that's Frederick County, because that's what started this. Uh, two years ago, the senior person in our public health division uh, in the department uh, for behavioral and mental health was looking at OCC. And because of the limitations, she felt that that needed a lot of restructuring. And she discovered AOT. Her testimony, as well as uh, an endorsement by the county executive, should be in your backup. So I know Frederick is ready to go. Would you be open to making this just a, a local bill? We did that last year. It was a local bill for Frederick County only last year. Uh, we worked with a variety of stakeholders. And when I was on the other side of the street, Chair Pina Melnick recommended we go statewide with this. But, you know, a, a compromise would be a test but you'd have to have um, different populations, different areas of the state, and they'd have to want to because we're not recommending mandating it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Thank you. Senator Beidel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for, for bringing this bill, Senator. Um, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a behavioral um, therapist, but I want to thank Ms. Bennett for sharing the story of her son because these are the stories that I hear repeatedly. Um, you know, young people, a lot of times young people that that want help and they just keep falling off their medication and reoccurring and in our hospitals. And I had someone sleeping on the front porch of my office that had been in the emergency room 145 times that year. So we need to do something different than we're doing. And I, I appreciate you bringing the bill. And again, Ms. Bennett, thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Senator Guile. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to follow up on uh, Senator Lamb's line of questioning regarding the counties, I do see that there's a letter of support here from MACO. Um, have you um, spoken, and I don't see any um, commentary or reference at all in, in MACO's letter of support um, regarding the funding aspect. Have you spoken with MACO at all about that or about how counties could go about uh, implementing this? Um, not about the funding, but I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Gray because he's familiar with how other states have funded the program. Okay, thank you. Sure. sure. Um, thank you. Uh, so a couple of things. One, uh, advocates for the bill have in the last year uh, reached out to, to MECO. Um, I won't speak for anyone who works in that county. I know there is certainly some interest uh, among stakeholders there, but um, we can continue those conversations for sure. As far as the cost of implementation, there's one, one piece of this bill that's very important, and the senator mentioned it in her opening testimony, and that is that uh, for, before the court could accept the treatment plan and issue the court order for AOT, there have to be a provider identified in the community who is identified, and the provider has agreed that they are able to provide that service. So that's the real funding question, and that, that's not in that's something that's not in a lot of bills around the country. Some states don't have that. It's in this bill uh, because of this exact question of how to fund it, how to make sure that before the judge issues that order for an individual to receive treatment, that a provider is identified. And when they say they're willing to provide it, the provider is not going to do that unless there's a some sort of payment system in place. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions for this panel. So thank you very much for sharing your experiences and your testimony. We are going to call forward the next panel in support of this bill. Sharon Wilkes, Janet Elderman, Lisa Bass Cooper, Carolyn Knight, Sarah Sample, Christina Flowers. Good afternoon. You can get started as soon as you're settled. Good afternoon. I'm Sharon Wilkes. I want to share with you our family's tragedy. 
This young woman is my younger daughter. She graduated honors from BCC. She got into all her colleges, even had merit scholarship offers. Within a few years though, she had a massive break and subsequently has been involuntary. We've had 25 hospitalizations. Beyond that, she's had another 20 or 30 that she just had a revolving door in and out of the emergency room. And 16 of those were involuntary. However, because she gets extremely aggressive during her episodes, She's had incidents with the criminal justice. She was in Clarksburg prison for three weeks and then sent to Spring Grove Hospital. She was in Spring Grove for nine months. However, when she came out, we were really grateful that she seemed to be our daughter again and part of our loving family. However, she was transferred over to a wonderful program, Montgomery uh, County, Cornerstone. And unfortunately, an inexperienced nurse practitioner took her off her antipsychotic. She tumbled into psychosis and within now, she has been in this state for three years. She is delusional, she is psychotic, she's been in and out of hospitals never with a, any sort of plan. It's a four or five day stay, no real diagnosis and treatment, although she is schizoaffective disorder and obviously she needs to be on an antipsychotic. Sadly, when this all happened at Cornerstone, had we had AOT, her attending doctor could have interjected and gotten her an order because had that happened, she could have stayed there and we would be in a very different place. I beg you to please don't put any other families through what we've had to suffer. It's inhumane. Taking a bright mind and seeing it deteriorate is the worst heartbreak anyone can see. We've moved her to New York because they have AOT there. Thank you. This is her now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Minister Christina Flowers, and I'm here to represent on both sides of the families and as a homeless advocate that specialize in encampments and individuals that are residing outside. Um, when I think about the family's participation in this, it really uh, moves my heart in an amazing way when we are so used to dealing with our homeless individuals that don't have a lot of family engagement. And it's not a lot of accountability from certain service providers. And when you see your homeless individuals go through the trauma and the severity of their mental illness, not being medicated, not being properly engaged by service providers, where the money is never a question when they're providing certain services, but they're not making sure that these individuals are stabilized. They are making not making sure that um, they are being uh, navigated through different areas of their treatments and disability. So again, you know, um, residing in Baltimore City, where we had a memorial of over 200 homeless individuals that passed on the streets. Um, and I like to think that is due to a lot of disengagement, a lot of ignoring the fact that they do become a harm and a danger to themselves once they left in this condition and this mindset for so long. So in closing again, um, my heart goes out to the families here because a lot of homeless individuals on the streets don't have families representing them and speaking on their behalf to save their lives. And they do come accustomed to being not medicated, nor monitored or stabilized. So um, I pray that this can really change the dynamics, not only in our city, but Baltimore County, when it comes to engaging them with the services that they need. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name's Janet Edelman and I live in Columbia. I will be addressing objections to AOT that have not already been covered 
uh, previously today. Uh, some people with severe mental illness reject all voluntary services because they have anosognosia, the inability to recognize their own illness. That is why expanded voluntary community services are not an alternative to AOT. It's also why the Baltimore outpatient civil commitment pilot is not serving the sickest individuals and cannot substitute for AOT. Opponents claim that scarce mental health services should go to those who voluntarily agree with them to them. But standard medical triage practice requires that those most at risk of severe outcomes be given priority. Opponents claim that AOT may be applied to people inappropriately. To address this concern, this year's bill has more specific criteria than last year's bill. Opponents ignore research studies showing that AOT can be successfully implemented using existing services and without additional funding. And Senator Lamb, I hope you take a look at what happened in New York because they have done a lot of that. It's been implemented there for, I believe, 20 years. In 1999, Maryland said no for the first time on this issue. I have been testifying on this issue on and off for years, and I see tragedy after tragedy, family after family come here and tell the same story. Uh, AOT addresses an unmet need in Maryland. Arguments against AOT are filled with inaccuracies. Please pass Senate Bill 480. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to the chair and thank you to members of the committee for having me today. My name is Sarah Sample and I am here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties. Um, and so what I would like to really speak to mostly since we've heard a lot from some very valuable um, testimony today is what's going on in our local um, correctional facilities when it comes to individuals that inadvertently um, get diverted into that system. So when an individual with a severe mental illness ends up in a local correctional facility, there's typically a mental health assessment that is done and then a court ordered uh, transfer to a state psychiatric facility uh, within 10 days. For about the eight months that I've been privy to the information, the state facilities have had a backlog. There's been a wait list. It's anywhere from 130 to 160 people when I go ahead and look at it. And so this takes that wait time from 10 days to in some instances, a month to two months. And so an individual who has severe mental illness in a correctional facility for 30 to 60 days, that really is going to serve to exacerbate their symptoms and make the situation significantly worse and unsafe for them. I would also say for the staff at the correctional facilities and the wardens and the correctional officers, they do their best to, to serve these individuals' need, but ultimately they're not intended to be able to provide these types of services or the appropriate housing for these individuals. So, and keeping individuals in those positions right now with workforce shortages is already hard enough um, than adding this additional stress on them. And it, it does a disservice to the uh, patient, what the should be patient rather than inmate, and does a disservice to the staff that are working in those facilities. So counties would certainly appreciate this ability to put resources into um, programs that could help divert uh, these individuals away from hospital facilities and away from our uh, correctional facilities so that those resources can be used for their intended purposes and so that these individuals can get the care that they need and deserve. So for those reasons, uh, Maryland Associ Association of Counties would support this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for sharing your stories and personal experiences with the committee. Um, I don't see any questions. Oh, Senator Hayes, sorry about that. It's behind thank, your laptop. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just as a point of personal privilege, not a question, but I did want to acknowledge and thank Christina Flowers, who is an awesome um, advocate in the Baltimore City area, advocating on behalf of homeless um, individuals and the most vulnerable among us. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Senator. Thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon. We have uh, Laura Carey and Evelyn Burton. Who goes first? Me? 
Hi, I apologize. I've never been speaking in front of a bunch of people before. I apologize. Um, my name is Laura Shears Carey. Um, I'm here just to say that I have a son that's been in the hospital for 63 days now. He is has high cases and schizophrenia. Um, I had to give up my job of 16 and a half years so I could stay home with him, take care of him. Um, we have to keep our curtains closed all the time because he's always telling me people are looking in the house. He's always scared of everything. Um, he won't go out in public with me. I'm having a hard time getting him out of the house. I just would hope that, like I said, he's in the hospital now. I'm trying to get him help. He he does have medicine he's supposed to be taking, but I cannot get him to take it. And he, he has been in the hospital several times. This is two months ago. He was in the hospital for 60 days. And he's just continually going in the hospital. I'm trying my best to give him his medicine and I can't, you know, I can't get the help I need. So I'm hoping that this bill will get, help me get some kind of help. I don't want to see him. He's a good person. And I just, it's hard to see him disintegrate. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Evelyn Burton. I'm the Volunteer Advocacy Chair for Schizophrenia and Psychosis Action Alliance. And I also have a, a relative with schizophrenia. And I won't go through all the details, but very similar to the other families, 12 psychotic after hospitalizations, 18 ER visits, three crisis center visits in one year. Total cost $509,000 for the year. That's just for the hospitals and the ERs. And what, the, what most people don't talk about, although <laughs> thankfully this other lady did, was the suffering. I mean, he would be absolutely terrified when he would see a policeman because he knew they were really a praying mantis that could eat him alive. And I can't describe the suffering when he would call and say he wanted to kill himself. And he almost got arrested and ended up in jail, like so many of the other families I work with. So I sent him to Arizona, which has AOT, a very active program. He was fairly quickly put under AOT because he was still going in and out of the hospitals. And since he got that AOT order in front of the judge, he has taken his injectable medication every two weeks with no complaints, which he wouldn't do before. He sees his doctor every two weeks, which he wouldn't see before. He thinks his case manager is his best friend. They're going to enroll him in a vocational program next week. And he pleads with me every week to come home to Maryland for his friends and family, but I can't risk bringing him home here if there's no AOT and have him suffer again. And I would refer you to the testimonies of Ed Kelly and Susan Vanelli, who last year buried their family members after multiple, multiple hospitalizations and couldn't get help for them. And you can save others. I just wanna add one super real quick thing to answer Senator Lamb. There are plenty of studies and I will be glad to give them to you of many jurisdictions starting AOT programs with absolutely no additional funds and having successful savings of 30 to 40%. So it can be done. And I'll be glad to provide that for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for these witnesses? Thank you both. I know this is difficult. So we appreciate your participating in our process and sharing your testimony. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right, our next panel, Adrian Bridenstine, Melinda Morgan, Dan Martin, Jane Clapp Clappinger, Carol McCabe, and Svetlana Shargoraskada. Yeah, sorry, messed that one up pretty bad. So please correct me when you come up. Uh, these witnesses are signed up in opposition to the bill. Um, good afternoon. You can get started when you're ready. Uh, Madam Chair, member of the committee, Dan Martin here from Mental Health Association of Maryland in opposition to Senate Bill 480. And I just want to say it at, at the start, it's not for a lack of empathy for anything that these families behind me have been talking about. Um, we feel you know, strongly, and I, I feel strongly for for them, uh, we just don't agree that this is the right approach uh, to, to address the issues that they're facing. And many states, including Maryland, allow for some form of mandatory community treatment that actually comes in three categories. Uh, a person meets the inpatient commitment criteria, 
but they're allowed to participate in mandatory community treatment in lieu of inpatient commitment. They meet the inpatient criteria and they've been committed, but they're granted conditional release if they adhere to mandatory community treatment. Or there's a preventive model, which is what this is, where a person who has never met and doesn't currently meet the inpatient criteria is court ordered in treatment anyway. And while you've heard that Maryland is out of touch because we don't have AOT, the truth is less than half of the states allow this incredibly coercive model. And of those, even fewer actually use it for a number of reasons. It reduces the availability of voluntary community treatment, um, forcing people that don't want care ahead of those who do. Regardless of what you heard, there are very serious racial uh, disparities in implementation. There's no way to test for anosognosia or lack of insight. So there's no way to target that population for treatment. And multiple systematic reviews show that AOT is not nearly as effective as its proponents claim that it is. And I could go into greater detail, but you have my written testimony and I only have a few minutes left. So I'll just hit some big concerns about the bill specifically. Um, it allows a petition for AOT to be made by any individual who has a legitimate interest in the person's welfare, but there's no way of determining how that how, how will that be determined. Um, there, it allows a psychiatrist to affirm the individual meets the criteria for AOT without ever having seen the person. Even if the individual has executed a mental health advance directive outlining their treatment wishes, those directions don't need to be followed if the psychiatrist considers them contrary to their best interests. I mean, we're always encouraging the use of advanced directives. Senator Bidel, you have a, a bill this session to expand access to those, um, those tools, but why would people fill them out if a psychiatrist can just overrule the choices that they make? And lastly, I'll just say that the annual reporting requirements back to the legislature don't require any reporting on whether AOT participants are getting better, whether their symptoms are improving, what their experience and satisfaction level is, et cetera. And so for all those reasons, um, we'd urge an unfavorable report. Good afternoon, members of the committee. I'm Adrian Bridenstein, the Vice President of Policy and Communications at Behavior Health System Baltimore. Um, for those who aren't familiar with us, Behavioral Health System Baltimore is a nonprofit and serves as a local behavior health authority in Baltimore City. We are also the entity that's responsible for overseeing and implementing the outpatient civil commitment pilot program that you've already heard a lot about uh, this afternoon. I do want to thank the committee for their past support and helping to set up OCC. We did set that up through statute several years ago with this committee's support. Um, so quickly, what the outpatient civil commitment uh, Outpatient Civil Commitment Pilot Program is, it is it is Maryland's approach to involuntary commitment to AOT. This is the approach that our state has been using for the past five years, and we are getting results. It's unique in that it commits the system to the person, whereas other AOT programs commit the courts to the person or use that black robe effect that you've heard about. What our program does is preserves the client choice and relies heavily on peers with lived experience with mental illness to help engage people into services, oftentimes early on before they've even um, decided if they're co or coming in the program voluntarily or involuntarily. The peers are the first uh, point of engagement and they've been very effective. Um, the participation in the program is six months. Uh, peers, as I said, they start and they follow the person through the program, not the courts, which is another significant difference in how we've set up our program here in Maryland. Um, if a person experiences challenges adhering to their treatment plan, then the peers just step up their engagement. They take that never give up approach. And it shows that it's working, um, that there is no need for this black robe effect. As is the experience with many other states who have set up AOT, the caseloads are small at the start, and that is what we've experienced with outpatient civil commitment. However, 80% of people serve are connected to behavioral health services and stay connected at the point of discharge. So it's BHSB's position that this is Maryland's approach, and this is the program we should be looking to expand statewide, and we would urge an unfavorable report and that you work with us on OCC. Thank you. Hello, Svetlana Shagorotska, unfavorable. What is it like to be given pills that make you forget your own name or make your fingers so stiff that you can't type, can't dial a phone, can't open a bag of chips or make you slur your words so you can't communicate intelligibly or make your ears ring or your vision blur, impairing your ability to perceive your surroundings or make your skin feel like it's being burned with battery acid or set on fire? What is it like to have no choice about whether to continue to take such pills. Anyone hearing this may experience psychosis someday, even if you never have before, in rare reactions to antibiotics, antidepressants, cough syrup, recovery from surgery, and even to COVID. The civil rights to bodily autonomy at stake today 
may someday well be your own rights. You have heard stories today from family members of psychotic people who ask you to provide the legal tool of AOT so they can force their loved ones into taking pills. I have heard the other side on Zoom meetings about psychopharmacology research, why such meetings were hijacked by family members who went off topic to plead for legal help to free their loved ones from AOT orders that were already in place. These family members saw their loved ones experience horrendous uh, side effects from antipsychotics. Um, these effects were incapacitating, leading to both mental and physical deterioration and putting their loved ones on a path to an early death. They were literally crying, begging for help in their struggle against the judges and psychiatrists who imposed the AOT orders. They clearly did not feel that the involvement of the legal system in their loved one's treatment was beneficial. I can only imagine the far greater suffering of their actual loved ones, the AOT recipients themselves, incapacitated, deteriorating, and dying due to side effects. Uh, there's an old proverb in German and Arabic, don't ask the doctor, ask the patient. Thank you. Thank you, committee members, for your time. My name is Mindy Morgan, and I am here to state my position in opposition to Senate Bill 480. I'm a mother of three, a member of my local church, a taxpayer, a clinical social worker, the clinical director for a substance use treatment program. I have a master's degree in social work and have worked with those with severe mental health issues for over 20 years. I am 43 years old, and I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder at age 21. I've been in the hospital for bipolar three times and have taken more medications than I can count. I spent over a decade of my young life afraid and, un and ashamed and not seeking treatment. The people I trusted helped me see that I had an illness and needed treatment. People, including those with severe and persistent mental illness, developed the trust and openness to seek help through trust, not court orders, even those so-called gentle court orders. Providers are not the magic bullet, inpatient or outpatient. In my third hospital stay, I was held against my will. I wanted to leave a dangerous environment and I was not assessed at risk for harm, but I was locked in anyway. As a result, I have told myself that I will never again seek help at a hospital. This forced treatment was harmful. Am I less entitled to my constitutional rights because of my bipolar diagnosis or any of those with mental illness? Are we proposing this for people with diabetes or with heart disease who are struggling and dying because they don't treat their illnesses? Most importantly, people are not engaging with care fully because the treatment systems are broken. Many people cannot afford care because of no insurance or poor coverage. It takes months to get into a program or obtain a provider in some counties. There are few or no options if you have a poor quality provider. High quality providers are poorly paid, overburdened with demand and paperwork, and struggling with burnout. Providers on all levels, social workers, psychiatrists, direct care staff, are very hard to find. As a taxpayer, I don't see this bill as a solution for people facing a broken system. It is cementing the concept that those suffering are the actual problem, and this couldn't be further from the truth. Thank you for your time. My name is Carol McCabe, and I'm the chief of the mental health division of the public defender's office. The preamble of this bill indicates that the bill is intended to apply to a small subset of individuals with severe mental illness, but that is not how this bill was drafted. Over the past four years, the Mental Health Division has represented clients in over 30,000 involuntary inpatient commitment cases. And as we sit here today, many thousands, thousands of those clients already meet almost all of the criteria for forced outpatient treatment under this bill. There are also problems with the language in the bill. Many important terms are not defined or are vague. Mental illness is not defined for purposes of forced outpatient treatment. Mental illness for involuntary inpatient commitment is defined in a way that specifically excludes a primary diagnosis of substance abuse. What is the definition under this bill? One of the eligibility criteria includes hospitalizations within a 48-month period. Hospitalization is not defined. Does it include voluntary hospitalization? If so, aren't people being penalized for seeking voluntary treatment? Does it include involuntary inpatient hospitalizations if patients are discharged or released by a judge because they aren't eligible for involuntary treatment? 
Another criteria includes language that the individual is unlikely to adequately adhere to treatment as demonstrated by recent history. What is adequately adhere? If someone takes 50% of their medication or attends 50% of their treatment appointments, is that adequate? What is the recent history of treatment? Is recent one month? Is it three months? Is it six months? It's not defined. The bill allows that uncooperative individuals be taken into custody and taken to an appropriate facility for a psychiatric exam. Facility is not defined. Is it a jail? Is it an emergency department? Uh, several provisions of the bill are unconstitutional. They're discussed further in our written testimony, but there are serious constitutional violations in a number of these provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, and committee members for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jane Plappinger, and I've worked in the public mental health field for 40 years. Most relevant to my testimony today is my experience as Manhattan's Commissioner for Mental Health, where I witnessed firsthand the, implementa the implementation of New York's AOT program. Based on that experience, I oppose Senate Bill 480. I will focus my testimony on the question of whether this bill is likely to achieve its very important aims and whether it is a prudent use of public dollars. I'd like to make two points. One, this bill focuses on access to treatment, yet people with serious mental illness need much more than treatment to prevent crises, hospitalizations, involvement with the criminal justice system and the kind of suffering we heard from families today. The very outcomes this bill aims to address when New York appropriated $32 million to establish its AOT program, and that was an annual appropriation, it at the same time appropriated an additional $125 million to expand services such as intensive case management, assertive community treatment programs, and housing programs. So I ask, is Maryland prepared to make a similar commitment to expand not just treatment, but the other critically needed services this population needs to stop the kind of cycling that we've, we're all concerned about? My second point, there is no consensus as to the effectiveness of the court order in and of itself. We've heard that some studies show good, better outcomes with AOT treatment, but that includes a court order, it includes better access to treatment and these other services. I have not seen a study that shows value to the court order. Um, my written testimony cites several studies which were randomized controlled uh, trials which show no effect. A more pragmatic strategy would be to fund a program that holds the system accountable. I'd be happy to answer your questions. For all these reasons, I support an unfavorable report on this bill. Thank you all for your testimony. Senator Guile. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess there's a question for Ms. McCabe. You mentioned uh, some constitutional issues with um, this bill. Um, we heard from the bill sponsor that there are 47 other states that have AOT. And I'm wondering, have there been um, successful constitutional challenges of AOT in those states um, such that perhaps like the, that state's highest court determined that that AOT um, act or was unconstitutional? Uh, I believe there have been states where it has been found unconstitutional. And I can... Can you bring the microphone over to you so we can I'm hear sorry. you a bit better? I believe there are states where it has been challenged. And I believe that there are some states where there have been um, um, appeals relating to constitutional issues that have been, I believe they've been successful. And I can try and get some of that research to you. Um, if, if yeah, sure. I mean, if you're suggesting that, I mean, it's 47 states having it is, you know, pretty compelling to me. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're suggesting that there's a constitutional issue, I'd be curious to know whether or not there have actually been successful. I realize that I'm sure that there have been challenges to the constitutionality of it, but I'm wondering if there have been successful constitutional challenges to it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one question to follow up on uh, Ms. Clevenger, I guess, from um, New York and from their program that they had started up there. It sounds like it, it can be very expensive to do this well, right? There have been folks that have cited uh, the New York example as something that has been implemented, implemented well, has really helped patients. 
And, you know, I'm very sympathetic to seeing how we can make this work and support these folks as well. But, you know, what New York saw was the necessity for a whole series of wraparound programs and services that came with this uh, program as well, right? And, and I guess your concern from your experience up there is that without those services coming into play, without the adequate support, that this standing on its own could, could fall short. Exactly. And I'll give you a really, sorry, I'll give you a really good example. Um, New York's AOT program um, was created in response to an incident where a man with schizophrenia named Andrew Goldstein pushed a woman named Kendra Webdale in front of a subway train to her death. And Andrew Goldstein um, had been discharged from the psychiatric center in Queens to a halfway house. He was doing great. He was on the medication he needed. He got the supervision to remind him to take it. And then because he was doing so great and they needed room in the halfway house for other discharged clients, he was discharged from this halfway house and there was no supported housing available for him. It was very much lacking in New York as it is here in Maryland. And I know this because I was the Baltimore Mental Health Systems um, CEO um, after I left New York. So I know Baltimore City's lack of supported housing very well. So what happened is he got a room in the basement of an elderly woman's home, all he needed was supervision. All he needed was a reminder. He had gotten the treatment, but he needed the support to remember to take his medication. Um, he didn't get it. He became psychotic. He was frightened. He heard voices and he committed this crime. And the irony, and many of us in New York were very aware of this irony, is Andrew Goldstein would not have been eligible for the AOT program in New York because he never refused treatment. He lost access to the supervision that he needed to take his treatment. And that's why I state in my testimony that treatment alone, getting someone into the hospital alone is not what it takes. It's the support in the community that includes supportive housing, supervision, something to do during the day like clubhouses and this intensive case management and act. Well, everybody who is an AOT in New York had that intensive case management. And a lot of money was put into developing an infrastructure to oversee this program. Uh, these AOT teams had to report to us, to the city people, on every single client who was referred, what percentage they, they connected with, how many people got orders. And then if people agreed with their treatment plan, they still got entered into the program. We used to call it AOT light. Those were the people who were getting the same intensive case management and access to all these services they need needed to live stably in the community. So that's why I would think a better approach, a more prudent approach for Maryland is to make sure those services are out there that people need, like the intensive case management, the ACT teams, which will provide um, mobile treatment, the supported housing, and uh, those kinds of services in addition to the treatment, because that's the formula. That's the recipe that will support someone with serious and persistent mental illness. Um, the court order is very expensive. And I am not convinced that um, that is a good way to go. If providers and the system is broken, if providers had the support and the funds and were held accountable to not lose track of their patients and not wait for their patients to walk in the door, but had the resources to monitor their patients and go out into the community when a patient doesn't show up. I think provider accountability and enhanced services of, of all types that these individuals need is really the answer. And that's what Maryland should invest its money in. And then we'll see if that's adequate or not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any additional questions for this panel. So thank you all very much for your testimony and for sharing in our process. We're gonna call forward Emma Holcomb and Katie Rouse. Also signed up in opposition to the bill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sure. 
Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and this, um, the entire committee. My name is Emma Holcomb. I am with Disability Rights Maryland. Disability Rights Maryland is Maryland's designated protection and advocacy agency, federally mandated to defend and advance the civil rights of individuals with disabilities. We have several concerns with this bill. First, to address some of the constitutional issues. Um, the only standard for involuntary commitment found constitutional by the Supreme Court requires a risk of imminent significant physical danger to oneself or to others. Um, the standard in this bill, which is the potential for relapse or deterioration that would make it likely for an individual to be a danger to themselves or others does not constitute an imminent risk. We are also concerned about provisions of this bill that constitute an unreasonable search and seizure in violation of the Fourth Amendment. We have heard that those provisions might be um, changed that would allow an individual to be detained by law enforcement and forced to um, submit to a psychological examination. However, as it stands, we are concerned that um, that would be an unreasonable search and seizure that respondents could be detained for up to a day, 24 hours without any current showing of dangerousness or any of the other requirements for an emergency evaluation under current law. As that provision stands, we are also concerned that such detentions would place individuals, would place people with um, psychiatric disabilities in contact with the police, which can be very dangerous. Individuals with mental illnesses face higher rates of excessive force and violence from police um, and even deadly force from the police contacts. So we're very concerned about that provision. We're also concerned um, that this bill doesn't provide for individuals to participate effectively in their own treatment plans. It doesn't provide for a meaningful way to contribute to their treatment plans. It only offers medication as a treatment option. And as we've heard, medication can in fact be, um, it, psychiatric medications can have long lasting and permanent side effects. Um, there's also um, the right of individual, individuals to be free from forced administration of psychiatric medication. We're also, very concerned about the lack of intensive services that this bill doesn't provide that would be necessary for it to achieve its goals. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you so much, Madam Chair, Vice Chair and Committee members. I'm Katie Rouse and I'm with Honor and of Maryland. We coordinate a statewide network of community peer support organizations that serve many people living with serious mental illness. We strongly oppose Senate Bill 480 as an unnecessary and harmful expansion of premature involuntary commitment. Our written testimony details many of our particular concerns about the terms of the bill, but I'll highlight just our three major critiques. First, AOT programs disregard the core elements of effective recovery support and the legitimate reasons that consumers have for being labeled non-compliant or disengaged. Setting aside obvious barriers of stigma, insurance, and the well-documented service shortages, we need to remember that for many people living with serious mental illness, the lifelong experience of healthcare feels like a series of punishments, being disrespected, disbelieved, and stigmatized, being hauled away like a criminal for an emerg emergency psych evaluation being stripped and locked in a hospital ward, being secluded, restrained, and forced medicated. And the stories that you hear in our written testimony and from some that you've heard today are from people who were seeking help. Second, the proposed program's overly broad eligibility criteria, the lack of reliable safeguards for patient rights, and the circular logic that really runs throughout this bill means that many people will become trapped in a cycle of legal entanglement and hospitalization, which are the very things that AOT purports to avoid. Because if you are not compliant while you're under an AOT order, where do you go? All of it leads to being hospitalized again. Third, research on AOT programs do not show consistent outcome of the target objectives, no better than just adequately providing affordable, equality, high accessible services in the community. Involuntary treatment is not recovery. A court order doesn't make your life simpler. And forcing treatment breaks down relationships and trust within the service system. It should only be used in cases of significant and verified safety risk, which is not the case with this premature AOT program that's been proposed. But please also consider that two BHA working groups on our current, current civil commitment standards have noted how misunderstanding and inconsistent implementation is already an ongoing issue, and this AOT program is far, far more complicated. So for all these reasons and those in our written testimony, we do urge an unfavorable report. But on, on behalf of our peer community, I just wanna thank you for listening. Thank you both very much for your testimony. I see no questions from the committee, so we thank you. Uh, colleagues, my apologies. I understand I missed one witness before we move to our virtual witnesses. So if Laura Shears Coates is here, you can come forward. Thank you both very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Shears Coates, and I'm wearing many hats today. I own a 
outpatient mental health clinic in Baltimore County called Takes a Village for Change. I also own a 501c organization called It Takes a Village for Change. Um, my 501c provides financial support to loved ones who have lost a loved one due to mental illness. Um, but more importantly, I'm sitting here as the legal guardian of my brother, who's 31 years old, who suffers from schizophrenia and psychosis. Um, my mother has testified before you today. Um, my brother's been in the hospital stuck in a psychosis state for the last 63 days. They cannot transfer him to another facility because he's too dangerous. He has 24 hours um, security at all times. And me and my mother are not allowed to visit or see my brother because of the danger he is to us as well. Um, Adult Protective Services is involved. We have the Anne Arundel County MIC team involved. We have the CIT team involved. In fact, we're so well versed with the EMT. They've been at my mother's house 2,183 times in the past three years. And my brother's medical bills with Medicaid has exceeded $3 million in 2021, at which time we stopped calculating after we could no longer hire our family lawyer because we went in front of the circuit court so many times and got Judge Elsie's order to put my brother into a facility only for the Behavioral Health Administration to tell us that my brother's too dangerous to be placed with others and he cannot go into a facility with other people. So what do they do? They send him back home to my mom. For my mom to call locked in bathrooms, scared of her own son, not knowing if her son's capable of killing her. Every time I get a call from the EMT, I don't know if it's going to be a call to tell me my mother's dead. I don't know if it's going to be a call to tell me that they had to shoot my brother. I don't know what's going to happen. My brother has several medical conditions now because of his ongoing psychosis and now a lot of medications he's not reactive to. He's being treated for early Parkinson's at 31 years old because he has tremors that don't stop due to all the mental health medications that he's been on over and over again. Um, my brother is very, very sick. At times he doesn't even know who we are. He suffers from delirium where he feels things on his body. Again, my mom stated to you guys that he self-isolates from the world. We can't even get him to go into a grocery store if we wanted to. AOT is the only hope for our family. Please help us. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your story. I'm sorry that you're having that experience and uh, we appreciate you participating in the process. Sorry, I missed you earlier. Thank you. Thank you. All right, colleagues, we're gonna turn to our virtual witnesses starting with Mary Mor Morin. Good afternoon. Morin Moran, sorry. <laughs> Can you hear us? Do you want to connect with your audio? If you can click accept on your audio prompt, that might take care of it. Looks like we got, yeah, if you can unmute now, it looks like we have you. No, I think she, can you unmute her? Can we come back to, okay, we're going to go to another witness and then come back to you. If you can unmute, we'll try you again in a few minutes. This should be Eric Smith. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Smith and assisted outpatient treatment AOT saved my life. Shortly before entering into AOT, I wouldn't eat anything other than butter because voices in my head told me everything else was poison. I was also convinced I was an asset with the FBI. At that time, I did not voluntarily seek out nor remain engaged in any type of treatment for severe mental illness because of anosognosia, a brain-based impairment common for people like me. It stole my ability to understand I was ill. When I was psychotic, I told numerous treatment providers and my family to leave me alone and that I didn't want treatment. The AOT team understood my voiced opposition to treatment was not the real me talking. It was me being held hostage by my own mind, not a personal choice. My life was saved by an AOT judge and treatment team that recognized I needed rescuing from my illness. And the only way that was going to happen based on my history and presenting symptoms was by immediately stepping me down into AOT as soon as I no longer met criteria to remain a psychiatric inpatient. Without AOT, I would have continued on my path of not seeking out or trusting treatment providers. Without the black robe effect as an AOT as step-down care from my psych hospitalization, I would have stopped taking the medication I need to no longer be a danger to myself. I support disability and civil rights groups. Some people from these groups oppose AOT and they are good people operating on misconceptions or misplaced fear. The truth is simple. Anosognosia 
robbed me of the ability to be free and live life for many years. AOT restored my ability to be free and live life and can do so for others. Despite being a high school dropout and jailed because of my illness, thanks to AOT, I graduated magna cum laude with a BA in psychology and went on to earn a master's degree. Opposition to AOT you're hearing from today have never been a client in AOT. And based on misunderstanding, they worry it's forced treatment. I have been a client in AOT and I needed it. There was and is no forced treatment in AOT. Please support SB 480 and thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions. So thank you very much for your testimony. Um, are we gonna try? Okay, we're going to Bradley Tarr. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you see me and can you hear me? We can see you and hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Bradley Entar. I am currently 30 years old of age. From the ages of 11 to 26, I was in and out of the hospital system in Akron and in the Mansfield area and in the New Hampshire area at college well over 20 times. Assisted outpatient treatment gave me the longest period over four years now of stability mentally, physically, with physical safety, emotionally and even financially that I've experienced in my entire life. I was given a guardian at litem that helped me be forgiven for my student, all my student loan debts. I was given a psychiatrist who was current, is still current and was, has been steady with me for four years where other psychiatrists would hand me off to, uh, to even further psychiatrists, all of whom showed very little care for me within eight to nine months of treatment. I've been given a case manager that meets with me once every two weeks, even though I've been graduated for two and a half years. And he helps me go anywhere in the county that I need to go. AOT has not only given me stability, but it has helped me better understand my schizoaffective disorder and has helped me not suffer from giving into delusions of grandeur or delusions of psychosis at all for the past four years. I'm a big believer in AOT because AOT works. The proof is in the pudding. Anybody who has actually been through AOT and has given it a fair shake will tell you that it has helped them not only be better in their personal lives, but in their work lives and in their family lives as well. AOT works because it is holistic and it relies on personalism, dignity, integrity, and because it gives you a team that truly cares for you as an individual and makes every part of your life better, easier, and not only, and gives you a better quality of life. Thank you for your time, and I am open for any questions. Thank you for your testimony and for sharing your experiences with us. I don't see any questions from the committee, so we're going to go back to Ms. Moran and see if we can get you connected this time. Thank you. Am I unmuted? You're okay now. We can hear you. Great. <clears throat> well, first, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify. As an individual with bipolar disorder, I am pleased to support Senate Bill 480. The bill would ensure that I receive treatment in the least restrictive setting and then, then I stop taking medication as required and begin relapsing. The bill also ensures a treatment plan that is comprehensive and considers all aspects of living successfully in the community. The bill also allows for an emergency evaluation of whether I need involuntary admission to a hospital. All aspects of what is in my best interest are covered by this bill and it ensures that I get the treatment that I need. It is critical that I receive treatment as soon as possible when I need it and am able to make a rational and informed decision to seek it. Therefore, I respectfully request that you give Senate Bill 480 a favorable report. Okay. Thank you for your testimony and your perseverance uh, in getting back to us this afternoon. Have a good afternoon there, no questions. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, our final witness on this bill signed up unfavorable is Lindsay Below. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Lindsay Baylog and I'm a social worker with the Mental Health Division of the Public Defender's Office. I also have a law degree from University of Maryland. And I do wanna thank you all for hearing everyone today. I know your time is limited and there's a lot of us. 
I just want to address a couple issues that have already come up in this hearing. So some of the advocates have argued that nearly every state except Maryland has laws that allow for outpatient civil commitment, and therefore Maryland is somehow out of touch with best practices for keeping our citizens healthy. As Senator Lamb already pointed out, this argument lacks a lot of nuance. While 47 states do have a provision in the legislation that allows for AOT, maybe half of those states actually have active programs. And in the states that do have active programs, it's often limited to just one or two counties within the state. So in reality, the implementation of forced outpatient, outpatient treatment across the country is sporadic at best. And Maryland's current application of civil commitment rules and regulations is actually in keeping with national trends. Second, in states that do have programs like this, there is a significant racial disparity in how forced treatment is applied. You've heard about similar legislation in New York State called Kendra's Law. Since it was passed 20 years ago, 77% of those forced into treatment are Black and Brown individuals. While this may be in part due to access of care issues among minority populations, it's clearly not the whole story. And at OPD, we already see a significant racial disparity among individuals who are committed to hospitals. This legislation will only exacerbate the disparate racial impact among those th subject to civil commitment. Lastly, on the issue of funding, you heard earlier from Michael Gray from the Treatment Advocacy Center that the funding issue is really centered around paying for psychiatrists to provide treatment and psychiatrists won't take on clients who cannot pay or don't have insurance. However, advocates keep stating that this bill will help the homeless who aren't able to help themselves, but individuals who are homeless can't afford a psychiatrist or even transportation to a psychiatrist's office. So again, I ask who is paying for this? Either this bill isn't meant to help the homeless or it's going to cost a lot of money. There are a lot of people in Maryland who are voluntarily seeking psychiatric treatment and can't get it. Let's focus our efforts on those individuals instead. And I urge an unfavorable report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for this witness? Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. That will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 480. Colleagues will now turn to Senate Bill 732 which is the Department of Disabilities, Maryland Commission on Disabilities membership. I believe the secretary is here. Um, Madam Secretary, you can come forward. And we also have Kim McKay signed up on the bill. If you wanna come forward as well, perfect. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. So good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you also, Madam Chair, for putting this bill forward. For the record, my name is Carol Beatty. I'm the Secretary for the Maryland Department of Disabilities. And with me, as was mentioned, is Kim McKay. She is our Department's Director of Communications and Outreach. And I thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of SB 732. It's a bill that would amend the membership of the Maryland Commission on Disabilities to include a member of the brain injury commun community. The Commission on Disabilities advises our department on its duties as a principal unit of state government focused on disability policy and the development of best practices. It is made up of governor appointed representatives from major disability groups, but currently does not have anybody representing the traumatic brain injury community. You should have in your bill file a letter in support of 732 from the department, as well as one from Brian Pugh, who is the executive director of the Brain Injury Association of Maryland. There are more than 605,000 people with brain injury in our state. And currently, the Department of Disabilities interacts and works with this community through the Traumatic Brain Injury, um, Adv Injury Advisory Council, which, of, which we are a member of and help to staff. We also work closely with Maryland Health Department's Behavioral Health Administration, which oversees the Brain Injury Waiver Program in Maryland. However, we feel it is necessary to include someone with a traumatic brain injury to the Commission on Disabilities since an individual with lived experience is best qualified to provide guidance and perspective on their experiences as it relates to policy development, access to services, and programming throughout our state. This bill now also has amendments that moves the statewide 
coordinator for autism strategy and the advisory stakeholder group on autism related needs from the governor's coordinating offices to MDOD. We are in favor of these amendments and that support is also noted in our written testimony. The coordinator and the advisory stakeholder group's work we believe would be best supported and enhanced by the deep subject matter expertise that our policy team can provide. As an active participant in the work of the advisory stakeholder group over the past year, I believe this move will bring vital and to date missing supports to their work. Should this bill as amended pass, I look forward to working in partnership with the staff and the autism stakeholder group to make this transition successful. So I urge the, commission, the committee's approval as SB 732 with these amendments and we're happy to take any questions. I'm just here to provide any uh, answers to questions that the committee might have. Thank you. Okay, hey, are there any questions for the sponsor? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank that you. will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 732. Did we find the senator? That was here? Senator Watson? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, colleagues, we're going to turn next to Senate Bill 628, which is school based health centers, services, infrastructure, and funding. Senator Lamb, we are going to be joined for this hearing by uh, Senator Watson, who's coming over here to his desk, and he's going to represent. Uh, 3E committee. And so we welcome you, Senator Watson, to our committee. And um, Senator Lamb, you can begin when you're ready. I see your witness at the table, so you can proceed. Thank you. Sounds good. And I think we have one person who's uh, uh, on the sponsor panel that's virtual too. Um, so good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, pleased to be here to present Senate Bill 628. Uh, for the record, Clarence Lamb, Senator District 12. Um, I want to be clear from the outset, um, just to level set for uh, members of the committee, school-based health centers are not just the school nurse. And, and I think you'll tell from um, the additional testimony and some information I'll convey why uh, that's an important distinction. So I think folks, when they hear about school-based health centers, think, oh, this is a school nurse. It's much more than that. Um, Maryland school-based health centers have played a critical role in providing a comprehensive range of health care services to children in 95 Maryland schools in 17 counties across the state since 1985. The administration of the state's school-based health center program transitioned from the State Department of Education over to the Maryland Health Department in July of 2022 um, as a result of legislation that the General Assembly passed. The Maryland School-Based Health Center program helps reduce health disparities, increase access to health care services, and promote health equity. However, there's more work that needs to be done to further expand access and availability of these programs and services and to move the state towards at least having one school-based health center in each county. The Blueprint for Maryland's Future passed during the 2020 legislative session to increase state funding for the Maryland School-Based Health Center program from $2.5 million to $9 million annually. This bill does not change that funding, and as you can see from the fiscal note, will have minimal to no fiscal impact at the state or local level. Instead, the purpose of this bill is to make sure that the dollars already allocated to this program are effectively used to best serve children's health in our schools throughout the state. The bill addresses areas of unmet needs um, based on the guidance of the needs assessment that was done and released in December of last year that was actually sponsored by the Maryland Department of Health. Um, and this bill will designate the funding to help reduce the administrative burden of current sites. It will help create a mechanism for the Maryland Department of Health to provide startup funding for new sites and outlines a pathway for the allocation of add-on funding that would support sites shown to have high utilization and or enrollment based on quality data. The bill will also require sports physicals to be covered by the state's Medicaid program starting on January 1st, as state funds allow. The department needs assessment um, that was completed late last year showed that as of the 2020 to 2021 school year, only about half or 52% of the school-based health centers 
that responded to the survey reported being a participant in the Vaccine for Children's um, site. Um, for those unaware of the Vaccine for Children's program, uh, funded through the federal CDC program, this um, is often the only way that the most vulnerable, impoverished, and marginalized children have access to free vaccines, but also comes with complex facility, operational, and administrative considerations that are common barriers to site adoption, especially in settings like school-based health centers. This bill simply requires that the Department of Health develop guidelines on base infrastructure and projected budget needs for schools to have school-based health centers and or vaccine for children um, program sites. The goal of generating this information is so that the school systems can have um, on one hand, can have it on one hand when they are making school construction decisions. Both school-based health centers and VFC sites have certain capital needs and can be much less expensive for the school system that wants a school-based health center to build one on the front end rather than retrofitting part of their school um, later on. The decision to start a school-based health center or establish a school-based health center as a vaccines for children's site will still be up to the local jurisdictions. This bill does not have any effect on federal regulations that are associated with the VFC sites that are likely to continue to pose um, a barrier for vaccine access in schools. Uh, additionally, a student can only be enrolled in a school-based health center with parental consent, which is an added level of consent in addition to the parental consent that's needed to vaccinate a child. So in that instance, you would need two consents from the parents. In addition to developing several funding recommendations, this bill also requires Medicaid to cover sports physicals. Providers outside school-based health centers can bill for sports physicals currently, but school-based health centers cannot. This has been an ongoing issue because school-based health centers are often called on to do these physicals for low-income students. However, they cannot be compensated for providing this care. For, from the opponents, you're going to hear that our schools are in need of significant capital improvements. Completely agree. This is 100% correct, which is why the General Assembly passed the Built to Learn Act several years ago to really help provide a foundation of proper funding for our school's infrastructure needs. This bill changes nothing about how the state spends school construction funds. It does not change the funding formula for school construction dollars. This is about ensuring that school-based health centers are spent, center funds are spent in an efficient and effective way. And finally, um, nothing in this bill will change the requirements about giving vaccine to a child. You may hear from um, folks who are testifying in opposition later on that this um, would change those requirements. Nothing in this bill changes how um, uh, consent and eligibility for vaccinating a child would occur. To the extent this bill touches on vaccines, it is only related to the current program that ensures the poorest Maryland families have access to childhood vaccines, and that's the Vaccines for Children program. Uh, based on this testimony, I urge the um, committee to consider a favorable report um, and happy to take any questions after the rest of the sponsor panel proceeds. Uh, good afternoon, Robin Elliott. I'm here today testifying on behalf of the Maryland Assembly on School-Based Health Care. And as Senator Lamb said, school-based health centers are essentially community health centers within a school. And there are almost 90 in Maryland in 14 jurisdictions. All school-based health centers offer primary care. Many offer uh, behavioral health and a growing number are adding that. Um, and then several also offer oral health care. Um, I wanna thank this committee for um, working on the legislation that moved oversight of school-based health centers from MSDE to the Department of Health. And that has helped tremendously. And essentially it's helping to align what school-based health centers do with our Department of Health's public health goals. And I think that is what Senator Lamb's bill further does. Um, it has a component about planning, which I think the Department of Health is engaging in already. How do we make sure we have enough school-based health centers and how do we make sure they're in every jurisdiction that needs school-based health centers? And, and by the way, school-based health centers are in schools in which there are high concentrations of poverty. Um, the other thing this bill does um, is, uh, as Senator Lamb said, reimbursement for school physicals. We really want to make sure all kids have access to those so it's not a barrier to them playing sports. 
And then as Senator Lamb mentioned, um, school-based health centers have struggled to become integrated into the existing um, vaccination uh, for kids program under the Department of Health. Um, and it, with COVID, it was as um, uh, simple as not having uh, the refrigerator that gets down to the degree that's cold enough to store those vaccines. And this bill would help um, facilitate that planning. So would very much ask for a favorable report. And also I'm happy to work with the committee on any questions. I think the other person on the sponsor panel had to drop off at four. That's what so I was I'm just going to sure tell you. Going. Okay, yeah. so then we'll go ahead and take questions for this panel. I have Senator Reedy. Senator Mounts, and then the vice chair. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I guess I have two questions. Um, one is, how does this interface with the bill we've heard related to, I think it's Senator Hester's bill that we're going to be working on about school-based mental health resources. Is that is that separate from this? Is that part of this? Can you, as it's one question, I have a follow-up, but it's not about the same issue. I don't know if somebody can answer that. I can answer that. It's separate. So um, there is school health and school-based health centers, and it's confusing because they basically sound the same. Um, school-based health centers are community health centers within a school, and they're often sponsored by your local hospital or a local federally qualified health center, kind of an extension of that service. School health is in every school. So we've all, of course, whether it's a nurse, or a nurse or a social worker. And the other bill that you're referring to is that school health that's in every school. Can we draw down some federal match if those services are billable under Medicaid? Okay. Um, so that those are the difference between the two. What in these health centers would it be any kind of medical procedure performed at all, or any? I mean, what kind of not? I know it wouldn't be any kind of. I mean, what kinds of procedures and actual medical services would be performed? It's it's core primary care services. Um, you're not setting physical. you're not setting broken bones, right? You're, oh you're, no. <laughs> Um, so most school-based health centers are, um, there are a few that are staffed by physicians, but most are nurse practitioner um, run. Um, it's core primary care services. Um, we've got a lot of kids with chronic diseases, so it's diabetes management. Um, it can even be hypertension management. Um, and then, of course, because it's in a school and because we're talking about kids, there, there's some kind of urgent care components because, you know, kids... Yeah, kids get injured. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> so um, that's the even, core. Like ear infections, stomach bugs. So just you know, basically what a school nurse does, but maybe at a grander scale with more staffing. Correct. Right, and and because they're staffed by nurse practitioners and physicians, they're able to make a diagnosis and provide care. Okay. It's, do they, and do they refer out if it's something just like a primary care? They would refer out if somebody presents with something that needs to be. Oh. Right, for example, it. they normally would not be able to do an x-ray. So if somebody right. needs an x-ray, they're going to get um, suggested out. Okay. And then um, do they, um, okay. All right. It's it's just interesting because my concern about, I've, I've talked, I think I've talked to the sponsor a little bit. I mean, I'm concerned about centering so much in the schools. I understand we need some services. Can people come off? That's my last question, Madam Chair. Thank you. Can people come off hours? I mean, is this or is oh. only open when the school is open? Are parents coming with them? Like what what's the deal? That's a core um, central question. So school based health centers are not the child's primary care provider because of the issue of um, maybe not being available year round on the summers and on on holidays. You know, I think there is some thought and some planning um, whether or not school-based health centers could expand and become that. Often the real barrier- That's not this bill? That's not this bill. The, the barrier, just to let you know, is that, of course, we have to think about school security. Um, and so um, if a community wants to look at doing that, the school-based health center can't be like right. in the middle of the school. Um, and so- um, 
some school-based health centers will uh, uh, treat a, a, a student sibling, but it is by and large entirely for the students within the school and really an extension to um, make sure that um, they're healthy enough to get their education. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the answers. Thanks. Thank you. We're going to Senator Mounts, then the Vice Chair, then Senator Watson. Oh. Senator? Thank you, Chairman. So um, you were talking about the schools. This is for for um, either for for either um, which schools that would qualify and schools that wouldn't qualify. It seems to me that most schools would qualify based off of um, free and reduced meals. Is that the a correct way to try to evaluate which schools would be qualified and which ones wouldn't? So right now, there, there's a need for startup funds for um, school-based health centers to be able to um, initiate themselves in, in a school. It's, it's a lot of the support actually comes from local health departments that have um, seen a need and have decided to work with the local school system to identify certain schools to be able to start those programs in. Mm -hmm. And you have anything to add? And... Um... So the, the decision really rests with the community and the schools. Um, there could be, you know, a, a local school system and its community partners really saw a need. So it's both, I think, um, the level of degree that the community is underserved and also kind of want to look, is the school near any other community health providers? If one's across the street, then maybe a school-based health center might not be needed. Yeah, well, the timing, the timing for this hearing is perfect because baseball season, you can't practice till tomorrow. So if you want to play baseball or whatever, spring sport, you've got to have your physical in, you know, right now. So the you know, kids are all getting ready. Um, what school, do school, are there any schools right now that um, already do this? Yeah, so um, most of the counties in the state do have one school-based health center in the state. There are seven, I believe, counties currently that do not have a school-based health center. This is, just to be clear, voluntary, right? And so this is not a requirement. It's not a mandate of any sort. This is where the local community, local health department, local school system have come together, identified a need, essentially set up a local community health center inside the physical space of a school. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, my question wasn't specific enough. Are there schools that are doing the sports physicals right now? Yes. I, I think, um, I'm not positive, I have to double check, but I'm I'm almost certain that all school-based health centers do sports physicals. Mm -hmm. They're not getting They're reimbursed not getting for it. Okay. And what this it, bill does is allow them to be Medicaid reimbursed. Well, like I said, you know, sports start tomorrow. So when I saw this, I got excited right away. I want to see what it was all about, you know, and uh, gave a little extra spice to the to the text. And um, um, but then I got into the the bill and I was reading the bill, and it has all the um, um, the it has the different provisions dealing with future construction and guidelines and things like that. You know the guidelines, uh, the secretaries to, to develop guidelines for school-based help, school-based health centers. And, and that kind of caught me by surprise. So I've been trying to read that and understand and kind of, you know, um, interpret how that would play out. So those guidelines would become future um, issues for districts that are trying to do renovations or build new schools, or what, what, what is the purpose of those guidelines? So the guidelines are to help better align with the Blueprint for Maryland's Future um, Act that we passed a couple of years ago. And, and there's also funding through the Build to Learn Act to uh, provide local school systems dollars for school renovation and construction. Really what the bill does is ask the local school systems as they're looking at these plans to build schools to take into consideration uh, the potential for school-based uh, for school -based health centers later on, and that that can be incorporated into those plans as those dollars are drawn down to make sure that this could be a consideration as part of the school is being developed rather than being a consideration later after the school has already been built, where it would be much more expensive to have to 
do a renovation to include them in. And this is a concern that I have with the bill and I could be getting in front of myself and I will check thing. I will check it out and, and talk to some of my superintendent and superintendents and school boards. We've got four school systems in our senatorial district. Um, but, uh, you know, school-based health centers are, are, are a point of a lot of attention. If the department or the state's going to come out with guidelines on what it should look like and how it should operate, have you thought or or uh, considered that being um, uh, uh, impediment to more rural schools that don't have the funding and the resources to do what they're trying to do? In other words, it's the state coming in saying, well, if you're going to do your renovation or build a new school, well, then you've got to have this for your school based school school based health centers because I've got hey, there's four dis four districts in our senatorial district and no four are the same they all have a unique uh, 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 mode of operation and um and and the services they provide are all unique also and then trying to bring all that into a new system that's set by the Department of Health I can't imagine that my local school boards are going to be excited about that. I think I think it's important to to draw a distinction here in that it is it is voluntary to the local school system to the community to start a school based health center. It's not a requirement. I think the the what the bill states is a um, requirement for the secretary and the Department of Health to come up with some guidelines if a community would like to proceed with developing their new school with a school-based health center that it provides some guidance on how to do that, whether it's amount of space, how you may want to configure it, making it accessible to students, to the public, if there are you know, entrances and whatnot. Yeah. So, my, yeah, my question was a little bit like debating the bill, and, and I appreciate your answer, I'll, and I'll do some research on it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And let me just remind you, colleagues, we still have a number of bills and over 100 witnesses left today. So I don't want to discourage important conversations. I just want us to keep our questions and responses a little brief so that we can get through our agenda today. All right, Madam Vice Chair, show us how it's done. I got to talk real fast. Robin, um, can you get me a list of the uh, already um, that are in our Yes. Operating. <laughs> they're in the in the bill. Um, yes, no. I will. There's a, an excellent report okay. put out by an advisory committee that lists the um, the jurisdictions. There are 89 school based health centers. And, and I'm here to the provide bill. that. OK, OK, that's first thing. The second thing is um, you mentioned oral health. And do the dentists do actual do they have chairs that that they can do? regular oral health in there. Yes, they're just a couple of school-based health centers with dental suites. Um, in part, that's because of the expense, um, but that is an area where it would be nice to build out a little bit more. Yes, because that's one of our bills that we've had mm -hmm. this year. So, okay, thank you. We'll follow up. Great, thank you. Thank you, Senator Watson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a quick question. I, I was able to go back and, and I determined that Prince George's County has four in well-needed areas. My only question is, I thought this was all about kind of a triage in schools, but it looks like a lot more. So with, you know, immunizations and reproductive health care, lab testing, sports physicals, comprehensive physical examinations, do the parents get notified when a, when a student comes in and takes one of these services? Yeah. Yes, they, they actually, parents have to consent for the care to be provided to their children in the school-based health center. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It looks like there are no further questions for this panel. So we're going to call forward uh, the next panel who are speaking in opposition to the bill. Uh, that is Daniela Diorazio, Sarah Cusack, Deborah Brocato, Krishna Manora, Jenna Butler, Stephen Bess, Jill Capper. I may have called too many for the chairs, but as many as of you as can, please approach and, and start when you're ready. And then uh, we'll move and let someone else have the seat. 
Hello, Finance Committee. My name is Daniela Dorazio. I'm a, I'm a Maryland constituent and I'm asking you to oppose SB 628. We need to take uh, healthcare out of our schools and focus our limited resources in repairing falling roofs as uh, is raining in some classrooms, broken doors and windows to block criminals from entering schools and providing good air filtration. So we don't have so many viruses and bacteria flying around in classrooms. We also need to invest in our current schools uh, whose improvements have been delayed like our son's school has at Thomas Wooten High School in Rockville. Children are accompanied by parents or legal guardians need to go to their pediatricians for professional treatment in a doctor's office where there is advanced technology and where medical information is confidential. Please oppose SB 628. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Sarah Cusack, and for this testimony, I'm representing the Love Maryland PAC. Um, we're concerned that the participation in the VFC program is not the best use of the $9 million. Um, we prefer to see dental care, some, of, um, uh, some other things that could be done for the kids. And we actually have safety concerns. Uh, the Maryland Department of Health in-school health center needs assessment that the bill sponsor mentioned says that many in-school health centers expressed challenges with being designated as a VFC provider due to the requirements and costs related to storing and transporting vaccinations. And then I found a federal two-week study. This is called the Vaccines for Children Program, Vulnerabilities in Vaccine Management. It detailed difficulties with vaccine transport, storage, and management. It said that the VFC vaccine stored by 76% of the selected providers were exposed to inappropriate temperatures during their two-week study period. They found expired vaccines stored with uh, current vaccines. Finally, the selected providers generally did not meet vaccine management requirements or maintain required documentation. Children already have to be vaccinated to attend school, so we don't really see why this would be the best use of this money. I'm, I'm not sure what vaccinations this would be targeting um, because they're already mandated to be vaccinated and it seems to be extremely difficult to transport, store, and maintain the VCF vaccine products. We think that this could be a waste of money and we'd like to see other health things be provided for the children. Thank you. Hello, my name is Krishna Manohar. I'm a resident of Rockville. I'm here today to submit testimony to the op to opposition in opposition to SB 628. I think the function of schools should be to just focus on education and maintaining a good environment for the students. Um, you know, leave health care to the pediatricians and the doctors um usually based on i guess from what i understand i mean the, the quality of you know the health care provided by um, school health centers has been kind of uh, poor um you know i wouldn't want my two nephews to you know go through something like that so um please i advise you to vote against this bill Hi. Um, good afternoon, committee, and thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, I know it's been a long afternoon. My name is Jennedy Ceceris Butler. Um, I'm here to ask for an unfavorable report on SB 628, and here's why. Um, we have mold, no clean drinking water, rundown, flooding, outdated, no heat, no AC. These are the conditions in Maryland schools. We can make a stack to the ceiling of the issues that need to be addressed in Maryland schools before we even consider expanding school health centers this way. The very school buildings that we spend, send our kids to spend six or more hours a day in are making the kids sick. They're missing precious hours and days of instructional time due to no heat or no AC. And schools are struggling to meet children's basic educational, nutritional, and social needs. I can tell you frankly that SB 628's proposal feels extremely out of touch with the current realities of Maryland school buildings and the needs of Maryland's children. Excuse me, is this medical suite going to be as run down as the rest of the school buildings? We don't even have the basic school infrastructure 
needed for health. Far from it. Vaccines are just one small part of pediatric health care, as we were just reminded here by pediatricians. I won't pretend to know exactly how funding or allocation works, but I do know that the priority of the blueprint and the priority of this legislature is Maryland's kids and serving their needs the best we can. And quite simply, SB 628 does not align with that. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Bricado from Maryland Right to Life. Thank you, Senators, for this long day and listening to us. Uh, we oppose Senate Bill 628 as written. The bill would allow entities that promote and provide abortions to manage and or provide employees for school health centers. This is already happening in California. And we see that in California, they say that students can walk into these well-being centers at any time, including during class, and minors can receive emergency contraception and other forms of birth control, and healthcare providers are not allowed to inform their parents without the minor's per permission. Also, the clinics will also train hundreds of teens who are also minors to be peer advocates about safe sex and relationships and provide pregnancy counts. Uh, counselors, and that's minors talking to minors. So we also uh, know that we don't want Maryland as a state sponsor of abortion. This bill would allow the public school system to be used as a conduit in the abortion industry and use taxpayer money to do so. The state of Maryland, including the Department of Education and the Department of Health, have become state sponsors using taxpayer funds to contract out education curriculum development programs, training, and school health services to questionable third-party organizations that are financially interested in abortion sales, including Planned Parenthood and Advocates for Youth. Together, they have established the existing Maryland Comprehensive Health Education Framework, this here, which we have a bill, HB 119, Senate Bill 199, that, um, and they've also uh, develop the Maryland standards for school-based health centers, and we see that it includes pregnancy testing on-site, informing and referring for birth control on-site, and dispensing contraceptives on-site. Um, we we see this as taking the parents again out of their um, authority over their children and discussing these important topics with their children. So abortion is not health care, and we know that also this assembly lowered the age to, see, to seek mental health care to age 12. Um, in addition, um, and we do, don't think that is looking out for the students in Maryland. So we do oppose Senate Bill 628 for this and many other reasons that you can also read in my written testimony. Hello again, I'm still Steve Brest from just a little while ago and still almost 60 years a Maryland resident. Um, I object to putting the vaccine clinics, the uh, vaccine for children program in with an otherwise reasonable sounding program. Uh, if somebody's hurt at a school or has no other way to get a quick evaluation um, other than being at school, uh, I certainly don't have a problem with there being somebody more educated than just the school nurse. Um, that doesn't mean they're appropriate for all the children. And, uh, you know, so getting an evaluation, sure. But at that point, it's, the school is not necessarily an appropriate place for every type of medical treatment, of which vaccine is. It's an invasive treatment. Bad things happen. In spite of all the assurances, safe and effective, uh, safe is a definition, uh, effective is a definition, bad things happen with vaccines. Um, uh, others have addressed the infrastructure and the fact that it would primarily be for new schools addresses some of the infrastructure uh, issues, so don't need to go there. But uh, as to the earlier conversation, it's another layer of removing pediatrician oversight that was discussed um, in the earlier thing about allowing um, the pharmacist administer uh, vaccines, that the information is not necessarily going back and forth. And uh, the actual pediatrician is an, and should be part of the child's life. As far as the bit with um, the parents and parents have to sign off and all that, that would be fine, except there's a constant barrage of bills that pass through the Senate and the House trying to lower the age of consent and all the way down to like five and allow younger and younger kids consent to any kind of medical treatment they want. So the fact that it's all good and well today is that doesn't mean it will stay that way next week when one of those bills comes through. 
Thank you very much. Okay, are there any questions? Madam Vice Chair, nope. Any questions for this panel? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony and for hanging out with Senate Finance this afternoon. I think we have one more witness, Jill Clapper. Capper. Capper. Yeah. Sorry I about know. that. I added a letter. Hi, uh, yes. Still Good Clapper. afternoon. Still a lifelong resident of Maryland and outspoken health freedom advocate and uh, most importantly, a mother. I'm testifying to oppose SB 628 because I believe it's dangerous and inappropriate and unnecessary. It's dangerous and inappropriate because we're hoping to implement a one size fits all uh, mass vaccination infrastructure, which attempts to bypass the process of parental informed consent. Children can already receive free healthcare services, including vaccines, uh, through existing healthcare infrastructure where the parents uh, are present. Uh, it's unnecessary because children will need to see their pediatrician regardless, and schools are already struggling to provide the basics of education as it is. So they're overburdened and couldn't possibly take on any additional tasks. Uh, again, we'd agree that our children are our responsibility. So please, if you will, take a step back and consider how uh, bills like this can be damaging and work with us rather against us. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. No questions for this witness. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to go to our virtual witnesses, starting with Joe St. George. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. I'm Joe St. George with the Women of Color for Equal Justice. And we have a friendly amendment to the bill, but um, also have some concerns. But the amendment, the, the concerns first are, as was mentioned by the, the physician, um, lack of pediatrician oversight um, and more parental con, um, involvement. But the other piece that we have a struggle with is, is discrimination. Um, and when we say discrimination, the fact that there's this one size fit all of, of health care. And so we ask that the bill include language for um, uh, also having health care that includes nutrition care. Um, I represent a community of religious believers who use plant-based lifestyle medicine as medicine. They don't engage in vaccines. They don't use medications. They choose to use natural remedies. And so because this bill really heavily focuses on um, vaccination and providing uh, contraceptives, which are medications, it does not provide any services to uh, the children and the parents that have religious beliefs that are uh, that don't utilize those healthcare services. And so what we uh, request that the bill be amended to include holistic care, specifically uh, teaching kitchens around um, plant-based nutrition um, and education because the top killers of children are, are not uh, communicable diseases, um, but they are chronic diseases and diseases that are environmental that cause respiratory issues and genetic uh, to genetic, genetic issues. And so we strongly recommend that the bill be amended to, to include, uh, include um, guidance on teaching kitchens on lifestyle, plant-based lifestyle medicine. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. No questions for you this afternoon. So we thank you for your testimony. And um, I don't know, do we have your amendments? Um, I, I, they were submitted attached to our written um, submission. Very so, good. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you for the time. Have a great uh, evening. You too. All right, we're going to turn colleagues to Megan Montgomery and she and the remaining virtual witnesses have signed up in opposition to the bill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time again today. Um, my name is Megan Montgomery. I come before you as the parent of a minority male child in a Title I school district. Uh, we live in a community that has great need, and um, I very much am in support of all of the efforts the state has made to get these kids um, managing their, their conditions and uh, especially playing sports. I think it's a great opportunity to have you know non-invasive sports physicals. Uh, but I have a, a lot of concerns about the level of parental consent that um, are is, is going to be required. As Senator Lamb discussed, there is one blanket parental consent given for these 
um, use of these health centers at the beginning of the year. And then perhaps there are some other gatekeeping. I want to tell you a story about what happened to my son when he was younger. We were at a pediatrician appointment. My husband and I were both there. The pediatrician came in, a pediatrician in the practice came in, very confident. We're here for your child's ear procedure. I said, my child doesn't have an ear procedure. She said, yes, you did. There's nothing to be worried about. Everything's going to be fine. I said, my child does not have an ear procedure. My husband said, well, obviously he needs to have an ear procedure. And I said, no, he doesn't have an ear procedure. Here's what happened. That pediatrician walked into the wrong room. If my child had been there by himself under a blanket consent, he would have been subjected to an unnecessary ear procedure, minor surgery meant for someone else. If these you know, health centers are working, and I'd love to see a study about if they are working for the 90 that already exist, then they need to be including the parents on every visit, on every procedure, on every follow-up, because one blanket consent does not cut it when, you know, health, children's health and lives are on the line. So thank you very much for your time today. And thank you for your testimony. There are no questions. So we're going to move on to our next witness. Good afternoon, Jessica Helms. Hello again. Um, thank you guys for your time again. You guys have a really long day for you. Um, I'm testifying in opposition to SB 628. As I told you before, I am a former teacher in Prince George's County. The school that I worked in lacked doors on the bathrooms. There was mold in the basement that a colleague continuously had to use a rescue inhaler for. And when she mentioned it to admin, she was threatened with her job. Our schools are making our kids and our teachers sick. I am grateful to no longer be in the county because of the health issues I also dealt with while teaching there because of the unsafe conditions of some of our buildings. I was grateful when I was able to move over to Hyattsville and help open a brand new school thinking things are going to be different here. I'm glad I got chosen for this. I walked into a kindergarten classroom that was stuck at 94 degrees. I was not permitted to open a window to cool down our room. I was not permitted to prop a door to cool down our room. Our doors had to remain closed because part of our building was supposed to be secure. And we had a runner in my classroom, so I couldn't leave the door open. We need to fix the buildings we have, and we need to make sure we're no longer giving things to the lowest bidder, but get somebody in to build these buildings who know what they're doing so that we're having classrooms that are conducive to learning. When we are understaffed because we don't have enough ESOL support, one year I was ESOL, I had 120 kids on my case. One teacher, 120 kids divided between six classrooms that I had to visit every single one to meet IEP goals and to meet ESOL goals. That wasn't always possible, but I had to do it alone. Please, please, please take this money, get support that we need in our schools, fix the building and make sure we have adequate staff. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee. So we'll turn to our next witness, Vince McCovey. McAvoy, thank you, Chair. McAvoy. Okay. And uh, Chair, I was missed, uh, though I want to say I was in the queue on SB 372. And I'm not complaining. I was switching back and forth between JPR. I just mentioned it because I want to incorporate, as one of the previous witnesses did, some SB 372 information into my testimony here. Um, so again, thank you for the ability to testify. I appreciate it. Um, I am against this bill. I, I don't think that everyone listening hears that this is being set up solely for matching funds. And I want to, just with all the testimony that you just received, I think it's really important for us to understand that the legislature is basically giving a blank check to teachers for their administrative goals and for their their um, long-term career needs but our children to this day this goes all the way back to o'malley and ehrlich arguing in baltimore city our schools don't have services this bill won't get us services this bill will bring in vaccines that we don't necessarily want for children you just heard someone speak and there's a bill about hpv we don't want that in schools we don't want children pressured to take that we also don't want them to be pressured, as Senator Rosapep had mentioned in a previous summer session, about going into seventh grade and finding Johnny and saying, it's your turn to take the COVID vax. We don't want that. What we want 
is for schools to do what they're designed to do, reading, writing, arithmetic. I cannot stress this enough. Our children are failing, not because of vaccines, not because they don't, aren't told about um, the grossest sex and about abortions. They're failing because they're not given these skills and tools to succeed in America. It has nothing to do with this. So I, I would strongly urge you to, to eschew these type of issues just because the government's dangling money. I do again, thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee. So we will move to our next witness, El Eleanor Jones. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Eleanor Parnell Jones. I am opposed to SB 628. Uh, I had a couple of sticky notes <laughs> worth of points that I wanted to make. Uh, after listening to uh, the summary at the beginning, I actually have even more concerns. I know I'm limited on time, but you know, I just want to say that within these last three years in the aftermath of COVID, you know, my trust that government organizations will help us take care of our kids has greatly diminished. Uh, you know, our schools were closed for over a year. We were behind, still behind many states that did choose to open fall of 2020. This is not a good use of taxpayer funds. Um, my increased fears over this bill, in addition to how the CDC has recently added the COVID vaccine to the routine immunization schedule for children. Uh, I am not one of those who are opposed to all vaccines. I'm the mother of a young son who is susceptible to meningitis. We have been through you know, some pretty potent <clears throat> vaccines that are not recommended for young people. Um, this bill concerns me. And uh, now that I'm learning that reproductive tests, health examinations could also be included in this, the blanket parental consent uh, is a concern to me as well. Having taught in schools, you know, we have to send things home through the kids. You know, I don't think we've gotten a clear answer as to, you know, how would this parental consent be obtained? You know, uh, but I, I really think this bill, you know, needs to be evaluated. It's just not a good use and it's not good for our kids. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and participation in our process. Uh, there are no questions from the committee, so that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 628. We'll now turn to Senate Bill 529. Senator Reedy, Carroll County Sober Living Houses Authorization. Good afternoon. And if you have a panel, bring them up. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe we have possibly two, but certainly one person that's in the queue, which I'd like to be part of my panel. I think one of this could not make it after all. Um, let, I'm going to launch right in because we've had a long day and this is a local bill, uh, but I'm gonna sort of explain why. So uh, Madam Chair and uh, Vice Chair and members of the committee, uh, as amended Senate Bill 529 would allow Carroll County to put a sober living element into the county comprehensive master plan. We are a commissioner form of government, uh, by the way. I neglected to add that in EEE a little while ago in another bill, and they started asking me questions about whether our county council had authorized this. We are a commissioner form of government. So this would allow us to put a sober living element into our county master plan to give guidance on the, the number, how many can be in a certain area. It would give our county flexibility, ensuring an orderly, safe, and fair distribution of these kinds of group homes. This and the amendment will change this. The language of the bill, what as drafted, was like a mandate mandate on our county. This is to authorize rather than mandate. That's what the amendment does. The reason I brought this bill and our delegation supports this bill is we've had um, folks in a in a particular community in our in our county in Westminster uh, brought a number of issues to our attention. Uh, there's an area called Fairfield. It's in the Westminster area. And an aggressive property management firm based out of Pennsylvania began purchasing homes in this neighborhood and, and uh, then through handshake leases contracted with a Maryland-based recovery center 
that was incorporated only in 2021 to establish drug substance abuse recovery homes in this neighborhood. So working in tandem, these two entities got obtained three properties between September of 2021, August of 2022, converted them from th- single family dwellings to corporate home, corporate owned sober living substance abuse recovery center group homes. This was done without really anybody in the neighborhood's knowledge uh, or any notice while adding And it added to another one that was already established, had been there for eight years. So now this one neighborhood in a a square block, this one community has four sober living group homes in, I guess, two blocks or a square block of a community. Um, So what's followed in, in in the past 18 months, there already were some issues with the one group home, but a continual disruption of all hours of day and night um, and not really any accountability with the owners. And recently, there was even an attempt to try to turn one of them into a a bigger group home. They were only stopped because uh, they didn't have enough water. The water allocation wouldn't have been appropriate. That's the only reason they were stopped. Um, According to the testimony of multiple residents, it is not unusual to hear an ambulance at any time of day. Foot and car traffic increased dramatically. Cars have been broken into. There's been an increase of water, sewer, and trash usage. Just overall concerns for the safety of well-being of their homes, property, and children. And I want to be clear before I go any further, because I'm not going to be much longer, but I do ask that you, did you hear me on this? I would not be bringing this bill, and our delegation wouldn't be, if this was one group home in a neighborhood. These folks have told me to a person, I've talked to dozens of people in this community, they have told me to a person, they'll say, I don't object to, we know we need sober living homes. We, we know, it's like, but do we have to have four in one neighborhood? And I think it's a fair question. Um, and so, and and their frustration is they seem to have been targeted because there is no HOA. This this area did not have an HOA. If you had an HOA, there'd be things, there'd be tools in the toolbox. But this community is was built gradually over time years ago. These are middle class uh, uh, homes, and uh, they don't have an HOA. So um, it is what these sober homes are a non-conforming type of use for a home in this neighborhood. But current state law does not allow for any regulation of the placement of of group homes. And um, so what our bill is just trying to do is allow our county to have the ability to have some regulation on the number of group homes in a particular area, some control over the process. Handshake leases between a property management company and a provider of health services do not provide the kind of oversight that are needed for these kinds of, I'll call them facilities, they're group homes. And again, I support, we support people in recovery. But there's a question of, in my view, and the reason our delegation supports and I brought this bill is we want to be sure there can be some level of, of balance and oversight. So this is what Senate Bill 529 asks is for flexibility. Uh, and our, our delegation on the Senate and the House side have voted unanimously in favor, and there should be a letter of support included. I would request a favorable vote on this local bill, and I'd maybe turn it over to my person who's in the queue, or there may be two people. Thank you. I think we have Ms. Uh, Ms. Townsley. We only have one, Catherine Townsley. Good afternoon. You can Good proceed. Afternoon. Thank you for your time today. Um, my name is Catherine Townsley on behalf of the Save Fairfield Association comprised of property owners in the Fairfield community in Westminster, Maryland. I'm speaking in support of Senate Bill 529. My neighborhood, which I reside in for over 40 years and have been a property owner for the last 16, was built in the 1950s and 60s. The homes are three bedroom, two bathroom homes that range in size from 1,100 to 1,400 square feet, and the lots on average are 12,000 square feet in size. They were built with the intention of being single family residences. While we do not have an HOA, we are a community of property owners that are comprised of retirees, middle income workers, families who have raised and are raising their children in a desired neighborhood and take pride in their properties. Within the last 18 months, we've had three new sober living homes um, of various treatment levels, which is important to note, move into our neighborhood. That is in addition to the Maddie House, which is a sober living home that has been established for over eight years and has had problems of its own with mismanagement and legal issues that were overflowed into our community since its establishment. Mulligan Sober Living is operating three sober living homes within four hundred meters of each other. They do not own these properties, but rather are renting them on a handshake lease, according to their own testimony before the Carroll County Board of Zoning Appeals. Additionally, the Maddie House is located between them and is also a rented property. Under the current law, each home is allowed to have eight occupants. 
That is four houses that are not owner occupied with potentially 32 residents who have zero interest or skin in the game for our neighborhood. Let me state that we are not against sober living or individuals with disabilities. We have neighbors who are disa disabled. We have veterans, property owners in recovery themselves, and a house that's owned and operated by another local nonprofit that serves the adults with intellectual disabilities. We have welcomed them and embraced them. But since the increase of these non-occupied, owner-occupied sober living facilities in our neighborhood, we have experienced interruptions in the peace and harmony that we've grown to expect in our own residences. This includes seven homeowners and families selling their homes as a direct result of these homes being built and are being established within our own neighborhood. The bottom line is that we are asking for the regulations to be put into place that will allow communities, excuse me, counties and municipalities to oversee the density and placement of designated sober living facilities when established communities without interrupting the peaceful living of established uh, property owners and taxpayers. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Senator Lamb has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the sponsor. Uh, you know, I understand the concerns I, I hear from constituents in the Brooklyn part part of my uh, district as well with concerns about facilities that are in their neighborhoods. Um, but, you know, when it comes to this being a local bill, I am concerned about precedent. And, you know, you may have seen this in the in the uh, bill packet as well, that there is opposition testimony um, that identifies the fact that this uh, has significant violations of existing law, both on the federal and the state level, the Fair Housing Act, Americans for Disability Act and several Maryland civil rights uh, laws. To paraphrase, it sounds like um, their concern is that, um, particularly on the federal level, the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on disability. And a lot of these folks have disabilities, which is why they end up in, in these facilities in recovery. And so, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see if there were other ways that the county has explored to try to address some of these concerns that have come up that don't involve kind of violating federal and state law. And then there's a whole coalition, even though it's only one letter of testimony, there's, you know, everything from Disability Rights Maryland to Legal Action Center to NAMI, Federation of the Blind, um, Public Justice Center that express this concern in, in um, collectively. Yeah, I, I understand that. I think that I don't think the bill, I think there's a way to do this that wouldn't violate federal law because for many, many years in Maryland, we allowed regulation of, of group homes. It was only, I think, in 2015 or 2016 that we changed state law to where my understanding is in my research, and I'm happy to be corrected, but my research is we changed it because we didn't want, there's a way to regulate homes that are doing, a, like sober living homes, as far as I see in the law, are actually there that you can have no regulation on them at all, whereas you actually can have some regulation on homes for folks in the disability community. So there, a, a county is allowed to do some level of planning for that. Maybe we can talk offline. I understand the concerns. I knew that this bill, I know that this bill is not, look, the, we know the state law is not always the best way to try to address issues, but our this community really is crying out for help. And what I really made me upset was that it feels like they're being targeted because they don't have an HOA. I, again, if they had come to me and say, hey, we don't like this one group home, this one sober living home here, I'd be like, well, I mean, I'm sorry, but we have to have sober living homes when you have four of them in one. So I don't know. I actually, maybe we can talk off on, there may be some other ways that we can look at it, but I, I'm happy to make whatever amendments we need to do. It seems a little bit absurd to me that a county government or city government can't have some ability to regulate homes with multiple unrelated people living them no matter who they are so i feel like that's what i'm trying to get at with the bill and maybe it's maybe it needs a little more work but i'd uh, happy to talk more offline as well okay thank you thank you senator guile thank you madam chair um i think i have what's a quick question i just don't understand i'm reading the text of the bill and i, I don't understand exactly what an element is sober living element and um Maybe you can explain that. An element is something you would find in a county master plan or comprehensive plan. There's an element for um, that's language that was from the bill draft or so. I mean, but I, I, my understanding is that's that's how you would phrase it. In you would include an element in your master plan that deals with a certain. You would include something in your master plan that deals with a certain element. So a sober living would be an element. Okay, and, and just last last question because I know we got a lot. But it says a sober living house element shall propose the most appropriate, and just seems to me that it almost makes it sound like a like that that it's a person or a committee uh, or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly who's doing the proposing, so it just it's it's uh, it would it, need it to doesn't be seem the, very artfully. With all due respect to DLS, uh, it, uh, it, it, yeah, it it probably a little tweaking is is a fair question. I I think the goal is to say 
you would have something provided for in your master plan that would address how we deal with sure. this kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see no further questions for the sponsor. So thank you. We have one additional witness signed up on this bill, Leslie Dickinson, and signed up in opposition. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Leslie Dickinson. I'm an attorney with Disability Rights Maryland. We did submit the letter with 15 um, other organizations signing on. Um, we're te I'm testifying in opposition. I'm a resident of Carroll County as well, and I'm also in opposition as a personal, <laughs> as a citizen. Um, Senate Bill 529 amends the Maryland land use article to make it difficult, if not impossible, for sober living um, houses to locate in resident residential communities in Carroll County. Now, I haven't seen the amendments. This is based on the original. Um, this bill would provide a pathway through the state for Carroll County to use its zoning code to discriminate against a specific protected class of people with disabilities in violation of the Fair Housing Act, the, the ADA, and the state civil rights laws, which is the state um, government, state government code, human resources, but it's, it's our civil rights law. Um, excuse me. I listened to the August 31st, 2022 Board of Zoning Appeals hearing, at least some of it, it's very long. So I certainly understand where the community is coming from. Um, this is not the, this is not the, um, to way, the way to deal with that issue. Um, you need to take it to the county, talk to your county attorneys, do something that is narrowly tailored. Um, the Fair Housing Acts, and I do have written testimony, but um, the legislative history indicates the disability provisions were intended to reach a wide array of discriminatory housing practices, including licensing laws, which purport to advance the health and safety of communities. Um, state and local authorities, governments have the authority to protect safety and health and regulate land use of land. That authority has sometimes been used to restrict the ability of people with disabilities. Um, anyway, you have my testimony. And um, let me just say briefly, the, um, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act states under the ADA, local governments are explicitly prohibited from administering zoning procedures in a manner that subjects people with disabilities to discrimination on the basis of, of their disability. Um, there's case law citations in here as well as the statutory sites. So thank you very much. Anybody? Thank you. The vice chair has a question. Sure. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I just have a question. I, I know I bet everyone in this room has gone through similar kind of things, but when he's got four in one, na in one neighborhood, what recourse do those folks have? I mean, I mean, the disability community is covered and they're they're the ones that we can't do anything about and and i understand that but how about the people that have lived there what what is your idea that may help them i mean i have a couple thoughts though i i think that their county attorneys might as well but i think that this should may you may want to approach this from rather than focusing on the people living in the recovery houses that are already there and i'm not sure if you're trying to like kick them out, <laughs> which would be a whole other issue. But why Why are has has the county commission looked at, um, you know, out-of-state corporations and LLCs purchasing properties? Have you thought about increasing the transfer tax to make that more difficult or less, you know, less, um, I don't know, whatever. Have you thought about other ideas that don't focus so much on the actual people in recovery? Um, have you looked at your, I mean, the, the big problem, well, there's a lot of problems with this, but it's a big problem for the state. Because if this is going through the state code and amending the land use article, you have the state being complicit potentially in violations of federal law and actually also state law. So I would really, you know, be very concerned about that if I were a state legislator, or senator, state senator. Um, you know, there's I, it's at the end of the testimony, but there is a case from um, Cromwell, Connecticut, where they tried to keep a group home out of a neighborhood and 
ended up with a $5 million jury punitive damage jury verdict. So I'm just saying that as, as caution, that's not some type of a threat, you know, um, but I just think you all might want to, no, you just might want to be aware. My, my point is, so is, I mean, it's not, there's got to be help. For, right. And it's for not, folks. it's actually, unfortunately, it's not my job no, to figure out okay. what they should do. Um, I have ideas and he's, he's actually, you're actually my Senator. Okay. So I'm happy to All talk right. to you. So I, you I would ideas. appreciate it if you would work. <laughs> yes. And, and I, and I look at this, you know, from, from the, the disability rights angle, as well as from, you know, um, whether it's homeowners or even renters and people who can't, can't afford to rent because out of state or any corporation, you know, you have corporate interests buying up housing. So there are there are certainly issues. And, you know, the the four recovery houses in a, you know, whatever the space is, is just is just one of those issues. And so I would like to see maybe looking at this in a bigger picture way. And uh, you know, so anyway. You have a lot to do, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your testimony, and I don't see any additional questions from the committee, so that colleagues will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 529. We're going to turn to Senate Bill 558, which is Senator Gazone, the Chair's Recovery Residence Grant Program Establishment, I believe we have Eric who is presenting on his behalf and you can bring your panel forward and proceed when you're ready. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair and members of the Finance Committee, my name is Eric Benner here on behalf of Senator Gazzoni uh, to present Senate Bill 558, Recovery Residence Grant Program Establishment. Senate Bill 558 would establish the Recovery Resident Grant Program within the Maryland Department of Health to award competitive grants to recovery residences to support operations, services, and programs. Recovery residences help individuals seeking recovery from alcohol and or drug addiction stop the cycle of addiction, rehab, and relapse and increase the chance for sustained recovery. These programs are specifically designed to address a recovering person's need for a safe and healthy living environment while supplying requisite recovery and peer support. It is critical that people new in recovery develop accountability and a network of supportive peers. Individuals who go through drug and alcohol rehabilitation treatment programs followed by residing in recovery housing are more likely to achieve long-term sobriety and the positive impact is not is not limited to only themselves, but extends also to their family, friends, colleagues, and their community as a whole. This allows recovery residents to develop strong family relationships and positively contribute to society. We understand that there is much support for recovery residences. However, we do anticipate some amendments to modify the details of the grant program, and we ask for a favorable report. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Roger Huff. Yep, absolutely. Hello, my name is Roger Huff. I'm the board chair of Living and Recovery in Howard County. I'm also a man in long-term recovery. I'm here today to bring awareness towards this bill for specific recovery residences. And what we're talking about are Maryland certified recovery residences, which are approved and certified by the Behavioral Health Administration. We're specifically looking for funding for level two homes, which provides peer accountability and support. We have limited access to grants and funds, which allow us to bring new technology and other important services to this population of people that are transitioning from higher levels of care into a more sustainable home-like environment. These things are peer recovery support specialists, maybe some technology that can be used to help support people through their through their transitions like job placement, writing resumes, and bringing in some other ancillary services that the county and the state does not necessarily provide. This is open to all 
folks that are operating at a level two home. So this is not just one group looking for it, but ability for folks to go out to the state and be able to get funds to allow them to improve the services and extend the services. And I'll give you like one example of what we were able to do at Living in Recovery during the pandemic was we were able to reduce our census and keep people in individual rooms. And we did not have one noted case of COVID in our three homes in Howard County. So we we weren't able to go and get any additional support for that. But as an organization, we recognized that how important it was for these folks to continue to have stability and for their families to know that they're being taken care of. That's my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. The vice chair has a question. Yeah. Now, it, with the recovery houses, will there be an organization that oversees them? Currently, there is. Currently, there is. And that is called the Maryland Certification of Recovery Residences, which is a, okay. underneath of the Maryland State Behavioral Health okay. Association so, Agency. Therefore, it's not like just, OK, we're going to open this up and have what we're trying to do is bring awareness and okay. excuse me for being so candid, but eliminate some of this wild, wild west activities that have been ha happening across the state. We right. want to make sure that they're certified and that they're safe. OK, that's what I needed to know. Thank you. OK, Senator Hayes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I always thought that Medicaid or some other state funding um, went to support the recovery houses is that not the case is there other funding that this funding would supplement in order to support the operations of recovery homes great question so if i can there's many homes in the state of maryland that are at a level called 3.1 which are certified is the ASM level one, which has low clinical intensity, which means they have five hours. They're allowed to build Medicaid. Level two homes are not able to build Medicaid. So they are fully self-supporting through their primary revenue sources, which is rent, and then being able to write grant applications at the local level and at the state level to support them. So they don't have, the organization that I work with does not have that that funding source, that revenue stream to be able to build Medicaid. MCOR certified residences, which are Maryland Certification of Recovery Residences, allow you to access 60 days of rent through the Maryland Recovery Network support group. And I want to just eliminate, I just want to illuminate something here that that Maryland Recovery Network support provides $25 a day for rent. So if we can think about across all of our municipalities here, the average cost of rent. So twenty five dollars is is generous. But as you can imagine, lights, electricity, gas. It's very difficult to make ends meet on twenty five dollars a day with only 60 days worth of funding to be able to to get that. Right. So you bring me to my next point. Five hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money to me. But in a bigger scheme of things, the state budget is not a lot of money. So. What is the estimated, like how much do you think each home would require or, or gather from this grant fund? I don't have that answer for you, but I would hope that I would hope that folks would apply for this. Uh -huh. And you maybe see some folks that need 30,000, maybe some folks apply for 5,000, maybe some folks apply for 50,000. But I would like to think that it would be an equitable distribution based upon needs. Do we know what the universe of the level two uh, recovery homes is? How many you, of them are there? I don't have that statistic in front of me, but they are listed Maryland certif certified recovery residents underneath the BHA. And if I if I had your information, I'd be happy to pass it on to you after, after the meeting. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional information or questions for this panel. Thank you very much. Um, we have Joseph Adams. Is Joseph Adams here? You can come forward, signed up for information. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Joseph Adams. I'm an addiction medicine physician, and I'm uh, testifying on uh, a letter of uh, information on um, House Bill, Senate Bill 558 on behalf of 
the Maryland DC Society of Addiction Medicine and the Maryland Association for the Treatment of um, uh, Opioid Disorders. Uh, we are strongly in support of additional funding and grant programs for recovery residences, which are critical, but uh, we are concerned that there's an assumption that certification of recovery residences by the state indicates that uh, recovery residences uh, meet uh, basic standards of quality. And in one respect, uh, they often do not. And that is many or most certified recovery residences, as far as we can tell, uh, restrict access to the most important treatment for opioid use disorder, that is medication, uh, such as methadone or buprenorphine, which I abbreviate um, medication for OUD, medication for opioid use disorder, MOUD. Uh, they do that in a number of ways. They, they would um, impose arbitrary dose caps. I'm not sure how they you know, arrive at the particular dose they feel the patients should get, or they require mandatory tapering, or they have limited numbers of medication beds, or they just restrict access to medication outright. But medications for OUD are the first line gold standard life-saving treatment that most people with opioid use disorder uh, need. And uh, methadone and buprenorphine are the only treatments of any kind that reduce overdose and overdose death. Maintenance MOUD is part of recovery and is required by a great many people with opioid use disorder uh, long-term in some cases while they're in uh, recovery and beyond. So one of the greatest barriers to people um, achieving recovery or maintaining recovery is the stigma and misunderstanding and discrimination against medications for opioid use disorder and the people who need it. And I believe that this kind of uh, stigma is also one of the reasons that Maryland has been unable to um, really address the overdose epidemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for this witness? Nope. Thank you very much for your testimony. We're going to go to our virtual witnesses at this time. And starting with Tom Bond. Tom Bond going once, maybe stepped away from your computer. We'll go with Barbara Allen. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Barbara Allen, Executive Director of James Place. We're a nonprofit in Ellicott City. And I do the work that uh, we do the work we do because I've lost four people to substance use disorders. And uh, we support this, uh, this bill with amendments. Um, let me say that because of the work we do so closely with recovery houses, um, I completely support the idea of providing additional funding options for the operations, services, and various programs that will provide these for residents far beyond what uh, rent um, or grants or fundraisers, which they currently have to use these days. Um, with this in mind, we do support, but we do. I do ask for or recommend amendments in in this way. On page three of the bill, to the, the elimination of uh, items one through twenty seven, to take them out uh, for very specific reasons. And I'm going to refer a little bit back to the fiscal note, and I support the recommendation of the fiscal note no, uh, reducing the amount of headcount. Uh, from two, three additional staff to one. I believe there are many things within the current program that uh, Roger Hoff mentioned, the Maryland Certification of Recovery Housing, that need to be addressed, that are incomplete in the program itself, which in my opinion, working with recovery houses across the region is pretty weak. And I'd like to see any resources of that nature placed somewhere else, but not in this bill. So with that in mind, I once again say, I think there's a lot of need in services, operations, and programs that, that are non-clinical that these recovery houses offer to many, many people. Our, our scholarships go to people moving from treatment or incarceration into recovery housing. They don't have the funds from family or their own. So we're glad to get them in there. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, don't see any questions for you, so have a great afternoon, evening, I guess it is. We're going to turn to our next witness, who is Tiffany Scott. 
Good late evening, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Unfortunately, my camera is not in operation, but what I will state is I would like to um, please ask to vote in favor of Senate Bill 558 with amendments. I believe that the recovery um, residence grant program provides access to long-term recovery. The Maryland Peer Advisory Council, which is founded by me, I am the president, along with NCADD, supports the Senate Bill 58. 558 with amendments. Housing is a basic need, is a basic human need. Recovery residents serve as a critical component with the continuum of care of individuals and families and in seeking recovery. As a person with experience of recovery residences, I serve in two capacities. First, from a family perspective, my relative entered, which was my mother, into a recovery residence 22 years ago. And today she has 17 years in long-term recovery. Please take note of the gap. This gap is in relevance of the access, the need and access to, um, to long-term recovery. As a person, I witnessed the benefits and gaps to long-term recovery residents and housing, and now I understand why. The second is as an advocate with impact, the Maryland Peer Advisory Council and NCADD. As a person, as a peer recovery support specialist, which I am as myself, an advocate, individuals who engage in recovery to include multiple pathways of recovery, receive services, engage with peers, and then approved Maryland recovery residences are on a limited timeline. There was a lot of mention today around rent. Actually, when individuals enter, enter a Maryland recovery residence, they are paying program fees. And it's clear that these program fees do run out. And that's why a person exit a uh, recovery residence. The access for level two housing uh, is needed. However, we do ask for amendments. According to the Substance Use, um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Association, SAMHSA, Recovery housing is an intervention that is specifically designed to address the recovering person's need for safety and housing. And I would just ask for amendments to the bill to reduce uh, to strike line seven through 27, which limits this level two housing and provides support. NCADD is willing to work with, along with IMPACT, is willing to work with any, um, any local agency to include the department to ensure that individuals in recovery receive appropriate care and funding. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and we are sorry your camera didn't work in general. We like to have our virtual witnesses on screen, but you jumped right in there. So you got it in. So thank you very much for your testimony and colleagues that will finalize, complete the hearing on Senate Bill 558. We're going to turn to Senate Bill 449, which is health occupations, practice audiology definition, Senator Guile, and you can bring your panel forward. Madam Vice Chair, Vice Chair Klossmeyer, and, and fellow members of the Senate Finance Committee, for the record, this is Senator Don Guile, District 33, presenting SB 449. Uh, in response to a finalized FDA rule, this bill specifies that the definition of practice audiology includes the prescribing, ordering, selling, dispensing, or fitting of a hearing aid. For a bit of context, Congress directed the FBA to establish a category of over-the-counter hearing aids through regulatory rulemaking. FDA's final rule establishing the new category of hearing aids became effective on October 22, 2022. In conjunction with the new over-the-counter hearing aids, the FDA created a new category of prescription hearing aids that did not exist previously. Prior to October 2022, hearing aids were restricted devices, meaning they could only be sold on oral or written authorization by a licensed practitioner or under conditions specified by regulation. The final rule does not change the hearing aids being used, it only changes the conditions for sale. The intent of the law and the corresponding rule is to provide more accessibility and affordability to hearing aids. Under the new FDA regulation, a consumer may obtain a hearing aid through a prescription or order from an audiologist or hearing instrument specialist. However, the FDA left it up to the states to update their laws to ensure those practitioners have the authority to do so. SB 449 updates the practice of audiology definition to mirror the FDA's final rule language, including ordering and prescribing prescription hearing aids. 
Since the final rule was published, third-party commercial insurance payers have started referencing prescription hearing aids and their 2023 benefits. SB 449 will now ensure patients can use their insurance hearing aid benefits when purchasing prescription hearing aids. Uh, I have, uh, we've worked, you may have noticed there's uh, amendments. Um, I've submitted an amendment that responds to the stakeholder feedback and concerns that were raised in the hearing in the house, um, which you can review in the floor system. Uh, that those just kind of clarify some definitions. The parties have all come to an agreement on, um, on those amendments. I've also um, requested another amendment that is not um, on the floor system that just moves up the effective date to July 1st, 2023, so that um, patients can use these benefits sooner and all stakeholders are in agreement with that effective date change. Um, the FDA terminology must be codified to remove any ambiguity or misinformation to allow constituents to obtain prescription hearing aids from their provider, which this bill does. And for these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on SB 449. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, distinguished members of the committee, Gil Jen here on behalf of the Maryland Academy of Audiology. I want to personally thank uh, Senator Guile and her leadership and all those of you who co-sponsored the bill. She's absolutely correct in what we're doing here. We're trying to codify an FDA ruling that used two specific words that exist in the reprint. That is that the audiologists have the ability to order and prescribe this new classification of prescription hearing aids because those words did not exist in our current uh, audiology practice statute. Uh, I will tell you, when we went around with the original bill, though, I want everyone to know that every word that is in the bill, including the ones that were stricken, currently exists in other health occupation statutes, such as the optometrist and dozens of other state statutes. So in the guise of trying to reach an agreement here, we agreed to remove critical words, we think, and we may be back here next year, uh, specifically the ability to diagnose, treat, and manage, which is in the optometry statute. But we have made a huge leap here, allowing access to your constituents, to the audiologist, and getting prescriptive devices. So while we may have had a few decibels trimmed on this audiology bill, uh, we think we'll be back uh, loud and clear next year. And want to thank Senator Guile and also your new senator, Senator Kelly, who co-sponsored uh, or who sponsored the House bill. Thank you. We're going to share. Madam Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klossmeyer, and committee members. My name is Alicia Spore, and I am a licensed audiologist and small business owner in Howard County, and I'm currently the legislative chair for the Maryland Academy of Audiology, who represents more than 525 licensed audiologists in the state. You heard the history of over-the-counter hearing aids provided by Senator Guile. Just to reiterate, in October of 2022, the FDA released the final rule for OTC hearing aids to allow consumers age 18 years and older to purchase non-surgical air conduction hearing aids for perceived mild to moderate hearing loss without the involvement of a licensed professional. The FDA took additional action and created a new category of prescription hearing aids. Before the final rule, audiologists recommended, fit, sold, and dispensed what was termed restricted hearing aids. Those identical restrictive devices are now simply relabeled in a new category of prescription devices. Audiologists have been prescribing hearing aids to minors for years in accordance with the insurance statute. Prescribing and ordering the same restrictive hearing aids to individuals over the age of 18 does not introduce any new concerns that were not already addressed with minors. When passed with amendments, SB 449 will update and codify statute with the final rule with absolute unambiguous clarifying language to ensure it is not harder for your constituents to obtain prescription hearing aids than it was when the hearing aids were categorized as restrictive. Thank you for your time and consideration and to Senator Guile for sponsoring this important legislation. I ask for a favorable committee report on SB 449. Hi. 
Madam Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klossmeyer, and committee members. My name is Melissa Segev, and I am a second-generation audiologist and small business owner of one of the largest and oldest private practices in Maryland. MAA is pleased to work with Senator Guile to codify the recent FDA final rule language on OTC hearing aids with Maryland statute. My father was an audiologist for 40 years, and I have been practicing for 15. In that time, no one has confused our profession with ENT physicians because licensure law clearly states that we have to identify ourselves as doctors of audiology. As heard from Senator Guile, hearing aids were non-surgical restricted devices prior to October of 2022 and are now prescription hearing aids under the FDA final rule and must be dispensed by a licensed professional as governed by state law. In practice, prescription and restricted hearing aids are not different. The labeling has changed to comply with the new category, but the ordering and the dispensing of the device, the technical specifications, main components of the device, and intended use are unchanged. What was restricted hearing aids in September of 2022 is now renamed prescription hearing aids in October of 2022. As an audiologist, I followed my father's footsteps to improve quality of life for patients in the area with hearing and balance health care. The final rule caused pause with the new prescription hearing aid categories that affected my patient's ability to obtain devices from colleagues and myself. SB 449 would update the semantics of the audiology code to eliminate any ambiguity around the FDA's new hearing aid category and ensure that my patients and your constituents can choose the path for their improved hearing health care. With such a shortage of hearing care professionals since COVID, treating patients in a timely manner is more important than ever, and the passage of this bill will ensure that audiologists can continue to help patients. Thank you for your time and consideration, and to Senator Guile for supporting this legislation. I ask for a favorable committee report on SB 449. Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dr. Brianna Holton here on the behalf of the Maryland Academy of Audiology in support of Senate Bill 449. I've been a licensed practicing audiologist in Maryland for 25 years and co-own an audiology uh, private practice with 13 office locations in Maryland, including the Eastern Shore. For 25 years, I have been evaluating, diagnosing, and non-surgically treating auditory and vestibular conditions of the ear in addition to prescribing and ordering prescription hearing devices. This legislation will not change that. It's not a scope of practice issue. It simply updates and codifies the recent FDA OTC hearing aid language into Maryland statute. The FDA is the federal agency to ensure safety and efficacy. This legislation will not harm our patients and your constituents. As a daily provider of audiologic care, one of my duties is to verify benefits from third-party payers such as Blue Cross and Blue Shield. The 2023 hearing aid benefits from these payers already incorporate the FDA's final rule and use the terminology of prescription hearing aids. Senate Bill 449 legislation would ensure the audiology practice language is consistent with governmental agencies and third-party insurance payer systems therefore allowing patients to use their benefits and have coverage for the newly defined prescriptive hearing devices when ordered and prescribed by licensed audiologists in Maryland. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Senator Guile, for supporting our legislation. I ask for a favorable committee report on SB 449. All right. I don't see any questions from the committee. So for the sponsor and her panel, thank you all very much for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're going to call forward, let's see, there was one, two, two dance. I missed the last witness's name. It's been myself, Alicia Spohr, Melissa Segev, Brianna Bruno Holton, and I think virtually you might be looking at um, Shruti? Correct. Yes. Got you. Okay, so we'll we'll um, call forward our other in-person witnesses first. Um, Daniel Shattuck? Barbara Brocata? And Christine Sees? Sites? Very good. Okay. Very good. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Dan Shattuck here on behalf of the Maryland Society of Otolaryngology. 
in support with amendments on Senate Bill 449. Uh, otolaryngologists, for those of you who aren't familiar, are the physicians that specialize in diagnosing and treating the conditions of the ear, nose, and throat. Um, they are also uh, work hand in glove with the audiologist and providing hearing aids and hearing devices uh, for those who need it. Um, as the sponsor panel indicated, the bill uh, as amended in the House and as it's being conformed here in the Senate addressed a number of our concerns with the bill as it was introduced. Uh, the bill that you have before us does ensure that the hearing aids can continue to be made available to those who need them here in the state of Maryland. So therefore, we ask for a favorable report with those amendments. Um, MedCI, the State Medical Society, is in agreement with those amendments as well. So with that, we um, ask for the adoption of the amendments and favorable report on the bill. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Christine Seitz, and I'm the Manager of Government Affairs for the International Hearing Society. On behalf of the Hearing Society of Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Delaware, and the International Hearing Society, I'd like to thank the Chair, the Vice Chair, and Committee members for this opportunity to testify and submit comments to you on Senate Bill 449 in support with amendment. While we understand one intention of the bill is to add services to license audiologists' scope of practice, the bill also authorizes them to be able to prescribe and order hearing aids to align with the new FDA regulations to prescribe non-OTC devices, while failing to also include the same authorization to licensed hearing aid dispensers. Respectfully, the Maryland Society and IHS request support for the amendment to Senate Bill 44. 449 to add actions of prescribing and ordering the use of prescription hearing aids to licensed hearing aid dispensers' scope of practice. Despite their historical role as hearing aid providers, without this amendment, the passage of this bill could have an unintended consequence of restricting licensed hearing aid dispensers from being able to prescribe or order the use of non-over-the-counter hearing aids or prescription hearing aids, as they are now referred as excluding licensed hearing aid dispensers from prescribing and or ordering prescription hearing aids could drive up consumer costs due to the need for multiple healthcare appointments, putting many of Maryland's licensed hearing aid dispensers out of business, and it could create a barrier to 50% of hearing health care service points of access. The FDA provided states with an over-encounter guidance with its intentions is for the licensed hearing professionals to continue to dispense prescription hearing aids as they have historically done. It's for these reasons that we believe that the definition of hearing aid dispensers should be amended to include prescribing or ordering the use of prescription hearing aids, as this is consistent with the practice of which hearing aid dispensers have been authorized to perform for decades prior to the device being reclassified. The the association and IHS um, appreciate and uh, sorry, we thank the sponsor for championing this important piece of legislation and thank you for the opportunity to provide comments. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions for this panel, so we thank you for your testimony. Uh, we're going to turn to a virtual witness, Shruti Kolkarni. Good afternoon. Can you unmute? Yes, Thanks. can you guys hear me now? Yep. Thank you so much. Good evening, members of the Senate Finance Committee. <clears throat> My name is Shruti Kulkarni. I represent Miracle Year, a leading healthcare hearing aid provider with 18 offices in Maryland. Thank you for your time today. I ask the members of this committee to adopt the amendments approved by the House for HB 401, as Senator Guile mentioned, which will allow audiologists and hearing aid dispensers to order prescription hearing aids consistent with the guidance issued by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and the Maryland Department of Health. As you know, last year, FDA promulgated regulatory changes to increase access to hearing aids, including establishing over-the-counter hearing aids as a new category of medical devices. At the same time, FDA reclassified non-OTC hearing aids, that is traditional hearing aids that have been dispensed by audiologists and dispensers for decades from restricted devices to prescription devices. In other words, for the first time under the new FDA regulation, consumers may only obtain these newly classified hearing aids through a prescription or order from a state licensed practitioner. 
It is up to the states to define who that licensed practitioner is. However, FDA made it clear to the states that the same professionals who recommended selected fitted and dispense restricted hearing aids could continue to do so for prescription hearing aids. Many states are now beginning to update their licensure and dispensing laws to align with FDA's intent and provide clear and decisive authority for audiologists and dispensers to order these newly classified hearing aids. We do not anticipate any state to defer from FDA's guidance because doing so would severely damper, hamper access to prescription hearing aids and be contrary to the way these hearing aids have been dispensed for over the last 50 years. Therefore, we ask this committee to adopt the house reprint language so audiologists and dispensers can have the clear and decisive authority in Maryland to order hearing aids for their patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do not see any questions from the committee. We're impressed that you ended with exactly one second left. We thank you for your testimony and your participation in our process. And colleagues, that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 449. We'll now turn to Senate Bill 441, which is Maryland Medical Assistance Program Prescription Digital Therapeutics. Senator Lamb and your panel, please come forward. All right, can I ask uh, members of the sponsor panel to come forward? And I think we also do have some slides for this. If Ms. Kraft could flip that on um, for the members. Uh, we tried to shy away from slides, but I think for this um, uh, bill and, and the topic that we're talking about, this would be really instructive. Okay. Be really instructive for uh, members of the committee to be able to see what we're talking about because it is a novel um, uh, therapeutic. Thank you. And Senator, your virtual panelist is on the screen as well. Okay, great. Thanks. You want me to click? Okay. Thank you. Got it. All right. Well, good afternoon, members of the committee, uh, Chair Griffith, um, and other members of the Senate Finance Committee. For the record, Clarence Lamb, Senator District 12, here to present Senate Bill 441. Um, and so, um, uh, as you have heard from multiple different uh, sponsors and bills, we're in the midst of a healthcare workforce crisis, um, and there's ongoing efforts in the legislator to, legislature to try to address that. The Association of American Medical Colleges released data a couple of years ago that the U.S. could see a shortage of up to 139,000 physicians by 2033. That's just for physicians across all specialties, particularly in primary care, not even touching on the fact with nurses, nurse practitioners, and other providers as well. This will affect rural and low-income communities the most. There will be a lack of preventive care leading to the development of more chronic health conditions and to more emergency department visits that will place an even greater strain on our healthcare system. This will also coincide with um, our aging population that will have greater healthcare needs as more physicians are themselves retiring and ex exiting clinical practice from burnout and other uh, issues. For these reasons, uh, we believe that we need to be innovative about how we are delivering care. The emergence of digital therapeutics is helping to meet this need. Alongside research and other groundbreaking discoveries, healthcare treatments have tr um, advanced tremendously over the last 30 years, from biologics to gene therapies, and now in the age of ubiquitous digital technology to digital therapeutics. Um, digital therapeutics are products that are primarily they primarily use software to deliver evidence-based interventions to prevent, manage, or treat disease. It can be used to encourage healthy lifestyle changes, treat mental illnesses and substance use disorders, and increase medication compliance. This can be accomplished through apps with artificial intelligence, virtual reality headsets, smart pills, and more. The goal of digital therapeutics is to help cultivate a patient that is engaged, enabled, empowered, and equipped to fully participate in their care. The benefits of digital therapeutics are that they can be fully customized to fit the needs of the patient, and they can be used in the comfort and privacy of a patient's home at any time without constraints from workforce utilization and those issues that we touched on earlier. Sometimes digital therapeutics act as a supplement to care, but many times they provide care that couldn't be provided in any other way or simply does not exist. Therefore, digital therapeutics connect patients to care that may not otherwise be possible for them to receive. Another feature that distinguishes, distinguishes it from other forms of treatment is the relatively low cost without sacrificing outcomes. For example, the cash price of Endeavor RX, a game-based treatment for children with ADHD, is only $99. 
on the higher side, uh, reset O, an app aimed at uh, reset zero, an app name aimed at treating opioid use disorder costs um, $1,665. However, reset O has shown to reduce medical costs by $2,385, a net reduction of $700, $720 per patient, demonstrating that digital therapeutics can have uh, overall cost savings in the long term by decreasing hospital visits and um, and uh, clinic appointments as well. In this example, low-income groups would be barred from accessing Reset O without Medicaid coverage, even though individuals who live in poverty are at high risk for, of death from opioid overdose themselves. Therefore, it would be most beneficial for this sort of treatment for those who would not otherwise have access to it. I want to reiterate the point that digital therapeutics are evidence-based. They must be randomized controlled trials that have studied and proved their safety and efficacy, and they've been authorized and approved for use by FDA to be defined as a digital therapeutic. This separates digital therapeutics from umbrella terms such as digital health, which does not require clinical evidence. So this has been thoroughly FDA reviewed, vetted, and uh, approved or authorized. So uh, because this area is new, I want to um, use these slides to be able to touch on a few examples real quick. SOMRIST is a digital therapeutic recently authorized that now allows providers to prescribe to, uh, now available to providers to prescribe to adults with chronic insomnia. So this is something that, an app that could be prescribed to those who have insomnia. It provides cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, which is a psychological method that helps change unhelpful behaviors of thinking and is associated with insomnia. The app provides focused training lessons that the patient goes through and only requires an hour per week for six to nine weeks. Unlike sleeping pills, however, there are no side effects or dependency risks. Um, and so you can see examples of what some of the slides or some of the um, screens within the app would show. Um, we also have an example here of WellDoc, which is a digital coaching app that encourages the patient to make lifestyle changes. Uh, to help manage their chronic conditions. Simultaneously, it keeps their provider informed so that the provider can um, be uh, aware of their timely clinical decisions. One condition it can be used for is diabetes, and this app has been shown to reduce hemoglobin A1C levels, which is a marker of diabetes severity in users. Um, another example here is Wobot, which is a chatbot that serves as a mental health ally. It uses artificial intelligence to meaningfully engage with patients who have adolescent or postpartum depression, acknowledging a patient's emotions, encouraging their efforts, and offering advice and exercises that they can try, not related, related to chat GBT. Um, MedRhythms is um, something that is an app that uses music to improve mobility in patients who have neurological conditions like stroke, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. It attaches a sensor to the shoe of a patient that assesses their gait in real time, the algorithm then adjusts the music that's playing in the patient's headphones so that the person can walk to the beat of the song to help improve their quality of walking. So as you can see, digital therapeutics takes on many different forums and has broad applications. Um, and there is an amendment from the Psych Psychology Association asking that the bill be clarified to ensure that psychologists can also uh, prescribe digital therapeutics for their patients. We are supportive of that amendment. Overall, we believe this is a new and... Um, cutting edge field that offers a fantastic solution for providers to provide care that is convenient, low cost, requires few resources and has great potential. However, the biggest barrier here for it to be accessed by a large population is um, insurance coverage. And so what this bill does is require Medicaid, the state's Medicaid program to provide coverage for prescription digital therapeutics um, for anyone under the state Medicaid program. The Department of Health um, has expressed a concern of not being able to estimate the bill's fiscal impact, so we're open to implementing a pilot so that we can gain a better understanding of this. But we also believe that overall, it will save more money for the patients who can utilize this as a treatment regimen um, rather than the overall cost, which is um, uh, factored into that fiscal note. So with that, let me turn it over to other members of the panel. Happy to take any questions at the end. Uh, good evening, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Alami, and I am the Director of Government Affairs for the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. 
We are pleased to support Senate Bill 441, which is going to define digital therapeutics and um, reimburse for digital therapeutic products in the state Medicaid program. The Digital Therapeutics Alliance was created in 2017, and we have 100 plus member companies and our members are global. And um, our members are leaders and stakeholders who are engaged in evidence-driven advancement of digital therapeutics. As the leading international organization on DTX, thought leadership in education, DTA provider, patients, clinicians, payers, and policymakers, um, we are very excited to be supporting this bill and all the efforts that are taking place on other state legislatures as well. Digital therapeutics are transforming healthcare by increasing patient access to safe, effective therapies by extending clinicians' ability to care for patients and offering payers scalable and cost-effective interventions. There are currently multiple uh, digital therapeutic products that are FDA approved, um, which are prescribed by healthcare physicians and intended to supplement but not replace um, doctors or um, or pharmaceutical treatments that are necessary for the treatment of patients. Um, DTX products are HIPAA compliant, and when they have when they go through the FDA for their approval process, they have to go through a cybersecurity checklist, and they have to make sure that they're cybersecurity compliant. And with that, I would like to ask for a favorable, um, sub, you know, for a favorable, um, sorry, for us, uh, for favorable, for um, support on your bill. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Angie Gockenauer. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for Pair Therapeutics. Um, we are a commercial stage healthcare company uh, for prescription digital therapeutics, much like uh, Reset O that Senator Lamb mentioned. Uh, PDTs are prescribed by a licensed prescriber, either alone or in combination with drugs. Uh, very similar to pharmaceuticals, they have to go undergo rigorous clinical development via clinical trials designed to seek FDA authorization to safely and effectively treat disease. They are evidence-based therapeutic interventions that are driven by high-quality software programs to prevent, manage, and treat diseases. They are only available via consultation with a licensed healthcare professional. Uh, they are designed to expand access and convenience to patients. When you have it on your on, on an app on your phone or a digital therapeutic, you're able to access your therapy 24-7, 365. It doesn't matter if there is an office available or not. You can get what you need um, from, from that digital therapeutic. Um, to treat serious disease, it is imperative that treatments that you, patients use are recommended by a licensed provider to fit in with an existing care plan. Whether it is a pill, electronic device, or mobile app, treatment for serious disease must adhere to high standards as patients trust these products to improve their health outcomes. To add a PDT to uh, Medicaid, it's very similar to the model of a traditional pharmaceutical. And another thing that needs to be mentioned when we're discussing PDTs is that this adds that extra layer of accountability for patients, be it with their treatment plan or with a drug. And by adding a, an extra layer of accountability, they are going to um, continue to be in their treatment or to take their medication, which again, you know, lessens that financial burden on the healthcare system or even social factors. When they're staying engaged in treatment, be it a drug or a therapy, the patients will potentially stay out of the emergency room or have lower cases of inpatient stays. Thank you, and we support the bill. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for holding the hearing. Uh, my name is Taryn Powell. I'm the director of a substance use treatment program in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, we've had experience using digital therapeutics with our patients. Uh, we see the digital tools as harm reduction and as an added benefit to the people who need the support the most. I'm an advocate of the bill that's being discussed today for many reasons, but I will keep it short for the few minutes that we're allowed. Uh, the pandemic has shown us all many blind spots in our understanding, uh, but probably none more than that both addiction and mental health are diseases of isolation, whether it be treatment providers being un unable to access their patients or patients being unable to find treatment, the unfortunate results speak for themselves. According to the Vital Statistics Administration, 
uh, Howard County, Maryland, which I, I work in, uh, experienced a 2100% rise in fentanyl-related intoxication deaths between 2010 and 2020. Uh, I note the statistics because I often wonder how many uh, people needed these resources and did not know how to get the help. Uh, as a society, we have adopted uh, the use of virtual technologies as a resource for people in need of care. I see digital therapies prescribed by a physician and coupled with clinicians as an additional step in treating addictions like opioid use disorder or alcoholism. Finally, digital therapeutics are not intended to replace traditional counseling, but as we have experienced, they do provide avenues to increase engagement, ownership or self-help and recovery and decrease stigma. Thank you, and we are a supporter of the bill. Mr. Kim, you can proceed. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, good evening and thanks for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I'm Dr. Edward Kim, Chief Medical Officer of Orexo US, which uh, like PEAR also commercializes a digital therapeutic uh, that is prescription only for opiate use disorder. I'll focus my comments uh, on the role of digital therapeutics in the behavioral health and substance use area. Though I understand that SB 441 addresses all digital therapeutics uh, that are prescription only, which we fully support. So we start with how evidence-based psychotherapies work because many, if not most of the digital therapeutics that are currently available and approved by the FDA are based on these evidence-based psychotherapies like CBT. They essentially involve learning new skills and practices and behaviors. But like any new skill, practice is what contributes to the progress. And in fact, this practice can lead to changes in brain structure and functioning that are actually supported by a very large and growing body of scientific evidence. That's right, psychotherapy can actually change the brain. And this is how digital therapeutics can help and how SB441 can make this happen in Maryland. First, as you've heard, they're available 24 seven on demand to provide exercises in the moment for patients if they have some distress, but don't necessarily need to call a hotline or go to an emergency room. But more importantly, if we think about the long term, they're also available to reinforce the kinds of skills and practices and habits that are covered in, in live therapy sessions. They don't replace, but they reinforce and enhance. And as a result, that can help patients master the skills that they're learning, because it's really all about practice and reinforcement that can lead to outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there questions for the sponsor or the panel, the hybrid panel? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony, for hanging out with Senate Finance this afternoon and participating in our process. We're going to call forward Dan Martin, who signed up in favor of the bill, Daniel Shattuck, who signed up favorable with amendments. Good afternoon. Good after evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. <laughs> uh, Dan Martin with the Mental Health Association of Maryland here in support of Senate Bill 441. Uh, you've all been hearing it all session. Demand for mental health care is at an all-time high. At the same time, we're dealing with a challenging behavioral health workforce shortage, and digital mental health therapeutics can help. They provide an effective and scalable method for extending the reach of quality mental health care. Um, research, research has shown they're effective for treating PTSD and depression and anxiety with mild, moderate, and severe symptoms. Their efficiency for common mental health conditions is comparable to the standard face-to-face -face therapies, and they're shown to be effective across the lifespan span with a growing body of evidence um, showing effectiveness among children and adolescents as well as older adults. A recent forum of national and international experts representing Healthcare organizations, insurance companies and payers, employers, patients, researchers, policymakers, health economists, and more called for expanding access to and reimbursement for digital therapies. Um, and in addition to Mental Health Association of Maryland, I'm also here to voice support for Senate Bill 441 on behalf of Brain Futures, 
which is a national nonprofit based in Maryland that works to advance access to proven brain-based interventions. They couldn't be here today, but you should have their written testimony. And again, um, voicing support from that organization as well. And so just in closing, uh, an increasing demand for mental health care, coupled with a persistent behavioral health workforce shortage calls for new and innovative solutions. And for that reason, we support Senate Bill 441. Thank you very much. Good evening, Madam Chair. I'm Dan Shattuck, uh, the second of the back-to-back -back Dan's here. Um, here on behalf of the Maryland Psychological Association, we are here in support with amendments. Um, just real quick, prescription digital therapeutics, as we heard, are becoming a very helpful tool, and they're used by psychologists now uh, for many issues, including anxiety and depression. Uh, psychologists cannot prescribe, however, and when we were looking at the language of the bill, we dug into the FDA regulations and the Food and Drug Administration does make allowances for those providers who do not prescribe. Um, in fact, they allow for other medical professionals to issue an order or prescription of medical devices if the therapeutic activity using the device is within the scope of practice of the provider. So the FDA gives some wiggle room. So our language that we're proposing as an amendment would be added to um, number four and lines 13 of page two. And it would read that the prescription digital therapeutic can be dispensed only in accordance with a prescription or order pursuant to the requirements under 21 CFR 801.109 or any successor regulation. So we're tying it back to the FDA regulations just to allow um, psychologists to continue to use these technologies um, and therefore ask for a favorable amendment with our uh, favorable report on the bill with our amendment. Thank you very much. I see no questions. So we thank you for your testimony and are going to turn to Deborah Brocato. Good afternoon. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. I'm Deborah Bercato from Maryland Right to Life. And uh, without an amendment to exclude abortion funding on this bill, we do respectfully object to uh, Senate Bill 441. And listening to the testimony, I definitely can see that there are wonderful applications for digital, digital therapeutics, but the prescription of chemical abortion drugs is not one of them. In our rush to access, uh, increase access to healthcare, it seems like we're losing some of the quality. Um, digital therapeutics does not allow for the physician's physical examination that women and girls would need to determine gestational age. Also, a physician's physical examination is needed to determine if there is an ectopic pregnancy or some other non-viable pregnancy. So uh, with this in mind, we do ask you to add an amendment to exclude abortion funding so that we do not end up prescribing via telehealth the dangerous chemical abortion drugs. So we ask for uh, an unfavorable report on Senate Bill 441. Thank you again for your time today. And thank you for your testimony. I don't see any questions from the committee. So we're going to turn to a virtual witness, Paul Berman. Good afternoon, evening and you're signed up favorable with amendments. Uh, I am, thank you very much. Um, my name is Dr. Berman, Paul Berman. I am a psychologist. I'm in practice in Towson, also work part-time for the Maryland Psychological Association. Um, and Madam uh, Chair and Madam Vice Chair, members of the Senate Finance Committee, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to testify in support of um, Senate Bill 441. Um, uh, Dan Shattuck did um, uh, discuss the amendment that the Maryland Psychological Association um, is introducing, um, and I'm here in support um, of that amendment and testifying on behalf of the Maryland Psychological Association. But in addition to my work with the association, I also was director of an addictions education, evaluation, and treatment program for more than 20 years. Uh, we treated several thousand individuals over that time. Uh, the practitioners uh, included myself, a psychologist, other psychologists, social workers, and licensed uh, professional counselors. Um, in the event that this bill passes as written without the amendment, 
Our concern is that the um, patients, the clients that we work with would not have access to um, digital um, therapeutics. Uh, there also are a number of research studies that support the use of digital therapeutics. Almost all of these studies indicate that the use of digital therapeutics um, uh, increases retention and increases the likelihood that people will complete the program, thus increasing positive outcomes. For these reasons, um, we ask that you favorably uh, report on Senate Bill uh, 441, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your time and your testimony. There are no questions from the committee, so we hope you uh, have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 441. We'll now turn colleagues to Senate Bill 439, Advanced Practice Registered Nurse Compact, Senator Hayes. Good evening. Please bring your panel forward if you have one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Whoa, whoa, whoa. what's that? Good afternoon, Chair Griffith and members of the Senate Finance Committee. For the record, I'm Senator Antonio Hayes from the 40th District in Baltimore City. Senate Bill 439 seeks to commit Maryland to the Advanced Practice Nurses Compact. The Advanced Practice Registered Nurse Compact is an interstate agreement which allows for advanced practice registered nurses in the state of Maryland to have, excuse me, a multi-state license which will allow nurses to practice in other participating states. The compact will go into effect when seven states enact legislation to join a compact. Currently, three states have enacted such legislation, Delaware, North Dakota, and Utah. Several other states, Arizona, Hawaii, Kentucky, Montana, and New York have pending legislation this year to join a compact. Benefits of this compact include increasing access to APRN care, allowing APRNs to practice in person and virtually to patients throughout the country and allowing APRNs to cross state borders to help aid residents in the event of a natural disaster. Uh, given the late hour and knowing, um, you know, and Given a late hour and how many people come before us, out of curse, we, we, we reduced our panel dramatically. But there are a significant amount of organizations that support it. We ask that they not all come out of respect for the committee, but I'd like to acknowledge them and you'll see them in your bill file. But we have support from various groups, such as the Maryland. Uh, this is a, a modeling behavior, Madam Chair that you don't need to have everyone to come to the table. You could acknowledge who support the Save the Committee sometime. All right, I've spent enough time saying that, thank you. All right, uh, so we have support from the Maryland Academy of Advanced Practice Clinicians. They represent all four ARPNs. The Chesapeake Bay Affiliate of National Association of Clinic Nurse Specialists, Maryland Association of Nurse um, Anesthesia, Aesthetics, one, yeah, mm -hmm. anesthesias, uh, Maryland Organization of Nurse Leaders, Maryland Nurses Association, AARP Maryland, Maryland Hospital Association, Department of Defense, Amazon, Alliance of Connected Care, American Telemedicine Association, National Military Family Association, the National Rural Health Association, the Maryland Association of County Health Officials. And on my panel, I have today uh, Jason Weintraub, uh, Nicole, Elena, Pamela, and Robin Elliott with the Maryland Nurses Association. I ur urge a favorable report for Senate Bill 439. Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 439, which would enter Maryland into the APRN Compact. My name is Nicole Lovanos. I'm the Director of, the Nas Director of State Affairs at the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. The bill before you today, although lengthy, may look familiar because it's modeled after the Nurse Licensure Compact, which Maryland has been a member of for over 20 years. Like the Nurse Licensure Compact, this compact allows for APRNs to elect, should they choose, a multi-state license in their primary state of residence, and with that one license, be able to practice across state lines, both in person and electronically. 
advanced practice advanced nursing practice under the compact should also look familiar. Maryland scope of practice laws will continue to govern any advanced practice care patients in this state receive. APRNs in this state fought hard to have the to the ability to provide care to the top of their education and training, and patients will continue to have access to safe and quality APRN care here in Maryland. The need for the compact is there just as it was 20 years ago for the NLC. Healthcare is growing more mobile. Patients are turning to telehealth services for primary care, mental health, and other care more than ever. The Board of Nursing conducted a survey in, in 2022, last year, of APRNs asking how they felt about the compact and whether they supported it. The need is there. Over 70% practice across lines, APRNs practice across lines in the last 24 months. So the need for having a flexible licensure model is there. And over 94% of APRNs supported the APRN compact. Thank you for the opportunity. I urge support for this bill. Uh, good evening, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, members of the committee. For the record, Jason Weintraub here on behalf of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing in support of Senate Bill 439. One of the arguments we hear from opponents is that there's no rush to pass this bill or that it's only supported by outside organizations. Here are just a few of the groups and their reasons why Maryland needs to pass the compact this year. The Maryland Academy of Advanced Practice Clinicians, representing all four advanced practice registered nurse roles, it is imperative that Maryland is at the forefront of this licensure compact. The multi-state license is a voluntary choice and over 9,000 APRNs in Maryland deserve this multi-state privilege if they so choose. The Maryland Association of Nurse Anesthetists. This compact provides a more cost-efficient licensure framework because there's no need to obtain additional nurse licenses. The Maryland Hospital Association. Given our critical workforce shortage, Maryland's participation in this compact alleviates the strain on our current workforce and builds a pipeline of caregivers. The Department of Defense, this compact will assist Maryland military spouse nurses practicing both in and out of state while improving the quality of care in the old line state. AARP, this compact enhances and improves healthcare access in communities across Maryland, supporting patients and the nearly 730,000 family caregivers that help keep their loved ones safe and independent in the community. The time to pass the APRN compact in Maryland is now. I urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 439. Thank you. Members of the State Finance Committee, I am Dr. Elaine Crane, family nurse practitioner practicing in Maryland for over 20 years and the legislative co-chair of the Maryland Academy of Advanced Practice Clinicians, MAPSI. As stated, MAPSI is a statewide organization representing all four groups of advanced practice nurses, nurse practitioners who most of you probably have heard of before now, nurse midwives, nurse anesthetists, and clinical nurse specialists. MAPSI has over 3,000 members and followers who rely on us to represent them in discussions on legislation. MAPSI participated in the Maryland Nurses Association work group that had very productive conversations over the last several months this year and resulted in the support from all but one of the Maryland Nursing Associations. We have also been working with the Board of Nursing, whose surveys, as you just heard, in 21 and 22 found that 94% of advanced practice nurses support the compact, and over 1,400 of those were nurse practitioners. As a Maryland nurse practitioner, I know how beneficial a compact license will be. My patients move, or snowbirds, or our students, and as the state laws stand now, if my patients need me to fill prescriptions or treat an illness, I cannot do so unless I hold a license in whatever state they happen to be in. Moreover, this compact can help residents access life-saving services during natural disasters, weather emergencies, or a public health crisis. As the COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated, there is a need for nurses to travel across state lines. Remember, this is a voluntary license. No one has to have one. I have been testifying for nurses for many years, and it is rare we have an opportunity to create a choice when it comes to licensure. So this is a win for advanced practice nurses and maybe a win for you as legislators. I ask for a favorable report and thank you for your time. Thank you, Senator Hayes, for your generous sponsorship. And thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members for considering SB 439, Advanced Practice Registered Nurse Compact. 
The Chesapeake Bay affiliate of the National Association of Clinical Nurse Specialists is in support of the Maryland APRN Compact Bill. The proposed APRN Compact legislation currently requires a 2,800 hour practice requirement. This is a requirement, not a requirement to practice, but rather a requirement to practice across state lines. It is a uniform licensure requirement that must be met in order to add the multi-state privilege component to one's license. Approximately 90% of current Maryland APRN licenses would already meet the hour requirement upon initiation of the APRN compact. The Chesapeake Bay affiliate recognizes the added value of adopting an APRN compact and support making the APRN compact a reality in Maryland. The Chesapeake Bay affiliate board of directors is asking for a favorable report on SB 439. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, it's um, Pamela Moss. Hey, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committee um, on this really important bill. I think um, I had a, a question, you know, very familiar with compacts coming over from the former EHE committee, and um, particularly in light of the Dobbs decision last year, uh, have, you know, just given a lot of um, hesitation and pause to myself when it comes to compacts um, because of how uh, the implications that Dobbs has on compacts and folks who fall under this. And and it's not just Dobbs, but also with gender from care too, which I would know we have a bill coming up um, later this evening about that as well. So I guess my question to all of you is when it comes to the Dobbs decision and states now looking like they're moving in different directions when it comes to things like gender affirming care. How does this compact fit into all of that? And why should it not give us pause when it seems like different states are going in different directions in ways that could be painful to providers? Thank you for that question, Senator Lamb. Um, so we are really encouraged that states are looking at interstate compacts as a way to increase access to care. And this is too in light of the Dobbs decision. APRNs can provide advanced care and can reach more patients and more patients can come to Maryland to receive care that is protected under Maryland laws, but may be restricted elsewhere. And then APRNs can follow do follow up care and continuity of care with those patients when they return home. So we're encouraged that in states like New York, they are pushing this legislation in order to expand access, both via telehealth, but also um, in person care for patients traveling to the state. I understand. Oh, pardon. So, so I get all that, but just yep. to be clear, my, my question stems from the rep uh, reciprocity sure. yep. that's allowed for between these states. Where, if we have somebody joining this compact that's from a uh, a state that that is less um, open to providing abortion care, for example, and the provider is also uh, licensed under that state, the implications for that provider the APRN, uh, who is also licensed here, does that mean that their license is revoked because of the reciprocity going on with this compact? That's an important question. Um, thank you for, for bringing that up. And so the way that the compact works is, first of all, today, a practitioner is still subject, even under the compact, to the scope of practice laws in the state where the patient is located. A Maryland APRN with a multi-state license, should they practice and provide reproductive health care or any other care that is not within the scope of practice of the state where that patient is located, that state under the compact, just as they would with a single state license, has the authority to take action on the individual's privilege to practice in that state. That's what the um, the license, you have one license and a privilege to practice in all the other states. So that state, whether it be, let's just pick on Texas for a second. If it's Texas, Texas is able to take action up to revoking the individual's privilege to practice in Texas. But that does not mean that the state of Maryland where the individual holds a license will take reciprocal action against that individual's license. Could they so, temporarily lose there? Cause I know in like the board of physicians, there's a reciprocity where if somebody's license is revoked in a different state, all of a sudden Maryland has to conduct an investigation. In the meantime, their license is revoked pending the investigation. So that is not the case here. There is a transfer of significant investigatory information like there would be, and we hope that there would be communication among the member boards, but there's no immediate action taken just because an action was taken in another state. 
All right. Uh, and that's appreciate God. Pardon. That's the same way that the nurse licensure compact works with Mar which Maryland has been a part of for 20 years. Um, so that is the same model. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's helpful. I think as a general rule, the, the compacts have now given me a lot of Harper and post Dobbs. And so that, that's helpful in trying to understand that. Uh, last question pertains to certified um, uh, nurse specialists. So that we had a bill um, that I think was heard in this committee earlier, uh, allowing them to have prescribing authority. And this bill, um, I think, also does the same. My, my question, and this may be in the weeds that you may have to get back to me on, is if the other bill that we've had here in the committee on clinical nurse specialists and their prescribing authority does not pass, how would that work given that this bill um, seems to assume that that would? Yes, thank you for that question. So if the bill granting prescriptive authority for clinical nurse specialists would not pass, how the compact would operate, the compact only speaks to non-controlled substances. So it authorizes multi-state licensees to prescribe non-controlled substances, but for controlled substance prescribing, the individual must follow all of the laws in the state where the patient is located. So should it not pass, for example, and clinical nurse specialists in the state of Maryland do not have prescriptive authority for non for controlled substances, they clinical nurse specialists, whether on a multi-state license or a single state license, would not be able to prescribe to Maryland patients controlled substances. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Reedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to follow up on the Senator's line of questioning, if someone is coming here on a reciprocal license from another state, here we're allowing nurses to do, we just started allowing nurses to do um, perform abortions at any stage of pregnancy. What training do, does a nurse to coming from, say, I don't know, Virginia or Ohio, we'll stop picking on you guys like to pick on Texas. Let's not pick on Texas. Uh, what 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 training do they have to do to perform abortions or anything else we allow for nurses? And conversely, what training do our people have to do if there's something in another state that they can't do here? What what what's the training requirements? I can I could take that question as well. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so the APRN compact requires an APRN to meet the requirements in order to obtain a multi-state license. And included in that is being licensed in a role and population focus, um, which is how their education and certification is tailored. The scope of practice for a certified nurse midwife in Virginia may look different than it does in Maryland, but they have the education and training to perform the services up to the top of their scope. So the individuals coming from Virginia would be able to provide the services that Maryland allows for that individual role. Um, so they wouldn't be able to do what, you know, a nurse practitioner in psych mental health does just because they're an APRN. If they're a certified nurse midwife, they have a lane that they stay in within their scope of practice. They would be subject to that under the compact. Right. In the case of a state, though, that wipes out those lanes and doesn't have anything in the law that passed to create any new ones yeah. like we did last year, what, yeah. there's no additional training other than their normal training? Correct. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any additional questions for the sponsor or his panel? Okay, thank you all very much for your testimony and hanging out this very long day in <laughs> Senate Finance. We're going to call forward Karen Evans, Shirley Devaris, Shannon Seifert, Samantha Young. I know the sponsor mentioned Robin Elliott. Tammy Bresnahan and William Cress. He's eating dinner. Okay. Shouldn't we all be? Good evening. <laughs> you can get started when you're ready. Oh. Okay. Madam Chair and members of the Finance Committee, I'm Tammy Bresnahan. Um, we thank Senator Hayes, who also mentioned that ARP support it. You have my written testimony. We support wholeheartedly Senate Bill 439, and thank you very much for allowing us to stay and have dinner with you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and all the members of the Finance Committee for allowing my testimony today. My name is Shannon Seifert. I'm a certified registered nurse anesthetist residing in Laurel, Maryland. I served as a captain in the United States Army Nurse Corps before going to Georgetown University for my master's in nurse anesthesia. 
I'm a past president of the Maryland Association of Nurse Anesthetists, and today I want to endorse SB 439, which provides for the contract APRN license. Uh, nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, clinical nurse specialists, and CRNAs can all benefit from this change and in return provide quality, safe, and cost-effective care to Maryland patients. While serving as the system chief anesthetist for a large health system here in Maryland, I managed hundreds of CRNAs across nine hospitals and multiple surgery centers in Maryland and the District of Columbia. When COVID began to impact the region, many providers retired early or left practice entirely, leaving my system with many vacancies. We addressed this issue with locum tenens CRNAs, temporary providers that came to Maryland from out of state. Part of the credentialing process requires a Maryland state CRNA license, but the burden of maintaining licensure for existing providers and juggling this influx of new advanced practice clinicians left the Maryland BON swamped. Licensure was delayed for many, sometimes for months. Meanwhile, critical health services such as emergent surgery all the way to routine endoscopies were at risk for delays or cancellations for lack of providers. During COVID, we established 24-7 airway teams, critical care support staffing, and a COVID overflow hospital at the Washington Convention Center in D.C. I had to staff the field hospital in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers 24-7, but I could only use providers with a D.C. license. So a CRNA living six miles away in Tacoma Park, Maryland, couldn't help staff in D.C. This compact APRN agreement facilitates greater portability for providers across state lines and improves communications between states so that providers are always the best and brightest for Maryland patients. This will allow advanced practitioners to go where there is greatest need and not be limited by a state border. Regional threats like pandemics will happen again, and Maryland needs to be prepared. Senators of the Finance Committee, I strongly urge a favorable report on SB 439. Thank you. Good evening, um, Robin Elliott. I will try to be just one minute. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Nurses Association in full support of this compact. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, Maryland has been a very pro-compact state. Um, in, in fact, in the 2020 bill that passed to authorize all practitioners to do telehealth, that bill specifically encourages the governor to work across uh, state lines to encourage other states to join compacts. We have six compacts now. They've all worked um, quite well. And I'm sure you probably don't wanna have this bill hearing today, but just wanted to uh, uh, mention to Senator Lamb's question, there is a bill tomorrow, Senate Bill 859, that will be heard to address the issue of the impact of Dobbs on licensure, and that's being heard in JPR, and it's um, uh, you all, I believe, have a secondary assignment. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Madam Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Hayes, for sponsoring this bill. My name is Shirley DeBarris. I'm here to testify in support of the bill and ask for a favorable vote. Maryland, as has been mentioned, is in the Nurse Licensure Compact. That is for RNs and LPNs. And we were the first state to adopt and enact that compact. It's been hugely successful. We have 39 states in the new revised compact. It was revised in 2015. And 11 states right now have pending legislation to join that compact. This APR compact has the same safeguards in the revised nurse licensure compact basically functions the same way as the nurse licensure compact. The difference in this revised version of the APRN compact is a requirement that an APRN have 2,060 hours of practice before they get a compact license. Um, it is this provide provision for practice hours that has been a source of opposition to the compact. And I can understand that. In Maryland, we fought hard for the independent practice of our APRNs. We know they are qualified to begin practice after they graduate and pass the national certification exam. Not all states do. They're, they are moving in the direction of removing barriers to new practice for about, but about 30 states still have barriers of some kind for new APRN graduates. This bill realistically deals with this issue. We cannot wait for other states to take the same progressive attitude toward, toward APRN practice that Maryland has. Ideally, we would like an APR on compact without the practice hour requirement, but more importantly, we need right now 
the use, the ease of portability that the compact provides to allow our APRNs to provide health care across state lines. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chairs, and members of the um, Finance Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of Senate Bill 439. My name is Karen Evans, and I'm the Executive Director for the Maryland Board of Nursing. I just have two points. Um, the first is that having the APR in Compact is a smart regulatory tool that will free up the board's resources by eliminating the need to process licensure by endorsement for applications for APRN. That means they do not need to visit the board and this in lies will improve our workforce immediately. The second point I'd like to bring out is that the board already um, had approved an APRN advisory committee back in September of 2022. And that is in addition to the advisory committee, Maryland's commissioner will recommend to be formed by the compacts governing body. So I thank you again for allowing me to testify in favor of Senate Bill um, 439, and I urge the committee to submit a favorable report. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair and Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Senator Hayes, for sponsoring this bill. My name is Samantha Young. I'm certified as both a CNS and an NP in Maryland. I support passage of Senator Hayes' uh, Senate Bill 439, Advanced Practice Registered Nurse Compact. The compact benefits the public by improving continuity of care, increasing license portability for advanced practice registered nurses, and increasing access to APRN care. Now more than ever, this issue is of the utmost importance. Access to healthcare providers was a challenge prior to the COVID-19 pandemic that has now been magnified due to the high level of care required by community members. The COVID crisis showed us that our healthcare providers, particularly nurses and APRNs, need, needed portability and mobility to rush skilled personnel to the epicenters of the pandemic. SB 439 will enable better communication between state boards of nursing while also ensuring licensure requirements are standardized. The APRN Compact will allow APRNs to apply for multi-state license, which improves access to care, while also coordinating the exchange of information from state to state. The adoption of the APRN Compact will not only improve the APRN ability to practice across state lines, but will enhance the protection of the public by establishing a comprehensive licensure information system. I'm asking for a favorable report of SB 439. I urge you to act on our on our behalf and represent the dominant perspective of our profession at this crucial moment in healthcare. 94% of the APRNs who responded to the Maryland Board of Nursing Survey support this legislation. As a nurse practitioner and clinical nurse specialist, this bill is important to me, my patients, and my profession. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I don't see any questions for this panel from the committee. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you this evening <laughs> and hope you enjoy the rest of yours. All right, I'm going to call up the next panel. Nyla Russell, Sarah Peters, Nicole Lolo, Kathy Ware, and Marilyn Chesapeake Napnap. I don't... Okay, don't have a name for that one. Um, this panel is signed up in opposition to the bill. Good evening. Good evening. And Good you evening. can get started as soon as you're ready. Sure, thank you. Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, Sarah Peters here on behalf of the Nurse Practitioner Association of Maryland, representing over 800 active nurse practitioners. Listen, we support a compact. We want a compact. We don't want this compact. And let's be honest, if we could change a compact, we could change the three clauses or so we have problems with, then we'd be all on board, but we can't do that. Let me also clarify a few things. This bill will do nothing immediately. We have three states, North Dakota, Delaware, and Utah, who have passed this bill. It needs seven states. There is nothing that's gonna help the workforce shortage tomorrow if you pass this bill. Um, I also want to clarify again that we talk about Virginia, we've talked about DC, we've talked about Texas. There's not even pending legislation in those states, so those states are off the table as well when it comes to this compact. And I'll let the panel go through their concerns about the clauses we would love to fix. 
We've sat through a lot of stakeholder meetings. We tried to identify and identify a compromise. Again, we can't change the compact. So we'd welcome more conversation in the interim. How can we get to the same goal? Increase um, provider ac access to uh, to Marylanders and um, help the shortage. We love to continue to have that conversation. I think we can do things that is not this compact. But let me also elaborate on a concern we have, which is the Maryland Board of Nursing. They're resource strapped. We know it. You hear it. I get enough complaints in my email just about every day about um, providers unable to get their license renewed, to get new license. So for the sake of um, sharing some of those, I will share some of the concerns that have come across my radar. APRN Nurse One, I'm writing again on behalf of a new graduate who has been patiently waiting her CRNP. She has sent in all the necessary documents, presented herself to the Board, board of Nursing Office on two occasions, and follow up only to be told to be patient. Her university sent in transcripts three times as they expired while waiting for clearance. License is still pending. Her potential employer is anxiously awaiting notice. A new graduate has been on alert that the job will be given to someone else. I can go through a number of complaints for the sake of time. We can't for those reasons. I urge an unfavorable report. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this opportunity and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Nyla Russell. I'm a nurse practitioner. I am a Charles County resident. So hello, Senator Ellis, and also I'm the president of the Nurse Practitioner Association of Maryland. I am here to oppose the compact. As we've stated, nurse practitioners do not oppose a compact, but we oppose this version. Nurse practitioners are the largest group of advanced practice nurses in Maryland. And as such, we have worked with the stakeholders over the past eight months in good faith to review this compact. Unfortunately, the clarifying language that was addressed by the NCSBN is not a viable solution because it has no teeth in Maryland or nationally. In order to make an amendment, that's not possible. If you refer to page 28, lines 18 through 21, this cannot be amended by a single state. Therefore, we must accept or reject the compact in its entirety. This is a compact that is state legislation with national implications, and overwhelmingly national professional nursing organizations oppose this compact. It's not the same as the nursing license compact, the RN compact. This bill impacts scope of practice and has a transition to practice, which the nursing RN compact does not. It's already outdated. This version was adopted in 2020. That was before COVID changed the healthcare system. You all know how much healthcare has changed since 2020. So why are we imposing barriers to practice when we know that APRNs can improve practice without undue administrative and regulatory burden? It's not an access to care bill because in 21 years, the NCSBN has been unable to successfully adopt an APRN compact. It has been enacted zero times and it will not improve access to care in Maryland until seven states adopt the compact. In addition, the pipeline of people who could come into Maryland could also more easily leave Maryland if we have a compact with other states. We cannot rely on other states to fix our workforce issues and the 94% of APRNs who, um, 94% of APRNs who were surveyed, it is flawed data. The response rate was too low for three out of four APRN groups to be generalizable. So I please urge you for an unfavorable report. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Nicole Lalo, and I am a, the president-elect of the Nurse Practitioner Association of, of Maryland and a practicing nurse practitioner at a federal research center in Maryland. An interstate compact is intended to reduce practice barriers while expanding safe access to patient care. It should not impose restrictions as this current compact does, such as the arbitrary additional practice hours that you just heard about. Those practice hours are not based on any supportive evidence that would increase and improve safety. We want substantive changes, but this compact does not provide that. Instead of creating hurdles for APRNs, we, and, excuse me, um, it creates hurdles for APRNs instead of solving the workforce shortage that we have. The compact misses on a few key points. It does not set out to increase access as the opposition claims. The influx of APR licenses that would come in and that the Board of Nursing would have to process if this compact is adopted has substantial implications not only for APRNs, but for patients who are your constituents. Currently, there 
there are Maryland APRNs waiting up to eight months to receive their licenses. This compact has unintended consequences by taxing an already overstretched and under-resourced Board of Maryland Board of Nursing with longer wait times for licensure, which means fewer APRNs are in the field taking care of patients. Another issue that still has not been adequately addressed is the previous bill from 2022 did not include an APRN representative on its advisory commission. New codif uncodified language was added to this current compact that the states could recommend creating an advisory committee that to address pertinent APRN issues. As we know, merely hinting to the commission is not the same as actually having an APR and representative making practice related decisions. For this, I ask for an unfavorable report. Thank you. Good evening, members of the committee, chair, vice chair. My name is Kathy Ware. I'm a nurse practitioner living in Anne Arundel County. I recently retired from a specialty practice on the Eastern shore. I'm also a member of the medical Mar Maryland Medical Reserve Corps and I assisted in the pandemic response uh, <clears throat> I'm here uh, also a member of the Nurse Practitioner Associ of Mar Association of Maryland, and I uh, oppose the compact bill. As a nurse practitioner, I'm well aware of the serious, nursing the serious nursing workforce shortages in Maryland. This bill is not a viable solution to that shortage. As you've heard, and I'll be brief, the healthcare workforce shortages are a part of our daily lives as nurse practitioners. We see firsthand the detrimental effects lack of timely access to care has on the health care of the citizens and communities we serve. NPAM is committed to finding realistic solutions to the workforce issues, and I have provided our ideas as an organization to my um, submitted testimony. First among these is improving the efficiency of the Maryland Board of Nursing, as we've already discussed. We applaud your leadership in that regard. The bill language does not include APRN representation on the Interstate Commission, as Nicole mentioned. And it is essential that APRNs be involved in APRN practice. We are the experts in APRN practice. Um, as, as has been noted, we have worked in good faith with all of the proponents of this bill. We've worked with the National Council for years, um, uh, and we have been unable to come to consensus. We have actually offered our assistance in drafting language, um, and so far the, uh, that has been to no avail. Um, so as you've heard, uniform Uniform licensure, uniformity, license uniformity and portability across state lines for in-person and telehealth care is one feasible strategy to tackle the workforce shortages and to improve access to affordable care in Maryland. This is not the compact. I ask for an unfavorable report on SB 439. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Ward, and I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner practicing in Anne Arundel County, and I'm also the president of the Maryland chapter of the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners and will be testifying on their behalf. In alignment with our national statement, we do not support SB 439, this version of the APR and Compact. The inclusion of minimum practice hours conflicts with evidence that APRNs are prepared to safely enter practice after graduation from an accredited program and the passage of a national certification examination. In addition, this version does not include an APRN advisory committee. The perspectives and expertise of APRNs are essential to support and assist administrative entities who govern APRN practice regulation. We have also acted in good faith to express our concerns with this compact version at both the national and state level. Our national organization joined other groups in raising concerns to the National Council State Boards of Nursing's leadership. In addition, our Maryland chapter participated in the work group to address these concerns. We strongly support the concept and realize the urgent need for an APR and compact, but cannot support this version. We need a version of the APR and compact that includes all the necessary provisions to reduce healthcare costs, improve access to care, improve patient outcomes, and that will allow APRNs to practice to the fullest extent of their education and training. Thank you so much for testifying today, and I urge an unfavorable report. Thank you very much. And just to clarify, and thank you to the panel, were you the representative from Chesapeake? Nap, Nap, Nap. Nap. Yes, we have a like a, a an account that we submit because I'm the president. So we have a legislative team. Okay. Can I get your name again? Lindsay Ward. Lindsay Ward. Thank you very much. Senator Vital. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I guess I'm trying to figure out 
Do the nurse practitioners have a different position than nurses, RNs? I've, I've had a lot of opposition from nurse practitioners. I've had a lot are are you speaking about registered nurses? Yes. Uh, um, this does not affect registered nurses. All APR, all nurse practitioners, all APRNs are registered nurses first. And then we take advanced uh, education and training to become whatever APRN role we are practicing in. So I guess I'm confused because the first panel was in such support. And then this panel obviously is very much in opposition. What happens if we don't pass this? It, nothing. There is only three states. Ida, uh, Utah, North Dakota, Delaware, that it's passed it. There is no saying that any other states will pass it. Um, so nothing. Do you think there's any hope? You talked about working with National to try to do amendments. Do you think there's still hope that that work can, you know, have the results that you're looking for if we if we gave it time to work on the compact? So I would love the opportunity to amend it. Again, you can amend it. In fact, if you choose to amend it, the national group who has made of um, advocates who do not include an APRN gets it all have to come together to decide they want to amend it. And then each state legislature then has to introduce legislation to amend the bill. Well, what I was asking was, is, is there any hope that the, the work that you're doing with the national will result in some amendments? Of course, we remain hopeful that a a perhaps a fourth iteration, uh, as we've said, this has been 21 years in the in the in the making. Mm. We're very hopeful. We've we've offered to provide lang language. Um, so we want to continue working with the stakeholders, but we, you know, we're the large, our organization is the largest uh, group of nurse practitioners and we, uh, we cannot support this bill. It will be a step backward for our practice in Maryland. So it's been 21 years and it hasn't passed in seven states yet. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Light one out. Okay. Senator Hayes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the testimony. Sarah, you testified that um, DC, Virginia um, doesn't have pending legislation, but it is true that Arizona, Hawaii, Kentucky, Montana, and New York have pending legislation, correct? That is my understanding. I don't know okay. the definition that, of pending. That's it? That's it? Yes, I got you. not thank DC, you. Virginia. A couple right. other questions. The other thing, um, young lady, I think on the far right side, testified that the 280 hour practice hour requirement was arbitrary. Um, in Maryland, the 2,080 2, practice hour requirement for multi-state licenses runs concurrently with existing 18 month membership period that is required under Maryland law. Is that correct? No. I'm sorry, I was asking a young lady on the far right that made the statement that the number was arbitrary. No, um, the the practice hour, we currently don't need practice hours to enter our practice. As long as you... Um, is, there, is there, let me ask the question, I'm sorry, I might have confused you. Let me ask the question a different way. The 18-month mentorship period, okay. there's an 18-month mentorship period that's required by Maryland law, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that cons consistent or similar um, to the 2,080 hours? No, so that equals one year. Right. So if I tell you that according to the Board of Nursing's, over 90% of the Maryland APRNs would meet the 2,080-hour two, requirement for voluntary multi-state privilege once the compact is ratified, would you disagree with the uh, Board of Nursing on that? So the reason Just, why... That's that... no, it's, it's fine. Would you disagree with the nursing board that if this passed 90% of the 90% of people will qualify? No. Okay, all right, that's fine. Um, the, there was also a statement made that um, this would overburden uh, the, what is it, the nursing board, right? Administratively. But the Board of Nursing publicly stated that the workload will be reduced with uh, an APR in compact. How, I, I don't understand what greater authority is here from the nursing board itself to say that that it would actually reduce them because it would obviously if there was a compact in place it would eliminate some of the administrative um processes that that would that would be needed um wouldn't wouldn't you agree with the nursing board i would not agree okay that's fine i i figured you wouldn't um and the last question i would just say is um it was testified here today that uh, you know, it, it it wouldn't have any immediate impact. I think one person said 
that, you know, it won't even improve the workforce until seven members do it. But you do acknowledge that once seven members do it, I will say that Maryland has been a national um, leader in many cases. And so I would ask the committee to consider that, you know, we don't always have to follow other states. We've been a leader in many cases, including um, the National Nurse Licensing Compact from 1999. Would you agree? Was, was Maryland not a leader in 1999 on that? I'm not familiar about 1999. Oh, got you. Okay. So I would submit to the committee that yes. it was. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this panel? Thank you so much for your testimony you. and participating in the hearing. Thanks. We do have two virtual witnesses signed up in support of the bill. Christopher Arnold, good evening. <laughs> good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, my children are uh, running around the background here, but the Department of Defense is grateful for the opportunity to support the policy changes proposed in the APRNC, which addresses licensing issues affecting our uniformed service members and their families and has been enacted in three states in the first legislative session since it was finalized. I'm Christopher Arnold, Northeast uh, Region Liaison at the Department of Defense State Liaison Office. The First Lady has called military spouse licensure a national security imperative, key to both military readiness and retention. Pre-pandemic research showed unemployment rates for licensed military spouses range as high as 28%. The Fiscal Year 2020 National Defense Authorization Act requires the military departments to consider the quality of health care near bases, whether reciprocity of professional licenses are available for military families, and the Air Force's approved strategic basing criteria assesses factors such as membership in licensing compacts. Future Air Force basing decisions made with a consistent framework will ensure optimal conditions for service members and their families. This type of well-designed licensure regime can enhance public safety while expanding healthcare access in historically underserved communities. Senate Bill 439 is significant for the military community in that along with active duty military spouses receiving the benefit of compacts, active duty members, members of the reserve component, reserve component spouses, transitioning service members, and other veterans benefit from the mobility provided through compacts as Maryland APRNs stationed around the country will have their licenses recognized when transitioning in and out of other states. The Department of Defense encourages states to engage in immediate actions to fully implement military spouse licensing laws near-term actions to attain at least a baseline of getting a military spouse a license within 30 days and long-term solutions for instant reciprocity through compacts. How fast these actions and solutions can be approved and implemented is up to the states. As always, as liaison to the Northeast, I stand ready to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions from the committee. So thank you for your testimony. We're going to move to our final witness on the bill, Lynn Nash, good evening. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I just wanna say thank you all for your service. I have the greatest respect for you hanging in here until 7.01 on, uh, and you still have another bill to go. So my name is, for the, re for the record, I'm Captain Lynn Nash. I'm the Communications Director for the Maryland Military Co Coalition, and I'm a clinical nurse specialist. To continue Mr. Arnold's thoughts, 50% of military spouses are in some way, shape, or form healthcare. And here in Maryland, we have 390,000 veterans, 30,000 active duty service members, 18,000 uh, reservists and National Guard members. And in addition, there are 130,000 veteran households with children and another 60,000 reserve National Guard active duty dependents. They deserve access to care, especially in Southern Maryland, Western Maryland, and the Eastern Shore, where our needs are the greatest. The Maryland Military Coalition is a voluntary nonpartisan organization representing 19,000 uh, 19 organizations and 150,000 members. Um, we believe that it's time for Maryland to take the lead again and pass this bill. Uh, we ask for your um, favorable report. Thank you so much. And 
Thank you, Senator Hayes, for uh, bringing this bill up. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for your testimony. I don't see any questions from the committee, so enjoy your evening as we conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 439. We'll now turn to Senate Bill 376, Health Occupations, License Direct Entry Midwives, Previous Cesarean Section, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, esteemed members of the Senate Finance Committee. I'm Senator Arthur Ellis here to present Senate Bill 376. Purpose of this bill is to allow a licensed direct entry midwife to assume or take responsibility for a patient who had a previous cesarean section. So in summary, okay, Senate Bill 376 expands the scope of practice for licensed direct entry midwives in Maryland to include providing services to women who have had a previous cesarean section. Now, women would have only to be able to access these services and be on the following requirements. Have had only one prior C-section, had a low line transverse incision. And what does that mean? <laughs> a, on the lower part of the uterus from side to side. Um, it has been at least 18 months since they've had that prior C-section. Thank you. These limitations seem uh, serve to limit the legislation to allow patient, low risk patient population to use this service and bring the risk of uterine rupture to well below 1%. Under the, this bill, the licensed direct entry midwives would be required to consult with another healthcare pr practitioner, namely an obstetrician, a certified nurse midwife or a licensed certified midwife, all of which can already provide vaginal birth after C-section. So could I just say that in Maryland, there are two uh, levels of midwives. So you have a nurse midwives, of course they are RNs, and you have the direct, licensed direct entry midwives, which we're talking about right here. They are not RNs, but they are licensed they go through a training process and they already provide um, uh, birth assistance to moms. So this bill will also include a stringent informed consent requirement to ensure that patients are fully aware of any risk associated with an out of hospital vaginal birth after cesarean procedure and require licensed direct entry midwives to coordinate with key healthcare stakeholders to develop a transfer protocol in the event that there is an emergency. Transfer protocol, transportation to the emergency room hospital in case there is an emergency. So a little history with uh, licensed direct entry midwives. The bill that passed in 2015, which licensed direct entry midwives, this procedure was considered and a comprehensive study conducted by the Board of Nursing at the request of us, the General Assembly. Passing this bill would allow Maryland to join 28 other states, which allow similar licensees to provide these services and put Maryland women on par with patients in those states, including all of Maryland neighboring jurisdictions. Senate Bill 376, this bill is essential to expand the access to vaginal birth after cesarean, AKA VBAC. Offer these services for women throughout the state, including the more than 30% of women who have had a C-section, cesarean section, a, static, a statistic that is now even higher among women of color, women in rural areas, and women in other disproportionately impacted populations like the Amish and Orthodox Jewish communities. So if you look, colleagues, if in the uh, gallery, they have a large uh, representation from Amish community. A lot of them are my constituents in Charles County. 
and others in St. Mary's County in Southern Maryland. I've, uh, you know, I know a lot of these members, uh, uh, a lot of their family members are my friends, and uh, basically they're really believe that they're in, they're here in support of this bill, and uh, this bill will definitely help them in their practice. So after years of work, this bill is now supported by maternal health patients, home birth of midwives, nurse midwives, the Board of Nursing, and the Public Justice, Justice Center. I would also draw your attention to the letter of information from the Maryland Department of Health, which while acknowledging risk, state that with fully informed consent, the decision on healthcare provider and setting should be left up to women and their families. This bill have those safeguards in place. Finally, I will note that the crossfire bill in the house, which was heard uh, less than a week ago, passed through the committee with a unanimous vote and passed second reader on the full house floor earlier this morning. And so just uh, basically within the interest of time, I'll cut my testimony there and ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 376. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee, and thank you, Senator Ellis, for that introduction. Uh, Caitlin McDonough, on behalf of Maryland Families for Safe Birth and the Association of Independent Midwives of Maryland, in support of Senate Bill 376. As the Senator stated, Senate Bill 376 seeks to expand access to care for women who've had a prior C-section by permitting them to access additional out-of-hospital providers with a focus on the lowest risk patient population for these services. Uh, licensed direct entry midwives were initially licensed in 2015, as, as the Senator mentioned, and at that time it was contemplated that we would come back and expand their scope to include VBAC services because it's one of the main driving reasons that women seek this model of care. In 2021, at the request of the General Assembly, the Board of Nursing did conduct a study on this matter, and the legislation before you is essentially the result of that study with some additional amendments that we added in collaboration with the Maryland Hospitals Association last year. Um, uh, by passing this legislation, we would join our neighboring jurisdictions in allowing these services with similarly licensed providers. Uh, but and I think the Senator already mentioned the support we've received in the House, and we would seek similar support in this committee because for the women and the families who are going to testify after me, this is the most important bill to them that you'll hear this session because it goes directly to their patient autonomy and the most personal decisions they make about their bodies and for their families. Um, Ultimately, it's up to those individuals to decide where and how and with whom they seek birth care. So there's nothing this committee or the General Assembly can do to alter that. But what this committee can do is support them regardless of their choice by providing trained, licensed, regulated, and monitored healthcare professionals to support them in those choices. Senate Bill 376 does that, provides that support in an informed, transparent, and collaborative way, and I urge a favorable report. And we have a panel of providers and patients in support that can answer some of your technical questions. So thank you for seeing us late this evening. Um, Chair Griffith and members of the committee, um, my name is Nikki Williams. I am a Maryland LDEM. I'm a Virginia LM licensed midwife, and I'm also the president of the Association of Independent Midwives of Maryland. Um, I have been regularly attending home VBAC my entire birth work career. Um, my first birth as a doula 13 years ago was a home VBAC or HBAC, as you might hear. Um, I then regularly attended HBACs in my own midwifery training in Germany, in England, and in Virginia at a birth center. Um, what's different in those places is that they put human rights and parental choice above the potential discomfort of a care provider. Um, right now, I'm currently working with a joint CNM LDEM practice with stellar statistics that spans 12 years, and that includes 623 home births. We have a 5.8 cesarean rate. Um, we have had 64 VBACs that completed at home, and that's an 88% success rate. We have had six people transfer for safe, appropriate repeat C-section, thanks in part to the collaboration relationship that we have personally fostered with our two local hospitals. Um, because I have always been attending VBACs out of, out of hospital in some primary care or support capacity, I already have a robust informed choice document that helps clients make the choice that is right for them. 
Um, it's four pages long. Um, sometimes the right choice is actually a planned repeat C-section. Um, but we need to be clear that pregnancy after C-section also has its own risks. A planned C-section has risks. An emergency C-section has risks. And somebody's very first pregnancy has its own set of risks. Um, midwives excel at and take pride in helping clients understand their individual risk with their individual situation via the one-on-one -on -one care that we have the luxury of providing. And this is what keeps home birth safe. And we've also lost two VBAC attending CNMs in Maryland recently to retirement. And that leaves one in my local area that's currently attending. So I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Alexa Richardson. I'm a certified professional midwife and an attorney. I had an incredible empowered home birth with a Maryland midwife four months ago. Um, in the wake of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade, it's urgent for lawmakers to clearly endorse and protect people's right to make their own decisions about what happens to their own bodies when they're pregnant. This bill asks you to do just that. Many pregnant women have had a prior cesarean birth. By banning these women from choosing to birth with a licensed direct entry midwife, the current law violates their decision-making and bodily autonomy, plain and simple. The logic underlying the VBAC ban is the same logic that drives abortion bans, that once pregnant, a woman can no longer make decisions herself. There's a fetus present and that fetus demands the protection of the state, Pregnant women's bodies are no longer their own and their decisions and needs irrelevant. In this case, the state has clearly decided that birthing at home after a prior cesarean section may threaten the fetus, and thus it must ban women from making that choice. As is often the case when the state intervenes in the healthcare decisions of women, it's wrong about the risks and benefits of VBAC, which is a smart, healthy choice for many women. But regardless, in a state that proclaims itself a champion of reproductive choice, women should not have to beg, plead, and ask from their lawmakers for permission to make a crucial healthcare decision while pregnant. Women with past cesareans in Maryland are desperate for better access to care providers that will respect their decisions and have the skills to help them achieve a vaginal birth. Those providers are sitting right here in this room waiting to serve them. If you agree that Maryland pregnant women have a right and are best placed to make their own healthcare decisions, then I urge you to give a favorable report to SB 376. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jennifer Chafee and I am on the board of Maryland Families for Safe Birth which is a grassroots consumer-driven organization dedicated to improving access to evidence-based culturally sensitive maternity care for Maryland families. Our organization is in support of Senate Bill 376, which allows licensed direct entry midwives to care for clients who have had a prior cesarean section. Maryland Families for Safe Birth frequently gets inquiries from women seeking a VBAC who are struggling to find a qualified supportive provider. In 2015, the Maryland General Assembly passed a licensure bill. This was a huge step forward, but the restrictions on the scope of practice in that bill have made it more difficult for women with a prior cesarean birth to access their VBAC care. Senate Bill 376 expands the scope of direct entry midwives to include caring for women with a prior cesarean birth. Maryland's 33.7% cesarean rate is the 11th highest in the country, well above the Healthy People 2030 goal of 23.6% by the Department of Health and Human Services. Additionally, the cesarean rate among Black women in Maryland is significantly higher at 37.8%. The scope restriction, restriction on VBAC for direct entry midwives disproportionately affects families of color and further limits their care options in the setting of a maternity care system that delivers worse outcomes for Black families at baseline. Direct entry midwife attended VBAC is the standard of care in other states where direct entry midwives are licensed. Direct entry midwives are trained to attend VBAC births and they are trained to assess a birthing mother's risks relevant to VBAC. 
ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, states that VBAC is a safe and reasonable option for most women with a prior cesarean. In spite of this, families in Maryland continue to have difficulty finding a VBAC supportive provider in many birth settings. The Maryland VBAC rate remains low at only 16.5%. In contrast, direct entry midwives have VBAC success rates upwards of 85%. We ask that you support this bill. Thank you. Hi. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Meg Rizika, and I'm a mama. I am also a birth and postpartum doula, but above all else, I am a person and I like having choices. I like feeling empowered when I make these choices because I'm informed on the benefits and the risks of them. And that's exactly what I felt during my second labor. As a double cesarean mama, I went for the home birth after cesarean. I was surrounded by people who believed in me, people who helped me feel heard and seen and loved no matter what choices I made. My first birth was full of trauma and one that I look back on a lot. I didn't feel empowered or like I had choices or even what I knew what those choices were because they weren't normalized. Um, I really think that's all women want, the choice, the choice to be strong, to be seen for the trials they are going through, the choice to feel like what they are doing is okay, to understand what they are choosing, to choose a provider who helps them feel safe and advocated for. And that to me meant a home birth midwife for my labor. I had a CNM attend mine. And again, it was the love and support that helped me feel stable. As a doula, I witnessed so much mental instability surrounded by birth and postpartum. I really think it needs to change. The system, the ability to just labor with someone who makes you feel safe. I'm grateful for Western medicine, I am. And I understand that cesareans do save lives and that there are risks, I do. But I'm also so grateful for home birth midwives who are trained medical professionals and the connection they provide their clients. I believe that women are safe in the hands of midwives who are passionate about what they do. I believe that women should get the power to decide who they want attending their births and where they have their babies. Thank you so much. Honorable Senators, my name is Jail Mirage and I'm the founder of Nurture Up, a health tech platform dedicated to bridging the gap in maternal care in Maryland by allowing women to book, review, Book, review, book and review doulas, home birth midwives, car seat technicians, and more. I'm also a certified professional student midwife. I'm here today to advocate for the direct entry midwives in Maryland to be allowed to provide vaginal birth after cesarean, also known as VBAC, to women who choose home birth as an option for their birthing experience. Currently, Maryland laws prohibit direct entry midwives from attending VBACs at home, even though numerous other states in the United States allow it. For example, Oregon, where direct entry midwives are allowed to attend VBACs at home, the success rate is over 80%. In Washington state, where the practice is also permitted, the success rate is even higher at 87%. It is important to note that women of color are dis disproportionately affected by the restrictions of home births in Maryland. According to the, Center of the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, women of color are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications. In Maryland, women of color are also more likely to receive a C-section and followed by less likely to have a successful VBAC in the hospital. This further reinforces the need for direct entry midwives to be allowed to provide VBACs at home. Furthermore, women of color often feel unheard and unseen in the hospital setting, which leads to unnecessary C-sections and poor birth outcomes. Many of them now turning to alternative options like home births. By providing an informed choice for VBACs at home, direct entry midwives can empower women of color to take control of their birth experience and have a safe and successful birth. In conclusion, I urge you to consider the impact that allowing direct entry midwives to provide VBACs at home 
can have on the health and well being of women in Maryland. The success rate in other states demonstrate that this is a safe and effective option that should be made available to those who choose it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we heard from the whole panel, correct? All right, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. And, and you know, obviously very sympathetic to the um, experiences that you've had. Our, my partners had had a C-section as well for a 17-month-old, and um, it was it was challenging. So, you know, I recognize the evidence that um, the likelihood of having an issue with home uh, VBAC is fairly low, and also similar to the likelihood of having an issue in, in a hospital. You know, but I also see the argument that's there that by the time an issue arises potentially with a VBAC, it, it may be too late to, to do much because, you know, you have to transfer to a hospital, you have to wait for transport, et cetera. So the monitoring during a home birth is really, really important. Can you walk us through what that type of uh, maternal and fetal monitoring for a home birth might look like? And also, um, you know, what some of those initial signs that a midwife might come across to inform them that they need to really move to a tra transfer to a hospital setting for further care. Right, yes, so it's it's something that um, there are signs that kind of lead up to the main event, the uterine rupture that we're worried about, right? Um, we are monitoring the maternal vitals, that's um, the mom's heart rate um, and their temperature and their blood pressure. Um, we're monitoring the baby with the Doppler, the handheld thing, so there's no straps. Um, and that's at increments about every 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes. Um, with VBACs, we do tend to monitor more, 15 minutes or more, um, for as long as we can understand what the baby's heart is doing. Um, there are also other things like loss of station, where like if the baby's coming through the pelvis and then suddenly they're back up higher, that's a sign. Um, a stall in labor where the contractions just stop. That's an earlier sign. That's one of the first. Um, so there are there are some things that happen typically before the thing that we're all worried about, which is the actual uterine rupture. Um, so that's how we do it, and that's how they do it in the hospital as well, except for continuously. Um, so there's the continuous monitoring that you hear about, and then there's the intermittent monitoring, which is what we can do. Um, the studies have shown that. Um, continuous monitoring doesn't help outcomes. They haven't really studied outcomes in VBAC either. Um, it would make sense that if you heard a baby's heart rate start to drop or change early, then um, it would be appropriate to um, transfer. Um, and they have they have found that it's monitoring identifies a rupture faster, but it doesn't actually help the outcome at all. The outcomes are still going to be the same. And so last question that I have to touch on those outcomes, because it's it's really kind of a, a calculation of risk, right? And so the reason that state law currently doesn't allow VBACs to occur under the supervision of a midwife is because um, the risk for uterine rupture, as you cite, which uh, if a individual were to have a uterine rupture without prompt medical care, the likelihood is that that individual would die from just bleeding out, right? And so there's there's very re real risk there. Um, what would you as providers do to fully inform the patient of those risks, right? At the end of the day, you know, I think there was testimony here that this is a, an individual's choice, right? And so, uh, but it's also a risk that's involved in this. So what would you do to inform the patient of that risk? Right. So one of the things that we do when we're talking to somebody who wants to have a home birth with a cesarean section scar is, you know, we um, we talk about the risks that are inherent. Like now you have a scar on your uterus. You have a new set of risks. Here's what the risks look like in a home setting. Um, yes, we can't monitor your baby as closely as they would in the hospital. That's true. Um, there's also risks to a planned repeat C-section more for the baby than there is for the mom. Then you have the separate set of risks for a repeat C-section after a trial of labor. Um, those risks are higher for the mom and safer for the baby. And then, um, so like we, we would talk about that as 
the set of choices that they could make. And if we're saying like, yes, is it worth it to you to accept that we can't monitor the baby's every heartbeat um, versus going to the hospital and having your continuous monitoring there, which is not proven to improve outcomes and might hinder your chances at a home birth or a vaginal birth at all. So that's how the process looks. I mean, we, we shake it out everywhere. Like there are lots of people who are not candidates to have babies at home after a C-section. There's plenty. Um, sometimes it's like the distance from the hospital to their house. Sometimes it's, you know, what their recovery looked like after they had their first C-section. Um, it's a long and ongoing conversation throughout an entire prenatal care. All right. Well, and, and Senator, just to clarify to the beginning of your question, Maryland okay. state law does permit home back uh, or home VBACs. It just does not permit them with this particular provider. Nurse mid, all the, those types of nurse midwives right, and obstetricians okay. can do this. Got it. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions for this panel. So we thank you all very much for your testimony. Thank you for sharing your story and your experiences with us. Okay. Have a good evening. And, and Madam Chair, I, we definitely did lose some witnesses to some births, actually. So okay. I'll, I'll kind of well, there was some add-ons, so really I think it's balancing out. All yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'll call the names that we have on our list. Tova Brody. She's not. She's had to leave. Okay. <laughs> Patrick Terranova. Deidre Elva Peterson. Levi Stolfus. Hey, good evening. You can go ahead and get started. I was going to say ladies first if you like. Good evening. My name is Patrick Terranova. I'm a resident of Baltimore City, and I'm here to support my wife's right to choose a home birth after a cesarean or HBAC. A couple observations from our hospital experience during our first birth. First, the accommodations were not very accommodating. The food, was not delicious. The towels felt like sandpaper. And I had to sleep on a bench for two days. Not ideal when sleep is already a challenge with a newborn. Second, and more importantly, I didn't like how we were treated. The attending physician passive aggressively told us good luck when we said we just wanted to get comfortable and attempt a trial of labor. My wife was offered an unwanted prescription of highly addictive Percocet, not once, not twice, but three times. Our chart included antagonistic phrases like the patient finally agreed to a cesarean. It was clear we were viewed as an imposition, a pesky home birth transfer with a birth plan. Our hospital experience was traumatic and further cemented my wife's wish to pursue HBAC, which I fully support. She is the textbook definition of low risk. And as a doctor that specializes in maternal and pediatric care herself, She's smart enough to make her own decision. In Maryland, it is legal to attend your own HBAC unassisted. It's even legal for a psychiatrist to attend an HBAC. Yet somehow, even for the low risk, direct entry midwives cannot do the same. Most states already allow this, including California and Texas. And if Texas and California can agree on this, surely this is a no-brainer. Please give expecting parents like us the right to make our own informed healthcare decisions and to enjoy the comforts of home with a trained, supportive provider of our choosing. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of SB 376. My name is Deirdre Elvis Peterson. I live in Pikesville, and I'm a mother to five children ages 7 to 17. Looking back at my second birth, my C-section was necessary. I'm glad I experienced this hiccup in my birthing plans because otherwise I would not have known the shortcomings in our state. Following my son's birth, I was informed that because of our state's limitations on birthing centers, which is where we started out, they could not help me outside of a hospital setting should I continue to grow my family. My choice in where I birth was completely gone. I started to do some research. I found the risk of complications for vaginal birth after cesarean to be low. However, it was extremely difficult to find a care provider 
who supported my choice to birth the way I wanted. I did not want a repeat C-section, and as such, I needed a provider I could trust to support me in my pregnancy, labor, and birth. Trust and honesty are key. I had to go underground to plan my home birth. It sounds ridiculous. Um, this bill would mean that women in Maryland can finally give birth at home after a previous C-section without worry. Unlike me, they won't have to worry about their midwife being caught, fine, or for assisting in their home birth. Unlike me, they won't have to be nervous about calling the state to have a nurse come to their home and verify the birth. Unlike me, they won't have to be fearful in a time when they should be the most joyful. Birth is a stressful, wonderful, exciting, and uncertain time all at once. Women should be able to choose freely the type of birth, the environment, and the provider to help them at their most vulnerable state. I am grateful and happy to say I was able to find providers willing to take the risk for and with me to help in the three subsequent home births which followed my C-section almost 16 years ago. Choice in birth is vital to the health of our community. Please join us in supporting SB 376. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Levi Stolzfus, and I'm asked to read a letter from us, our community. Uh, reading in our Lord's name about the midwife's issue and want, wanting to be able to help. Mothers that had a previous C-section, it seems to be a higher risk of having just another C-section at a hospital and, and where midwives seem to have the knowledge to avoid that with helping to get the mothers ready for, with prenatal help and with herbs and exercise if needed. Nature given a chance to do its job is wonderful even if it's slow. Home atmosphere and home environment is where mom can relax and give nature its best chance. We had our two oldest in hospital with a doctor and had, pl had planned it that way because of midwife care not so available at that time. Doctor said no more than three C-sections, so the way looked dark for us to have more children. With the third one on the way, my wife met a midwife, a midwife lady from Pennsylvania that we knew, and she said, come to me, I will help you. So we did that and had our first VBAC baby, <clears throat> a nine pound, 12 ounce baby girl. And the next one also in Pennsylvania the same way. And eight more babies after that with no complications. At one time we had to get a letter made and signed that we deliver our baby outside of hospital at our own risk. To us, it seemed more risky to go to a hospital and maybe end up having another C-section. At home, the midwives give exercises to get it into position, and that should be done in the last three months. The mothers that are cared for and monitored with the midwife's experience, which is priceless, and they know our history. Previously, Mothers were having VBACs and all went well at home and we feel sorry for the future young parents if this can't be helped. And we appreciate our hospitals very much when needed, but could our VBAC women please have a choice in the matter? Sincerely from the Amish community, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I don't see any questions for this panel. So thank you all for participating in our process this afternoon. And uh, we're going to move to our next panel signed up to testify on the bill. It's Ann Burke, Pam Casemeyer, Jane Crink, Crinky. They are signed up in opposition to the bill. Good evening. You've been very patient. You can come on up and start when you're ready. Hi. Um, good evening, um, members of the committee, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. I know you're tired, so we'll be concise. Um, my name is Jane Krinke. I'm here on behalf of the Maryland Hospital Association and our 60 member hospitals and health systems and respectful opposition to Senate Bill 360, 376. 
Um, so first, I want to acknowledge the great work director and tree midwives do in the community for low risk women. We definitely support home births where it makes sense. In 2015, we worked with other stakeholders to create the pathway to licensure for direct entry midwives. Um, but one line in the sand was to not allow the VBAC within the scope of practice. And our concern with this is not about the provider, it's really the location. We don't feel anyone should be doing a VBAC at home given the significant risk. And Senator Lamb spoke to our primary concern. There's just not enough time to get you from your home to the operating room. Uh, we spoke with MIMS and they said on average on a good day, it'll be eight to 10 minutes before they can get to your house. And then thinking about from your house to wherever the nearest hospital is to the operating room. And there's just no time if you have a uterine rupture. The baby's probably dying and then the mother is probably dying as well. Um, there is a safe way to have a VBAC in the hospitals and a lot of our hospitals are encouraging it. Um, 30 out of the 32 birthing hospitals do allow for the trial of labor and a vaginal birth after cesarean. However, they require 24 access um, to anesthesiology, pediatricians, and ensuring an operating room is available. Um, if those resources aren't available, then they don't offer the service because of the risk. Uh, you'll hear later from the Maryland Patient Safety Center and from Dr. Burke, who's an obstetrician, just about what happens when a, your uterus ruptures. Um, it's just mere minutes matter. Um, and we we look forward to, we think it's important to collaborate with the midwife, direct entry midwives and look at data collection and how can we work together to do quality review and case reviews like happen in other states. Um, there's just so many unknowns um, and there's not a way to track outcomes. Um, so for all those reasons, we asked for an unfavorable report on Senate Bill 376. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Senator Ellis as the sponsor. My name is Ann Burke. I am a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. I have been in the practice of uh, obstetrics in Maryland for 34 years. I have personally attended over 3000 deliveries. And as the medical director of OBGYN for the largest birthing hospital in the state of Maryland, I have had direct line of sight on the clinical outcomes complications, and uh, safety for over 100,000 births. I believe that trials of labor after cesarean are most appropriately performed in a hospital location. I am fully supportive of trials of labor. I have personally managed trials of labor, and uh, I still believe that they are most appropriate in a hospital location. Now, you have heard that the risk for uterine rupture is uncommon. And I agree with that. It is uncommon, but it is also unpredictable. There is no risk stratification or risk modification that eliminates the risk of uterine rupture. It is unpredictable. It is also not preventable. There are uh, labor practices that may increase the risk of uterine rupture. There are not labor practices that eliminate the risk of uterine rupture. And when the uterus ruptures, there is a very serious and significant risk to the fetus. It is analogous to an unseat belted patient being ejected through the windshield of a car. The fetus is pushed through the uterine rupture into the abdominal cavity, and there are mere minutes before irreversible damage and or death occurs. For these reasons, I ask that you not support Senate Bill 376. I have loud anyhow, so... <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the committee, Pam Case Mara here on behalf of the Maryland chapter or Maryland section of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. I don't know if I could be any clearer than Dr. Burke just was. And on behalf of ACOG, it, it, it is about place, not person. It's not the midwife. It's the fact that be back at home, given what you just heard from Dr. Burke about the unreliability an unpredictability of a rupture and an inability to respond to a rupture at home in time to potentially save the mother and or baby is just not 
fathom, it, it, it's not doable. And we understand VBACs, there's a lot of them that are, su are successful. It's the unpredictability. So yes, many of them may have been successfully done at home, but to acknowledge, we'd be less than responsible to not say here, you allow this. And the first time there's unpredictability and there's a death to a fetus or a mother because it's at home and unpredictable, that's not okay. And so we understand the choice. We understand all of those issues, but we would be less than candid to say, this isn't the provider who's asking, it's the location related to the risk associated with VBAC. And, and it just, it, it doesn't work. And, um, and, it, and it's not just ACOG, there's NIH statements. There's some very, very good guidelines from NIH that says what sh you should have available if you're going to do a VBAC. And it, it's nothing that could be provided at home. And we can provide that information if you'd like. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll go to Senator Guile and then Senator Ellis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, panel, for your testimony. It, you mentioned that it's not so much the um, the person in as much as it's the the location, but we already allow certified nurse midwives to do VBACs mm -hmm. at home, do we not? They are allowed under state statute, yes. It, and so I assume you, you, you're opposed to that as, as, as well, even though we have already have that in our law, right? I feel that trial of labor after cesarean should, are most appropriately performed in the hospital. Okay, yes. regard, regardless of that. Okay, right. and then um, if if I may, just one more. I know we've got a lot, um, but I, I mean, we we've talked about how um, how rare this is, this uterine rupture is to actually occur, and there are a lot of really rare, um, very serious medical outcomes that could occur during the course of any any birth, right? Any va vaginal birth. And, and so, I mean, I, I'm just wondering if you compare like the risk of this, of a VBAC versus other very serious risks. And, and is it, is it, is it, uh, is it just, a, it sounds to me, even though you said it, it, it seems to me like it's just a, against the home birth, you know, idea of it versus, um, I mean, because really there, there are other things that could also occur at home and you transport to a hospital to have care, right? <clears throat> Maybe you can respond to that. Um, I think that my response to that would be there's a, a wide breadth of patient safety literature and research that says the highest risk processes are those that are uncommon, unpredictable, and emergent in nature. And the risk of uterine rupture fits all three of those as being a high risk condition. By definition, direct entry midwives are allowed to manage low-risk pregnancies. If a direct entry midwife wanted to manage a, a vaginal birth in a hospital location where there are the supportive um, personnel, equipment, and response available, to me, that would be a different situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Senator Ellis. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Guile asked my question at the end. So thank you. <laughs> Looky there. Senator Lamb has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, just the one question. And and I'm like I said, I'm sympathetic to the to the proponents of this. And and I think some of this stems from the fact that I I, I have a sense that sometimes providers oftentimes will push um individuals to have that second cesarean that it, it there's just a drive um because of where providers are coming from as well as from hospitals that are concerned about liability to kind of shunt people into a second cesarean so you know i was looking at the testimony here and noticed that the secretary of health sent a letter that said in part um with when provided with full informed consent the decision of the place and the provider of birth should be left to the birthing parent and family. Um, if the committee were to move forward with this bill, do you have any suggestions on um, that that part about ensuring informed consent and how that can be refined just to be able to make sure that those individuals who choose this um, would know what they're getting into? 
That's a, yeah. um, we would still firmly oppose this, um, but we know that other states, like in California, they require ACOG guidelines to be provided to the patient. Um, but still, it it's I don't know if you could ever fully realize the risk. Um, individual cases might be okay, but if you're looking at the population level, you're creating statewide policy, you have to look at that 1% number and how unpredictable it is. So I don't know if you could ever fully realize the risk that you would experience just because of the unpredictable nature of the, the rupture. I don't know if you uh, add. Uh, and I agree if I could add um, maybe a slightly uh, tangential um, comment. I think there has been a lot of anecdotal emotion regarding the medical profession or obstetricians with a feeling that we're not uh, supportive of vaginal births after C-section or don't give women an adequate opportunity in those uh, trials of labor. So I did want to just interject a little bit of um, reality from my personal experience in the observation of those uh, 100,000 deliveries. And I can tell you that for calendar year 2021, in the largest birthing hospital in Maryland, there were 276 successful vaginal births after cesarean. The um, uh, vaginal uh, birth rate as a percent of total prior C-sections was 16 to 17%. But remember that hospitals do not have the uh, opportunity to uh, select their patient population. Hospitals do provide care to all risk level patients. And therefore the statements regarding the success rate is higher out of the hospital versus in the hospital. There is legitimacy to that, but they are different patient populations. Hospitals do not have the opportunity to select only low risk patients. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Back to Senator Ellis for a final go. Yeah, really quick uh, in response to Senator Lamb's question. So this bill was went to the House Committee, and there was an amendment that requires a patient informed consent to include information about alternatives to home birth after cesarean section. So that was uh, addressed in um, the House, in which we will introduce similar amendments to this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. I see no further questions for this panel, no questions from the committee. Thank you very much for your patience and staying with us this afternoon. We appreciate it. We do have some virtual witnesses signed up on the bill, so we'll go to them now. Thank, We're you. Going, thank you. We're going to call Lydia King. Hi Lydia. there, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, so good, good evening, everyone. My name is Lydia King. I am a first time mom as of two weeks ago, and I am testifying today in favor of Senate Bill 376, as this will directly pave how I expand my family in the future. After several years of infertility, infertility my husband and I conceived our baby girl, Lainey J, via IVF. We chose midwifery care with a goal of an unmedicated home birth. This is Lainey's story. I had a very healthy pregnancy without issue, and at 41 weeks and five days, I started contractions, laboring at home for 33 hours. Although 33 hours, this was truly a magical time for me. At 33 hours, I arrived at 42 weeks gestation, which required a hospital transfer as a result. Our midwife eloquently coordinated that transfer to the hospital, and when my husband and I arrived, the hospital was fully prepared for our arrival. As we headed to the hospital, my husband began to cry. He began to mourn the end of a dream home birth that we had so hard, we worked so hard for. A few hours later, we learned that an emergency C-section was needed, and again, my husband began to cry. He now mourned the loss of future opportunity for any home births in the future. During the C-section, I remember the moment I first heard my baby cry. She hadn't been removed from my stomach yet, and then I felt the, the doctor pulling her out. As requested, my husband was asked to announce the sex of the baby, 
and he noted the arrival of her sweet baby girl and said, wait until you see her, Lydia. She's beautiful. I, highlight, I share Lainey's story because this highlights the importance of having a choice while also recognizing when hospital intervention is needed. We did deliver our baby safely. The current limitation of... You can finish your sentence. Okay. <laughs> the current limitation when VBACs at home impacts not only the mother, but family, the family units as a whole. Thank you in advance for your consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. I don't see any questions from the committee. So thank you for your patience and, and enjoy your evening. Thank We're you. Going Take care. To, thanks. We're going to move to the next witness, Kira Brandon. Good evening. Sorry, had to unmute. Um, good afternoon, Chair Griffith and members of the committee. My name is Brandon. I'm a practicing physician here in Maryland and the president of Maryland Families for Safe Birth. I'm testifying today in support of Senate Bill 376. I'm also the mother of five daughters, uh, four of whom were born at home uh, and were VBACs. Uh, my first child was a cesarean birth. My husband, who is also a physician, and I carefully weighed the risks and the benefits um, and made the informed decision to birth subsequent children at home with a direct entry midwife. Um, we knew we wanted several more children and wanted to avoid the significant risks that come with repeat cesareans. Uh, direct entry midwives have higher successful VBAC rates than other types of maternity care providers. And it was important to me to be with a provider that would give me the highest chance of a successful VBAC. Um, my second child was born in Texas, where direct entry midwives have been licensed for decades and routinely attend VBAC births. Um, my third, fourth, and fifth children were born here in Maryland. Uh, it was very difficult for me to find a direct entry midwife. At first, it was because they weren't licensed in the state. This was back in 2013. Um, and then after licensure, it was because of this unnecessary restriction on their scope of practice regarding VBAC. What this restriction means for me, a physician married to a physician, is that I'm not allowed to choose my care provider or really where I give birth since direct entry midwives attend the vast majority of home births in Maryland. I'm asking for your support of Senate Bill 376. Families in Maryland deserve the right to weigh all of the risks and the benefits of the various birth providers and locations and make their own decisions with true informed consent. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I don't see any questions from the committee. Thank you so much for being a part of our process this evening. We're going to turn to Elizabeth Reiner. Good evening. Good evening. Who knew that senators and midwives keep the same crazy hours? <laughs> My name is Elizabeth Reiner. I am a home birth mother, CPM, LDEM, secretary of the Association of Independent Midwives of Maryland and former vice chair of the Maryland Direct Entry Midwifery Advisory Committee. I have been attending births for 20 years and I have been a CPM for 11. Today, I am celebrating the unanimous support our bill received in the HDO committee after four years of careful deliberation and inviting you to support this small but deeply impactful bill. Living in Frederick County, I already attend successfully and safely attend home VBACs in all of our surrounding states, Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and DC, where it is permitted without restriction. It is within our scope of practice, especially with the restrictions in our current statute regs and the additional ones this bill creates. CPM training is specifically focused on vigilantly assessing risks at every stage of pregnancy and birth, then consulting and transferring care to doctors in a hospital when necessary. Because I am an expert in normal healthy birth and only provide one-on-one -on -one care of unmedicated clients whom I know very well, any deviations from normal become obvious quickly and we initially transfer as planned in our prenatal care. Our opposition has stated that it is not the credential but the location, but our CNM colleagues currently attend VBAC, so we already have precedents for out-of-hospital midwives attending home, birth, home VBAC in Maryland. Home birth CNMs have no more access to an ambulance or an OR than LDMs do. There are not enough home birth CN CNMs to meet the vast need throughout our state 
most especially in our rural areas and for families of color who have been disproportionately affected by the high number of C-sections. On a daily basis, I turn away families seeking my services, many of whom have already had one successful lead back. This is about equitable access to healthcare and one small solution for the black maternal and infant health crisis. This is about trusting families to make informed choices for their own bodies because all birth comes with inherent risks, including the very dangerous risks that accompany the high rates of repeat cesarean surgeries in our hospitals. Placenta problems, hemorrhage, infections, scar tissue adhesions, damage to other organs, hysterectomy, and more. I'm happy to answer any remaining clinical questions that you may have, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee, so please enjoy your evening. Thank you we're, so much. We're going to turn to Kendra O'Hora. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Hello, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am Kendra O'Hora, and I'd like to share my story. It feels so redemptive. That's what I said after birthing my second son via VBAC in the comfort of my home this past New Year's Eve. In 2021, while pregnant with my first child, I was working with Marilyn licensed direct entry midwife. In the last weeks of my pregnancy with my baby in the breech position, my midwife was forced to terminate care under Maryland's regulations. Unable to find another provider local to me, I was forced to travel to a neighboring state. After laboring 24 hours and a baby who wouldn't drop, the birth center and I chose to transfer to the hospital for more choices. As a result, I had to have what was deemed as an emergency C-section, even though me and baby were fine by all measures. At the hospital, my written birth plan was not respected and my husband experienced extensive secondary birth trauma. But I'm not just a mom who was finally able to get her V back. I'm also Dr. Kendra O'Hora, a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist and owner of a mental health practice in Hartford County, Maryland, where I employ nine providers, two of which are perinatal mental health experts working extensively with birth trauma. Through my own two birth experiences in the last two years, through supervising my team, and through working clinically with women on their postpartum journey, I've seen firsthand the gaps in care in Maryland. Senate Bill 376 is not just a lofty bill, it's necessary. I could go on and on about the statistics of the mental health prevention associated with women getting to choose their care team and birthing in the way that best suits them. And that data is important. But to me, more important is my personal testimony, reminding you of the impact of the woman birthing vaginally after cesarean. It feels so redemptive. I'm here today physically healthy, mentally well, and so strong because I got my VBAC. It's time that my licensed direct entry midwife be able to deliver my next baby and that women all over Maryland be supported in their birth wishes of having a VBAC by these competent and professional care providers. I've got little ones in the background ready for bedtime. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's some of us up here ready for bedtime as well. But we thank you so much for your testimony. And uh, there are no questions from the committee. So colleagues, we're going to turn to our final witness on the bill, Adrian Burgess, who is signed up in opposition to the bill. Good evening. Good evening, um, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and the committee. My name is Dr. Adrian Burgess. I'm the Director of Perinatal and Neonatal Quality and Patient Safety at the Maryland Patient Safety Center. I'm a registered nurse with a PhD in nursing with over 25 years of experience in maternal child health. The Maryland Patient Safety Center values and support the role of direct entry midwives in the care they provide low-risk birthing people, and I very much appreciate each patient's testimony. Today, I'm testifying in opposition to Senate Bill 0376. You have my written testimony, so I will summarize. Having a previous cesarean section is considered a high-risk factor warranting close surveillance of mom and baby and access to immediate surgical delivery should complications arise, specifically uterine rupture, which can result in catastrophic intra-abdominal hemorrhage and thus maternal and neonatal death. Because these complications are often sudden, unpredictable in this subset of patients, we know that the American Eco College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American Academy of Pediatrics list previous C-section as an absolute contraindication to home birth. Per the data from the Maryland Hospital Association, most, most birthing hospitals in Maryland offer VBAC. And I believe those who do, do not, don't because there's not 24-7 in-house availability of obstetric surgeons, anesthesia, and neonatal care. Subsequently, the safety standard to which birthing hospitals hold themselves can never be achieved in the home setting, regardless of the protocols embedded or the provider performing the delivery. 
If you have been provided the research, you have been provided the research on risk associated with trial of labor. And although the incidence of poor outcome is low, when it occurs, the outcome is devastating and it results in something we would call a never event, a maternal or neonatal death. By licensing direct entry midwives to perform planned VBAC at home, we're endorsing a birth environment that's not safe for this population. The Maryland Patient Safety Center supports safe and respectful environments for birth. So instead supporting this bill, we recommend that policies be developed which support VBAC in the hospital setting and resources be allocated to hospitals to ensure birthing people receive the respectful maternity care they deserve in a setting that's most safe and aligns with their high risk profile. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I ask for an unfavorable report. Thank you very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee. We appreciate your patience and waiting for an opportunity to participate. Uh, that will uh, complete our hearing on Senate Bill 376. Colleagues, we're going to turn to the final bill on our agenda this evening. That is Senate Bill 460, Maryland Medical Assistance Program, Gender Affirming Treatment, Trans Health Equity Act, Senator Washington. And if you have a panel, please, please bring them forward. Let me just say to all of the witnesses, you all have been very patient. You've stayed a long time to wait for an opportunity to be heard. Our members have been here uh, seven hours without, without much break, except for to go testify on bills and other committees. So you should feel free to just say, I love this bill. And that would be ex an acceptable, acceptable testimony. That being said, we'll turn it over to Senator Washington to begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and, and thank you, uh, Finance Committee. Uh, you are not alone. We are downstairs in uh, energy, um, uh, education, energy, and the environment, uh, listening to um, Tier 1, a removal of incineration and biomass. So we have about 30, 30 folks uh, going through that as well. So we are together. Um, uh, good evening, Senator Mary Washington. I am... Um, Happy to present to you uh, uh, Senate Bill 460, uh, the Maryland um, Medical Assistance Program Gender Affirming Treatment, the Trans Health Equity Act. Good evening, colleagues. Um, as you know, uh, SB 460 addresses a critical gap in the health care of transgendered Marylanders by ensuring that medically necessary gender affirming procedures and services are covered by Medicaid. Medicaid coverage currently fails to adequately cover gender affirming care for trans Marylanders. Gender affirming care is medically necessary as demonstrated by peer reviewed research and is overwhelmingly supported by medical advocacy, medical and advocacy organizations. Colleagues, this legislation ensures simply that Maryland will join 26 states, one territory and Washington DC that has policies that do not exclude healthcare related gender transition for gender for transgendered people. These states include Virginia, Alaska, Colorado, Oregon, Massachusetts, Connecticut, California, New York, Washington state, and as I said before, DC. Madam Chair, this committee and the Senate passed this measure um, last year uh, and it continues to be supported uh, by more than 30 organizations. Uh, as Again, as you know, for those who weren't here last year, uh, the Medicaid system is responsible for the health and welfare of about 6,000 Marylanders who identify as transgender. As I said before, this act is to ensure that Medicaid offers comprehensive health care coverage to Marylanders and all recipients and in line with internationally recognized standards. So I have four more point, four main points. Um, this is about equity. Transgendered people suffer from significant discrimination, abuse, harass, and health impacts. Research has shown that the health of transgender people is significantly improved by gender affirming care. Safety. Over access to gender affirming care is especially important for transgendered Black Marylanders who are disproportionately suffer discrimination. 
Over 53% of Black trans people have experienced sexual assault. 42% of trans people have experienced some form of homelessness. And again, report uh, an extremely hostile uh, environment in terms of not having, uh, being consistent as they're perceived, being able to be perceived as who they are. Um, I have a medical reason uh, that every major medical association uh, nearly every medical major medical association has endorsed this care as medically necessary. That would be hormone therapy, surgery, hair removal, voice therapy, and primary and reproductive health care. And then finally, my final reason uh, is that it makes us in line with federal regulation. The federal government considers this coverage as, quote, an essential health benefit. And it is protected under Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. The bill, uh, this bill tracks very closely <clears throat> to the amended version of last year's bill. Um, it substitutes a lot of very specific language around alterations to it for voice and instead just uses that. It also provides, uh, I also, there are uh, a few amendments that are before you. Um, to the existing bill that um, affirm that we're going to get the consent uh, from healthcare providers uh, who are offering uh, gender affirming treatment in a managed care organizations to be um, part of the public record. In other words, there are a number of requirements that we have uh, for healthcare providers uh, in terms of making sure that there's a list available so that our community can be assured that, you know, have some confidence that the provider that they're, that they're going to uh, is, is receptive to their and understanding of their specific uh, needs. Um, we're also sub, uh, subtracting also that um, the offering gender affirmative treatment to the program recipients, we're, sub, we're striking each and saying they, again, in each of those portions of the bill where there's a specific requirement on the providers to be known, all right, or to consent or to participate, we are allowing in our amendments uh, that there be, that that be optional. Um, this is my panel. Uh, I have Sam Williamson uh, with Disability Rights Maryland, Dr. Helene Hadian, she's a medical provider. Uh, from Johns Hopkins University, uh, Jamie Grace, uh, Free State Justice, Margo Quinlan, uh, Mental Health Association, and Ashley Black, uh, Medicaid Expert or Public Justice Center. Uh, after they present, I'll be here and welcome any questions. And I know that some of the people who originally uh, signed up to speak orally, uh, a few of them are would like just to be recognized as saying me too. So I know there's a couple of them, but there are others who want to be heard. So if could I, could we allow, I don't know how you do that. Do you just uh, well, go ahead and do, your panel. do them first and, and then, then do that? Yes. I was just trying to move it. No, just... We may have friends. That is true, gotcha. Thank you, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, and members of the committee for the opportunity to share my support for SB 460. And thank you to Senators Ellis, Kramer, and Lamb for co-sponsoring this important bill. My name is Sam Williamson, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm a lawyer with Disability Rights Maryland. You may remember this bill from last year when this committee issued a favorable report and the Senate passed the bill. This year, we also have the support of Maryland's governor and the Department of Health. This bill solves the problem of an outdated Medicaid policy that excludes healthcare treatments for gender dysphoria. Several federal courts have found that excluding gender affirming care violates the Affordable Care Act and federal Medicaid regulations. This bill brings Maryland into compliance by ensuring that Medicaid covers gender affirming care when that care is medically necessary, prescribed by a licensed healthcare provider, and in accordance with current non discriminatory medical standards. We do have one amendment to the bill. Um, it's the only substantive change from last year. The bill has a reporting requirement that helps Medicaid participants know which providers are in network with which managed care organizations. Uh, because of the increased harassment of gender affirming care providers nationwide, we are making that report optional for providers. For all the benefits of this bill, it will only cost one half of 0.01% of Maryland's Medicaid budget. All of these procedures are eligible. You will also see huge cost savings. Because we are failing to cover medically necessary care, 39% of transgender individuals have one or more disabilities, 
compared to only 15% of the general population. We will save costs when we address these healthcare needs at the root, rather than through Band-Aid solutions and costly ER visits. This bill makes medical, legal, and fiscal sense, and I urge you to issue a favorable report, just as you did last year. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dr. Hedian. I'm an internal medicine physician who provides primary care at Johns Hopkins. I'm here today representing Johns Hopkins University and Medicine. A large portion of my patient panel is transgender or non-binary, and I provide gender affirming care, including hormone prescribing. I have met and cared for hundreds of transgender people. You may have noticed that the public conversation about transgender people, public conversations are more common than they were 10 or 20 years ago. You may have assumed, therefore, that it is a new thing to be transgender. It is not. Transgender and gender diverse people exist around the world and identify in many different culturally diverse ways, too many to name here. In fact, there are scientifically rigorous international medical guidelines published by WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, which healthcare professionals such as myself use to provide necessary medical and surgical care. When we refer to the standards of care, this is what we are referencing, and this is what we are seeking to align our healthcare coverage with in the state of Maryland, not the opinion of this doctor or even of Johns Hopkins University and medicine, but with the international standards of care. According to the international standards of care, the procedures outlined in this bill are medically necessary procedures. They are not cosmetic. They are not elective. I have a patient who never speaks in public if she can help it because the moment she does, some people treat her differently. Even on the elevator on her way to an appointment to see me, her doctor, she points at the elevator button and she does not speak. Her voice is a constant reminder, a constant trigger and a constant distress. Each person is unique and not every transgender person will need or use all the services listed here, but passing this bill will make a dramatic improvement on the lives of people who need and deserve this care. I urge you to issue a favorable report for SB 460. Thank you for your time. Hello, um, I'm Jamie Grace Alexander here representing Free State Justice. Um, you'll hear from our panel many reasons why this bill should be passed, but I wanna briefly discuss with you um, what would happen if this bill does not pass and what the current situation is within our community. The healthcare outlined in this bill has been called elective or cosmetic, but for Maryland's transgender communities, it is anything but. Transgender people will prioritize this gender affirming care over housing, fun, and even food. A trans person may state a job they hate or are discriminated at, again, um, in order to afford this care out, out of pocket. Frequently, the money being used on these procedures could have been applied instead to significant investments that would also improve their quality of life, like moving out of an unsupportive parent's home. In some cases, trans people will even go without basic necessities in order to save money for expensive surgeries. On the flip side, this care can often make the difference in a person's upward mobility. Counterintuitively, passing is almost required for many entry-level jobs in the service and retail industry where being perceived as trans can mean abuse from customers and even fellow coworkers. Often access to these surgeries will open them to new opportunities previously closed to them because of bias, allowing their natural talents to shine. Embodying oneself fully as these procedures allow our transgender community members to do makes all areas of life easier, especially employment. When our community cannot access reliable employment or healthcare, their options for survival are limited. Many people turn to other sources for hormones, which are cheaper on the black market than for people who are uninsured. When the cost of these out-of-pocket procedures are not personal, their burden is shared by our community. Every day, members of our community fundraise to meet the expenses required for these critical healthcare interventions, and you can change that by passing this legislation. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, um, members of the committee, Senator Washington, for your leadership on this. We really appreciate all of you taking the time and being here with us tonight. My name is Margo Quinlan with the Mental Health Association of Maryland. This is a priority bill for the Mental Health Association. Your packets have testimony from hundreds of Marylanders in support of this bill. You're going to hear from a few of us today, experts and doctors, parents who just want what's best for their kids, and members of our community like myself who likely would not be with you today were it not for our access to gender-affirming care. You will also hear from a small but vocal group of people who have politicized our care and who will share a number of mistruths about gender affirming care. I would like to quickly talk through some of those arguments now. One, is this bill discriminatory when non-transgender or cisgender people cannot access these treatments? This is false. Our Maryland's attorney general has already weighed in on this matter. The law already recognizes a degree to which gender is important to cisgender people and covers procedures such as breast reconstruction after mastectomy. And so for when we talk about transgender people, we see these carve outs for care and that is not true in other um, sectors of our healthcare. Two, don't people who transition end up regretting it? Again, this is overwhelmingly false. Rates of transition regret are extremely rare. Studies show less than 1% of trans people regret most medical decisions, less than 1% compared to uh, you know, surgeries like a knee surgery with a 30% regret rate or prostate surgery, a 20% regret rate. The fact that trans healthcare and trans procedures have a 1% regret rate, that is, that is unheard of um, and really remarkable. And number three, what about the kids? And I want to be clear, this bill does not change Maryland Medicaid's policy for youth. No minors are allowed to receive gender firm gender affirming care at all until adolescence, and they have to have the informed consent of their parents, right? So these decisions are being made with a patient, with a provider, and with parental consent. Um, this bill does not change that. So you will hear testimony from several parents also who credit gender affirming health care with saving their children's lives, and I would beg you to listen to their stories instead. Our care is life-saving, it is medically necessary, and it must be made accessible to all who need it. We really appreciate you staying here and taking the time. Thank you. Hey, uh, good evening, committee members. My name is Ashley Black from the Public Justice Center. I'm the lead attorney for our Health and Benefits Equity Project. We're here in strong support of the Trans Health Equity Act um, with the sponsor amendments. The intent of this bill is to update Maryland Medicaid's program's um, gender affirming care policy, which the previous administration did not do on its own, despite the minimal cost to cover this relatively small population. I'd like to uplift some highlights from the fiscal note. There are federal matching funds up to 64.5% um, for the health services. Additionally, only 98, per, uh, 98 people sought gender affirming care for the as of the estimated 6,000 adults enrolled in Medicaid who identify as transgender. And Medicaid anticipates that this number will increase by 25 people per year. This small coverage expansion is not going to open the floodgates. Back to the legislation, this bill requires Medicaid to do three simple things. Hold the opinions of medical professionals recommending individualized care for their patients in higher regard as we do for other health services. End its discriminatory practice of holding categorical exclusions for gender affirming care and update our program to modern accepted standards for gender affirming care. Speaking to health equity, transgender adults are more likely to report poorer health outcomes and face barriers to care due to the costs. This means that health outcomes experienced by low-income transgender Marylanders who cannot afford to pay out of pocket for categorically excluded care will not be the same as those who can. Access to individualized, medically necessary gender-affirming care is not only a pathway towards good uh, physical and mental health outcomes for trans Marylanders, but it's also a pathway towards safety. This bill would make a tremendous difference in the quality of life experienced by Maryland's transgender um, low-income community. And we believe that access to medically necessary care should not hinge on a person's income or gender identity. Thank you for your time, and we urge a favorable report. Thank you very much, Senator Lamb. Thank you. Um, you answered one of my questions, which is just to make sure that the governor does support this bill. Two very concise questions that I'm just going to present to the panel. One, um, both very important, though. Um, one, with regards to youth, does this change anything for youth in um, the care that they can receive? And, and I think it doesn't. But number two, um, uh, this doesn't cover anything that's not considered medically necessary, right? So to answer the first statement, um, Maryland Medicaid already covers puberty blockers and gender affirming hormone therapy for youth. So this bill does not change that. Okay. And I can answer your second question. Um, Maryland Medicaid has a medically necessary standard. So the care has to be deemed as medically necessary. And there are 
um, criteria that are used. There's a definition in Comar for what is medically necessary that I can provide. Um, so anything that does not meet that definition and is not um, recommended by the physician uh, would not be covered. So this is medically necessary care. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't see any additional questions for the sponsor or the panel. Thank you all very much. You've been you so had a very long day waiting for this <laughs> hearing. We appreciate you staying and participating in our process. Senator, if you want to now identify those who um, have opted not to testify, we would welcome that. Didn't, I think there was like just a couple. Just to be say me want to be recognized and that you're there. Okay. Well, we got two. There oh, we yeah. are. Okay. okay. Here we are. Thank you all very much all right. for being here and um, participating in the process. We're going to move to our next panel of witnesses who've signed up in support of the bill. Nora Krause. Excuse me, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, I apologize. At some point, I, I have to go. We have a voting session after our, our hearing. So. Well, if it's voting, how can we say no? <laughs> all right. Okay. So, Thank you very to, much. To, 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 the, to you all. I'm not, I'm not abandoning you. I have to do my duty. So. That's right. Go to work. Thank you. All right. Nora Krause, Paula Nera, Lee Blinder, Anne Geddes. Jacob Feruzzi, Hope Brooks, Rachel London. Rachel London not here, Stacy Jefferson. Okay, very good. All right, you can start when you're ready. Everyone's so polite. They go, you <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of uh, Senate Bill 460. My name is Paul Anira. I'm the program director of LGBTQ plus equity and education at Johns Hopkins Medicine, but I'm not here on behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine, so my comments are my own. But I do note that Johns Hopkins officially supports a favorable recommendation. I'm a nurse. I'm a lawyer. I'm a Naval Academy graduate, and I'm here talking to you tonight because I'm a Naval Academy graduate. I took an oath in this town that I would support and defend the Constitution, and I'd bear true faith and allegiance to it. And when our citizens are denied access to medically necessary care, when we have barriers that are exacerbating health inequities, that requires action. That's what's guided me as a nurse, as a lawyer. But I'm also a woman who's transgender. And I transitioned 30 years ago when there was no health insurance, but I was fortunate enough. I had a credit card. I could pay for my medical care. Today, our most vulnerable Marylanders may not be able to do so. And within the transgender community, the rates of poverty, the rates of discrimination and employment are much greater, which means that many folks, approximately about 6,000, re rely on Medicare, Medicaid to be able to provide that access to care that people that have private insurance can afford. Also, passage of this bill shows that Maryland can be a leader in ensuring that our most vulnerable, our most at risk, have access to care at a time when across the country, the White House press secretary noted, there are 450 anti-gay, anti-transgender bills 300 of which are targeting transgender people and all are negatively impacting their health. Here in Maryland, we say that we stand for access to medically necessary care for everyone, including those most at risk. Thank you. Hello. Hello, my name is Hope Brooks and I'm a transgender Marylander and the parent of a transgender child. I'd like to take my time today to tell one of the stories of my experience navigating the healthcare system. After years of, in, of suffering, being imprisoned in a body that daily calls me torment, in 2019, I transitioned to living as a woman. The transition was amazing. For the first time, I started to hope for a life free of crippling pain. Eventually, however, despite hormone replacement therapy, I knew that to escape the torture of dysphoria, I needed surgery. I met with a team of doctors and eventually a surgeon and scheduled surgery. 
My surgery was even approved as medically necessary by my coverage provider. However, my surgery was only approved because I was mistaken by my coverage provider as a cisgender woman. Once they'd realized that I was trans, my coverage was revoked. I was told that my surger- surgery was considered medically necessary if you're cis, but cosmetic if you're trans. I was destroyed. The meager hope I had built collapsed and I despaired. I couldn't afford the surgery, but I couldn't afford to go on in the continued pain without it. And I decided to take my own life. And I would have done so had it not been for a group of people who came around me and raised the funds, allowing me to have the surgery I needed to save my life. The surgery deemed cosmetic only because I was trans. The same surgery that six of my doctors wrote letters ur- deeming this urgently, med- yeah, urgently medically necessary and life-saving. Without that surgery, I absolutely would not be here today and my children would be motherless. Instead, now I'm truly happy and fulfilled. I know personally how critical and life-saving these procedures can be and know the cost of denying coverage. Lives hang in the balance on the passing of this bill. I was told that my life was not worth the cost of a surgery just because I was trans. I hope that was not true and I hope that you will return a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Ann Geddes, um, and I'm here testifying today as the mother of a transgender child in support of Senate Bill 460. Our son, Jordan, who was born a girl, experienced gender questioning behavior from the age of two. At the age of 13, he developed significant mental health problems, including severe self-injurious behavior and multiple suicide attempts. These problems developed at the same time that he decided for himself that he was not of the gender assigned to him at birth. Because of his significant mental health issues, his father and I did not permit him to undertake any gender reassignment measures as an adolescent. We were wrong, we had it backwards. Because of his untreated gender dysphoria, Jordan ended up costing the state a tremendous amount of money. At a significant cost to the state, he spent nine months in a Maryland residential treatment center, which was paid for by Medicaid. He experienced multiple inpatient hospitalizations, which were paid for by Medicaid. He lived for one year in a residential rehabilitation program, which was paid for by Medicaid. At the age of 19, when Jordan began his gender affirming treatment, his mental health challenges dramatically improved. He stopped self injuring. There were no more suicide attempts. And over time, he got sober, he finished college, he got off of SSI, which he'd been placed on, then he got off of SSDI, and he's now employed as a software engineer with a well-paying job. Jordan is now a Maryland taxpayer. He is a giver and not a taker at great savings to the state. Our son's gender reassignment surgery was truly transformative. All transgender individuals should have the opportunity to live a happy and productive life. Senate Bill 460 would support that end. Please return a favorable report. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm going to be extremely brief because I know it has been a very long evening for all of us. Um, for the record, my name is Stacey Jefferson. I'm with um, the, I'm the Director of Policy and Stakeholder Engagement at Behavioral Health System Baltimore. And we are here in strong support of Senate Bill 460, and we ask the committee for a favorable report. Thank you so much, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, and the esteemed committee, and appreciate everyone uh, listening after such a long day. We're also here. I'll keep it brief. My name is Lee Blinder. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a proud non-binary transgender Marylander, as well as the executive director of Trans Maryland. In addition, I'm also the policy chair with the Maryland Commission on LGBTQ Affairs. I'm here today in both capacities and strong support of SB 460. Through Trans Maryland's work, we have talked to thousands of transgender Marylanders about the barriers that we face in accessing services, such as affirming medical care. The Trans Health Equity Act came into existence last year through these conversations, which highlighted to us the clear gap in services for low-income trans Marylanders. Many trans Marylanders, like myself, experience gender euphoria as a result of accessing gender-affirming care. The access that I have had through my plan purchased through the Maryland Health Connection should be the same as my siblings who are on Medicaid and that they have access to. 
Modernizing gender transition through Maryland Medicaid is an easy fix by passing the Trans Health Equity Act, which will bring Maryland in line with many other states who are leading in their coverage of this care. I urge a favorable report on SB 460. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Jake Peruzzi. I'm a transgender man from the 20th district here to support SB 460. Starting around age three, I went to bed every night praying that I would wake up in a male body. I remember how it felt to have my heart break every morning. As a teenager, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I was depressed, never spoke in class and couldn't see a future. When I was 15, my mom held me as I cried and told her I didn't want to live. Recently, my sister told me that in the years before my transition, I seemed barely alive. And after it felt like, there's my brother, he's finally here. Years of feeling barely alive. Was that just a phase? I'm alive today because I was able to access gender affirming care. At age 28, I've experienced many years of the joy I prayed for as a kid. That same kid who couldn't look at himself in the mirror, speak in class, or see a future is a proud transgender man and lawyer speaking in court and to all of you today. I'm living proof that this care is life-saving and that this bill will save countless people who don't have the opportunities I've had and may not see their own futures. Maryland can ensure that their futures are made possible. As trans people, our lives are constantly debated by strangers who do not know our realities. But the reality is that we know our own hearts. We have to, to step out into a world that preaches conformity and vilifies authenticity. We are experts in our own lives. If you find yourself doubting that this care is life-saving, I ask you, why must you understand our internal struggle in order to want us to live? You can't deny the evidence when it's sitting right in front of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just looking to make sure I didn't miss anyone. I think we've got the whole panel. I don't see any questions from the committee. Thank you all very much for sharing your experiences and your testimony. Have a good evening. Going to the next panel, Tamar Jones, Michelle Siri, Erica McDonald, Sergio Lazama, Riley Roshong, and Callie Schumitz. I ain't gonna keep going. Tina Jones. Good evening. You can get started. Thank you. I can go first. I can go first because I'll be very, very brief. I'm Michelle Siri, Executive Director of the Women's Law Center of Maryland, here to say, me too, that this is a gender justice and a women's rights issue as well. And we very much support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. I am Tina Jones. I serve as the Deputy Executive Director at Free State Justice, uh, Maryland's LGBTQ civil rights advocacy organization. I'm also the co founder of the Delmarver Pride Center that's based in Easton and the founder and facilitator for the Delmarva Gender Expression Movement, a transgender support group on the Eastern Shore. I come before you tonight as a transgender woman who knows firsthand the importance of providing the medical services covered by the Trans Health Equity Act. Living without the ability to be myself for most of my life took an emotional and physical toll on me. I was depressed. I drank too much. I engaged in unsafe behaviors. I was unable to, be, unable to be there for my family in the way I should have been. Even with years of therapy, I saw myself as less than a person. Eventually, I attempted suicide. I was hospitalized and spent another 15 plus years in therapy. Things only changed when I accepted myself three years ago, but personal acceptance was not enough. I needed to physically change. I was lucky. I had good insurance. I was able to get the surgeries I needed. I will never forget waking up and looking down and crying from what I saw, uh, but I still needed more. 
because I waited later in life, I had a deep voice. I had facial hair. I had male pattern baldness. I continued to suffer trauma at the hands of strangers. I was shunned. I was labeled a pedophile and a groomer, and I received death threats. Those things changed when I was able to address my voice, my beard, my hair. I'm extremely fortunate. I was able to pay for those things. Today, I'm a proud, confident woman because of the wonderful care I've received. Those procedures saved my life. We live in the greatest country in the world, yet we still struggle with saving the lives of those who are different. Uh, none of us deserves to be forced to live a life of trauma, bias, harm, and possible death because of who we are. None of us should be forced to forgo life-saving medical care because we cannot afford it. Please show your support for our community. Please issue a favorable report on, on Senate Bill 460. Uh, thank you, Chair Griffith, members of the committee. My name is Callie Schumitz with the Maryland Center on Economic Policy. We're here in strong support of uh, SB 460 because access to comprehensive health care is an important part of achieving our vision of a thriving, Mar uh, of a healthy Maryland economy where all Marylanders can thrive. Uh, the fiscal note outlines some of the potential costs for this legislation, but it, it does not account for the benefits to the state. Uh, and Maryland communities associated with ensuring low-income transgender Marylanders have equitable access to gender-affirming care. Research shows that when transgender and non-binary people receive uh, the needed gender-affirming care, there are a wide range of benefits such as improved mental health, improved physical health uh, due to connect connection to regular health care, re reduced workplace and housing discrimination. This is all also linked to less need for emergency services, which is also which is the most expensive way to provide care. Improving physical and mental health uh, and improved physical and mental health, a greater connection to the workforce, reduced housing and stability and homeless all have long term benefits, not just for transgender and non-binary Marylanders, but for our communities as a whole and our economy to so ask for a favorable report on SB 460. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Griffith and committee members. My name is Erica McDonald and I'm a resident of Baltimore County. I'm testifying in support of the Trans Health Equity Act on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Maryland um, and representing concerned citizens throughout the state. The League is a nonpartisan organization that advocates for the health and safety of all Americans, which is necessary for a functioning democracy. I'm also here today because I have seen the difference that gender affirming care makes. My son, who was assigned female at birth, had clear gender nonconforming preferences at age two. When he came out to us at 12 years old, he had become withdrawn and depressed. We fully supported his transition, changing his appearance, his name, his pronouns, but we did not understand the importance of gender affirming medical care. And as a teen, his gender dysphoria increased. He had suicide ideation, self-harm, weight loss, crippling anxiety so bad that we had to homeschool him for a period. Um, we eventually educated ourselves and found a knowledgeable therapist um, and a gender affirming medical care for him. And at 17, he began hormone therapy, and at 18, had gender-affirming surgery, which had a profoundly positive effect on his well-being. So access to this gender-affirming uh, medication and surgery saved his life. There's no doubt in my mind that he, without this care, he would not be well or able to prosper. He's now healing. He sees friends. He's engaged with family. He's happy. He started college this year. Um, my family is fortunate to have private medical insurance um, that covers his care, but transgender Marylands uh, with Medicaid do not have the same access to care as we do, and I urge you to address this important issue um, on behalf of my family and on behalf of the League of Women Voters. Thank you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Uh, hi, thank you, Chairwoman, members of the committee. Um, some of you already know me, but for those of you who do not, my name is Riley Grace Roshong. Um, I'm on the board for Free State Justice. I just served on the governor's transition team, advising them on their LGBT policy. Um, and I also, over this past year, worked on a comprehensive report, looking at all the relevant academic literature on this subject. Um, but we submit that for your testament or uh, in written testimony, so you can look at that. 
and reach out if you have any questions. Um, I want to use the rest of my time, though, to talk about uh, how this bill relates to me personally, right? Uh, we're all aware of the national political climate on this sort of issue, right? There's a lot of states that are looking to restrict access to this kind of care. Um, and it's a really scary time because there's a lot of people who are looking to move from states and look to where to go. Um, I was a couple of years ago, one of those people. Uh, I actually originally was born in Ohio. I went to undergrad in Memphis, Tennessee. I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas. And eventually after that, I lived in Florida for a little bit before coming here. And uh, during that time, I actually, uh, so I don't talk about a lot for the people who know me, but I transitioned when I was in the South. And that was a scary time. You know, it was hard to get access to care. Fortunately, I came from a family who was willing to help me financially through that time. But a lot of other people don't have that same support and that same access to care. Maryland has a lot of really strong possibility to help people who weren't as fortunate as I was in that kind of a situation. Um, to keep with Wes Moore's commitment when he ran, I think that this could be a really strong step to make sure that nobody is left behind. And for that reason, I would ask that you support Senate Bill 460. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the Senate Committee. Uh, my name is Sergio Lissam. I'm, I'm an internal medicine physician, and I also have a subspecialty in endocrinology. I've been practicing the endocrinology field for almost four years, and I also have a special interest in uh, gender-affirming care. And <clears throat> over the past eight years, I've, I've seen you know, and care for some of these managers. I've witnessed their struggle accessing the services they need, and I've seen them you know, the personal distress uh, from not having access to some of these services, depression, and also sometimes people uh, leading to attempts against their own lives. There's been a lot of published evidence um, that suggests and that affirms that gender affirming care is critical. Um, it's a critical intervention that can lead to a better mental health outcomes. <clears throat> and I do believe that offering comprehensive healthcare coverage will save costs and reduce mental health complications, including a reduction in suicide attempts. This very small percentage of people in the state of Maryland deserve to have positive health outcomes across their health. Um, and I just urge you all uh, to return a final um, uh, report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions from the committee. Thank you all very much for your testimony and thank you for sharing your your personal experiences with the committee. Thank you. Okay, I think I missed, did I call Jessica Emerson? Pam Casemeyer, Lily Pastor, Bridge Dumay, and I think that takes care of that, Pam. Good okay. evening. Realizing I wrote good afternoon, Madam Chair and Madam Vice Chair, but I think I'll amend that at this point and say uh, good evening to you all, uh, members of the committee. My name is Jessica Emerson, and I direct the Human Trafficking Prevention Project, which provides legal representation to criminalize sex workers and survivors of human trafficking. We also engage in systemic advocacy designed to prevent the exploitation of those put at highest risk of exploitation, one of which are transgender and, not, and gender nonconforming people. As a result, I am also here in strong support of Senate Bill 460. Um, given the time, if anyone has any questions about the link between uh, health-based discrimination, violence, and exploitation, I'm happy to have that conversation, perhaps after we've all had some sleep. Uh, thank you, and I urge a favorable report. Thanks. Hi, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Pam Casemeyer again, and I'll be extraordinarily short. Um, I'm here on behalf of MedCHI, the Academy of Pediatrics, the Mid-Atlantic Association of Community Health Centers, and other provider um, groups really strongly in support of this bill. Um, and a as the provider community, we wanted to note that this is medically necessary, clinically recognized standard of care services that are covered by this bill. That is um, very 
um, important. That's what you've heard. It's, it is, um, there's no reason not to have this care provided through Medicaid. The, and so we are strongly here as the clinicians supporting this legislation. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Bridge Dumay. I'm the political coordinator of 1199 SEIU, United Healthcare Workers East. We represent over 10,000 members in our region, including members who provide gender affirming health care. I'm also the co chair of a statewide coalition and Medical Debt Maryland. We support the Trans Health Equity Act with the amendment to require consent from healthcare providers to have their names publicly listed. This amendment is crucial to to ensuring the safety of healthcare providers due to the increased hostility towards them as trans healthcare is under attack nationwide. Gender affirming care is medically necessary. At least a dozen healthcare workers submitted testimony today highlighting this indisputable fact, and every reputable medical association agrees that gender affirming care improves patients' overall health and quality of life. No healthcare workers submitted testimony in opposition of this bill. If you come out of this hearing today still not understanding the ins and outs of gender affirming healthcare, that's okay. You don't have to because healthcare providers do, and this bill simply allows them to determine medical necessity aligned with current clinical standards. So we really should be trusting our healthcare providers and patients. You've heard extensive testimony tonight about why this care is medically necessary. So instead of going back through that checklist, let's take a moment and look at the big picture. In Maryland, from abortion care to vaccines, there's a super majority that believes personal health care decisions should be made only between a patient and their provider without influence from the state or an employer. If you believe that what happens with your body should be your choice, I ask you to apply that fundamental value of bodily autonomy to gender affirming care. Without Medicaid coverage, low income trans people are robbed of that choice and risk incurring burdensome medical debt. This country has a guiding principle that everyone is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what this bill will provide. I urge a favorable report with an amendment. Thank you. Thank you. There are no questions from the committee. So thank you all very much for waiting all day to give us two minutes of your input. Thank you so much. <laughs> so all right. 20 seconds. <laughs> right. Shout out to you. Okay. Efficient. We're going <laughs> to bring forward Ayo Kamathi, Jonathan Alexander, signed up in opposition to the bill. Good evening. Come on to the table. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Ayo Kimathi. I represent Brothers of the DMV. I remember the first time that I was introduced to what we, I didn't have a word for, but what we now call transgenderism. I was a little boy and I used to sneak out to the uh, living room when my mother was asleep to watch TV and watch movies. And so I turned on this movie and I watched it. And it was this guy. He had a hotel. He invite people in. Then the women would come into the hotel and they would go take a shower and he would take a butcher knife. He would take that butcher knife and then he would go into the shower and he would start attacking them. And then by the end of the movie, he was wearing a, a woman's wig and it was it was called Psycho. And even though I didn't have anybody to explain to me what I was watching. I knew that I was supposed to accept it as normal because it was entertainment, something I was watching through television and enjoying whatever was occurring. But never did I ever expect that I was supposed to accept it in life as being normal in real life. Um, we live in a society now where we're presenting Norman Bates as a role model for our children. If we really want to help children and stop the sexual insanity that we're seeing in our society, what we would do is fight pedophilia, not promote psychopathology. 
the serious, most important, dangerous social ill in the United States of America is the sexual abuse and molestation of children. And that is the direction that we should be headed. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm Jonathan Alexander. I'm an attorney and counsel for the Maryland Family Institute. And I stand in opposition to Senate Bill 460 and the plan that it puts forward to fund the physical deconstruction and the revision of perfectly good bodies as an alleviation to the distress resulting from gender dysphoria. I'm using gender dysphoria as it's listed here in the bill. I'm also narrowing in on the text that mentions puberty blockers and other treatments to suppress the development of sex characteristics as being wrong. You know, our bodies are created to naturally grow and to thrive, especially the bodies of adolescents who have everything that they need within them to develop into full adults. It is inconsistent with the natural blossoming of adolescence into adulthood to fund hormones and puberty blockers that stop and then irreversibly destroy the body's natural ability to allow adolescents to grow into adulthood. And I'm aware of the statistics and the stories of the individuals that are promoting this, but I'm also aware of the growing number of statistics and stories of individuals now hoping that they had never undergone sex reassignment surgery, now hoping that they had never taken puberty blockers, now wishing that someone had come alongside them on their journey and sat with them and told them that they were beautiful in the body that they were born in. And that irreversible surgery, puberty blockers are not the way to help them deal with the realities of gender dysphoria that it would be better to encourage congruity between the mind and the body than to perform the severance of perfectly good working body parts or putting a hormonal stop on the natural development of adolescence into adulthood where an untold number of struggles do appear but will also dissipate if true attention and care is given to the heart of the matter. You know, Marylanders need to continue to be able to trust the medical profession to truly provide care, but not to conflate medical assist assistance with the breaking up of perfectly good bodies, especially during adolescence. And so for these reasons, I urge you to issue an unfavorable report to Senate Bill 460. Thank you very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee, so please enjoy your evening. Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. All right, Jeremy Browning. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jeremy Browning and I am the Administrative Director of the Maryland LGBTQ Commission. I would like to commend the members of this committee and the Maryland General Assembly on behalf of, um, uh, on their work on behalf of our LGBTQ communities and their families. The Maryland Commission on LGBTQ Affairs was created by the 2021 Maryland General Assembly to assess challenges facing our community, to collect data across state agencies, study and establish best practices for inclusion, and offer testimony on issues concerning our LGBTQIA community. Um, as presented in our 2022 annual report, our LGBTQIA communities face challenges in almost every aspect of daily life from education, housing, employment, and access to quality health care. These challenges are magnified for our low-income, transgender, and non-binary Marylanders. Senate Bill 460 is the top priority for the commission and is an, a vital step in ensuring that our transgender and non-binary individuals in Maryland have access to the medically necessary care they need. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are no questions. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to move to our virtual witnesses, starting with Nicole Hollywood, who signed up in favor of the bill. Good evening. Thank you. I'm Dr. Nicole Hollywood, a professor in the University System of Maryland, a parent to a trans child, and the president of the Board of Salisbury PSLAG. The Trans Health Equity Act is a life-saving piece of legislation. Gender-affirming care is life-affirming for the transgender and gender non-confirming community. More specifically, the preponderance of research has shown that providing gender-affirming care greatly improves the mental health and overall well-being of gender-diverse, transgender, intersex, and non-binary individuals. 
dramatically reducing depression and suicidal ideation while fostering better outcomes. Accordingly, every credible medical organization, um, every credible medical organization supports comprehensive gender affirming treatments. Gender affirming critical recognized interventions are not a one size fits all proposition and come in many forms and encompass a broad range of social, psychological, behavioral, and medical options designed to support and affirm a person's gender identity. These treatments are not elective, they are life saving. This bill will help address gross inequities in our state's current healthcare system that targets and hurts some of our most marginalized Marylanders. Expanding access to critical healthcare will greatly enhance quality of life for thousands of transgender Marylanders. As a result, Salisbury PFLAG supports this bill and recommends a favorable report in committee. Lives hang the balance of this outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there are no questions. So you are now free from the Senate Finance Committee for today. Thank you very much. Uh, Joanna Diamond, good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Joanna Diamond with Healthcare for the Homeless and SB 460 is a life-saving bill and a priority for our agency. I just wanna address a couple of the points that were made by the opposition, which are entirely inaccurate and wrongheaded. One is that puberty blockers are safe and have been used for decades, literally since the 1970s, including to provide medical care to non-trans children. Um, but I also just want to go back to the, um, the reasons why healthcare for the homeless in particular is in strong support of the bill, and that is that access to this medically necessary and life-saving care is an issue of ensuring that our patients can access the best medical care available. And for our providers who are stymied from connecting their clients to the most up-to-date and comprehensive gender-affirming medical care because Medicaid won't cover it, is both frustrating and heartbreaking. Uh, you heard about the oftentimes life-threatening consequences for trans individuals who are denied gender-affirming care. You heard about some of the cost savings uh, that are um, not accounted for necessarily in the fiscal note. So I just want to focus on some of those other costs. Um, regarding the high rates of suicide and substance abuse among transgender individuals because of the discrimination they face, um, this leads to emergency visits and hospitalizations. Inpatient hospital care can be over $37,000 per person. And inpatient hospital stays are repeated throughout someone's life when they aren't able to access comprehensive gender-affirming care. These are not one-time costs, unlike much of the treatment covered by the bill. And in a Baltimore study, more than half of those surveyed reported lifetime homelessness or housing instability due to discrimination against them. Housing instability comes at a price. Uh, temporary housing can cost up to $35,000 per person. So providing medical uh, adequate medical care is a protective factor and um, it is unconscionable for our medical Medicaid program to not cover these necessary services. We urge a favorable report, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee, so please enjoy the remainder of your evening. And we are going to call Deborah Dunn. Hi, I'm Deb Dunn. I'm a family practice PA. This is my 40th year. My patients are transgender, non-binary children and adults, and I'm here today representing them. I do not need to to testify about how it improves the quality of life for these people could have heard that over and over again. Um, I do wanna I do want to say to you though, that as a practitioner for 15 years, we've been taking care of these people. I know the results of them having non-clinical people do backyard type surgeries. And I personally have seen in my practice, decrease in anxiety, depression, and suicidals suicides, because by the time a lot of these kids get to me, they've been in the hospital multiple times with suicide attempts. And these are people that I see whose lives are thriving, going to college, having marriages and of all ages. But the two things that I really want to um, enforce is that all of the surgeries, not cosmetic, need to be included and insurancers have to be held accountable for uh, not discriminating against these uh, gender affirmation benefits. 
the surgeries, the medications, or the puberty blockers. And there can't be allowed uh, for these insurers to have these self-insured accounts. They will allow them to have loopholes to have exclusions. I see that happening all the time. So uh, please consider, please uh, vote positive uh, for this bill. Um, it is absolutely life-changing and life-saving. Thank you. Thank you. And there are no questions from the committee. So thank you very much for staying and uh, for contributing to our process. All right, Devin Ojeda. Hi, yes, Devin Ojeda. Um, thank you so much. No worries, esteemed, esteemed members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Dr. Devin Ojeda. My pronouns are is, uh, they, he, and I'm here on behalf of the National Center for Transgender Equality, or NCTE. Founded in 2003, NCTE worked with countless health and human service providers, as well as local, state, and federal agencies on policies to ensure equal access to vital health and human services to improve the lives of trans people. NCT is in support of SB 460, which would expand access to medically necessary life-saving care for trans people who receive health care through the state Medicaid system. Due to recent attacks on providers of uh, gender-affirming care across the country, however, we require that the reporting requirements uh, we request that we, the, the reporting requirements of the bill to be amended so uh, as to eliminate the risk that the well-intentioned report could be used to target uh, care providers. In addition, we are submitting statements of 66 Marylanders in support of SB 460, which were collected uh, through a comment portal and, and is attached to my written testimony. And while uh, the Medicaid program includes coverage for transition-related health care, it is fast becoming an outlier in the limitations that state places on what trans people are able to get cover. Currently, over two dozen trans-related procedures were excluded from coverage, including hair removal, voice therapy, and even many surgical revisions. With regulations enforcing Section 1557 expected to go into force this year, this system is at a uh, at the risk of an investigation or an enforcement action by the federal government if it does not bring coverage for transition-related care into line with federal requirements. The ongoing national moral panic around transition-related health care makes legislative all the more critical. Across the country, we have seen legislative and administrative attacks on transition-related care, including stripping insurance coverage for care, threatening medical licenses, and creating criminal uh, penalties. And that's why we think it's very crucial for Maryland to pass this bill. Um, and we are uh, we urge a favorable report with amendment of Senate Bill 460. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Oh Thank you. Appreciate you. All right, colleagues, we are now going to hear from Vince McAvoy. I hope that you can good evening. I hope that you can hear me okay. Can you hear yes. me all right? Yes. Thank please. you so much. Grateful. Um, I'm, I'm very much against this bill, and I want you to note that when there is document, when they are, you have doctors saying that this is medically necessary, alterations to the face and neck, to the abdomen, to the genitals and gonads, to voice therapy, these are not necessary. What we are dealing with is a group of people who has had trauma. And they are looking for attention and an excuse to change things in their life. And they maybe they should. Butchering these children, and incidentally, there is no age on the bill. If you're talking puberty blockers, you were talking about children. Butchering children is not the answer. Gender affirming is not a thing, male and female. You heard people talk about the number of states who are against this. Folks, Montana, Arkansas, are calling it medical malpractice. These people on this list that you're looking at for SB 460, these are not practitioners. These people have either sold out or never were doctors. I strongly urge an unfavorable female practice suits, people who have received treatment that they are not happy with in the state, particularly children, could not have consented to this and they should seek legal remedy. They should look at the Arkansas bill and the Montana bill 
You will find legal recourse there and direction. Committee, do not do this to our children. No one could have ever estimated that in Maryland, 50-50 uh, was against same-sex marriage. Eight years later, they're trying to butcher three and five-year-olds. Do not be responsible for this. You know the state. Once this is in place, we will see this happen to our children at the youngest ages. Please protect Maryland's children. Vote for sanity. Vote against this bill. And these people are fine as they are. They need attention. They need help. They do not need butchery and surgery. Thank you for your time on the bill for questions. Thank you for participating in our hearing. You're the final you. witness. And that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 460. Um, have a good evening. Colleagues, let me say to you all, thank you so much uh, for just being here and being so attentive to the witnesses all day. We were scheduled to vote this evening. Obviously, we are not going to do that to you. It has been a 12 hour day for most of you, some a little longer. So thank you so much for your patience, your attention. Kudos to the staff for a phenomenal job bringing it all together today. And uh, we'll, we'll vote tomorrow, maybe. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening.